The Bag by H. H. Munro, Saki, 1870 to 1916. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. The Major is coming in to tea, said Mrs. Hoopington to her niece. He's just gone round to the stables with his horse. Be as bright and lively as you can. The poor man's got a fit of the glooms. Major Pallaby was a victim of circumstances over which he had no control, and of his temper over which he had very little. He had taken on the mastership of the Pexdale Hounds in succession to a highly popular man who had fallen foul of his committee, and the Major found himself confronted with the overt hostility of at least half the hunt while his lack of tact and amiability had done much to alienate the remainder. Hence subscriptions were beginning to fall off, foxes grew provokingly scarcer, and wire obtruded itself with increasing frequency. The Major could plead reasonable excuse for his fit of the glooms. In ranging herself as a partisan on the side of Major Pallaby, Mrs. Hoofington had been largely influenced by the fact that she had made up her mind to marry him at an early date. Against his notorious bad temper, she set his three thousand a year and his prospective succession to a baronetcy, gave a casting vote in his favour. The Major's plans on the subject of matrimony were not at present in such an advanced stage as Mrs. Hoopington's but he was beginning to find his way over to Hupington Hall with a frequency that was already being commented on. He had a wretchedly thin field out again yesterday, said Mrs. Hoopington. Why you didn't bring one or two hunting men down with you instead of that stupid Russian boy, I can't think. Vladimir isn't stupid, protested her niece. He's one of the most amusing boys I ever met. Just compare him for a moment with some of your heavy hunting men. Anyhow, my dear Nora, he can't ride. Russians never can, but he shoots. Yes, and what does he shoot? Yesterday he brought home a woodpecker in his game bag. But he'd shot three pheasants and some rabbits as well. That's no excuse for including a woodpecker in his game bag. Foreigners go in for mixed bags more than we do. A grand duke pots a vulture just as seriously as we should stalk a bustard. Anyhow, I've explained to Vladimir that certain birds are beneath his dignity as a sportsman. And as he's only nineteen, of course his dignity is a sure thing to appeal to. Mrs. Hoopington sniffed. Most people with whom Vladimir came in contact found his high spirits infectious, but his present hostess was guaranteed immune against infection of that sort. "'I hear him coming in now,' she observed. "'I shall go and get ready for tea. "'We're going to have it here in the hall. "'Entertain the Major if he comes in before I'm down, "'and, above all, be bright.' Nora was dependent on her aunt's good graces for many little things that made life worth living and she was conscious of a feeling of discomfiture because the Russian youth whom she had brought down as a welcome element of change in the country house routine was not making a good impression. That young gentleman, however, was supremely unconscious of any shortcomings and burst into the hall, tired and less sprucely groomed than usual, but distinctly radiant. His game bag looked comfortably full, "'Guess what I've shot?' he demanded. "'Pheasants, wood pigeons, rabbits,' hazarded Nora. "'No, a large beast. "'I don't know what you call it in English. "'Brown with a darkish tail.' "'Nora changed colour. "'Does it live in a tree and eat nuts?' she asked, "'hoping that the use of the adjective large "'might be an exaggeration.' "'Vladimir laughed.' Oh, no, not a bayelka. Does it swim and eat fish? 
asked Nora, with a fervent prayer in her heart that it might turn out to be an otter. No, said Vladimir, busy with the straps of his game bag. It lives in the woods and eats rabbits and chickens. Nora sat down suddenly and hid her face in her hands. Merciful heaven, she wailed. He's shot a fox. Vladimir looked up at her in consternation. In a torrent of agitated words, she tried to explain the horror of the situation. The boy understood nothing, but was thoroughly alarmed. "'Hide it, hide it,' said Nora frantically, pointing to the still unopened bag. "'My aunt and the major will be here in a moment. Throw it on the top of that chest. They won't see it there.' Vladimir swung the bag with fair aim, but the strap caught in its flight, on the outstanding point of an antler fixed in the wall, and the bag, with its terrible burden, remained suspended just above the alcove where tea would presently be laid. At that moment Mrs. Hoopington and the Major entered the hall. "'The Major is going to draw our covers tomorrow,' announced the lady, with a certain heavy satisfaction. "'Smithers is confident that we will be able to show him some sport.' He swears he's seen a fox in the nut copse three times this week. I'm sure I hope so. I hope so, said the Major moodily. I must break this sequence of blank days. One hears so often that a fox has settled down as a tenant for life in certain covers, and then when you go to turn him out, there isn't a trace of him. I'm certain a fox was shot or trapped in Lady Widden's woods the very day before we drew them. Major, if anyone tried that game on in my woods, they'd get short shrift, said Mrs. Hoopington. Nora found her way mechanically to the tea-table and made her fingers frantically busy in rearranging the parsley round the sandwich-dish. On one side of her loomed the morose countenance of the Major, on the other she was conscious of the scared, miserable eyes of Vladimir, and above it all hung that. She dared not raise her eyes above the level of the tea-table, and she almost expected to see a spot of accusing vulpine blood drip down and stain the whiteness of the cloth. Her aunt's manner signalled to her the repeated message to be bright, for the present she was fully occupied in keeping her teeth from chattering. "'What did you shoot today?' asked Mrs. Hoopington of the unusually silent Vladimir. "'Nothing, nothing worth speaking of,' said the boy. Nora's heart, which had stood still for a space, made up for lost time with a most disturbing bound." "'I wish you'd find something that was worth speaking about,' said the hostess. "'Everyone seems to have lost their tongues.' "'When did Smithers last see that fox?' said the Major. "'Yesterday morning. A fine dog-fox with a dark brush,' confided Mrs. Hoopington. "'Aha! We'll have a good gallop after that brush tomorrow,' said the Major, with a transient gleam of good humour. And then the gloomy silence settled again round the tea-table, a silence broken only by despondent munchings and the occasional feverish rattle of a teaspoon in its saucer. A diversion was at last afforded by Mrs. Hoopington's fox terrier, which had jumped on to a vacant chair, the better to survey the delicacies of the table, and was now sniffing in an upward direction at something apparently more interesting than cold tea-cake. "'What is exciting him?' asked his mistress, as the dog suddenly broke into short, angry barks, with a running accompaniment of tremulous whines. "'Why,' she continued, "'it's your game-bag, Vladimir. What have you got in it?' "'By gad!' said the Major, who was now standing up. "'There's a pretty warm scent!' And then a simultaneous idea flashed on himself and Mrs. Hoopington. Their faces flushed to distinct but harmonious tones of purple, and with one accusing voice they screamed, 
You shot the fox! Nora tried hastily to palliate Vladimir's misdeed in their eyes, but it is doubtful whether they heard her. The major's fury clothed and reclothed itself in words as frantically as a woman up in town for one day shopping tries on a succession of garments. He reviled and railed at fate and the general scheme of things. He pitied himself with a strong, deep pity, too poignant for tears. He condemned every one with whom he had ever come in contact to endless and abnormal punishments. In fact, he conveyed the impression that if a destroying angel had been lent to him for a week, it would have had very little time for private study. In the lulls of his outcry could be heard the querulous monotone of Mrs. Hoopington and the sharp staccato barking of the fox terrier. Vladimir, who did not understand a tithe of what was being said, sat fondling a cigarette and repeating under his breath from time to time a vigorous English adjective which he had long ago taken affectionately into his vocabulary. His mind strayed back to the youth in the old Russian folktale who shot an enchanted bird with dramatic results. Meanwhile, the major, roaming round the hall like an imprisoned cyclone, had caught sight of and joyfully pounced on the telephone apparatus and lost no time in ringing up the hunt secretary and announcing his resignation of the membership. A servant had by this time brought his horse round to the door, and in a few seconds Mrs. Hoopington's shrill monotone had the field to itself. But after the major's display, her best efforts at vocal violence missed their full effect, and it was as though one had come straight out from a Wagner opera into a rather tame thunderstorm. Realising, perhaps, that her tirades were something of an anti-climax, Mrs. Hoopington broke suddenly into some rather unnecessary tears and marched out of the room, leaving behind her a silence almost as terrible as the turmoil which had preceded it. "'What shall I do with that?' asked Vladimir at last. "'Bury it,' said Nora. "'Just plain burial?' said Vladimir, rather relieved. He had almost expected that some of the local clergy would have insisted on being present, or that a salute might have to be fired over the grave. And thus it came to pass that in the dusk of a November evening the Russian boy, murmuring a few of the prayers of his church for luck, gave hasty but decent burial to a large polecat under the lilac trees at Hoopington. End of The Bag by Saki Recording by Peter Tomlinson The Blood Feud of Toad Water, a West Country Epic by Saki, H. H. Monroe, 1870-1916. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. The Cricks lived at Toadwater, and in the same lonely upland spot, fate had pitched the home of the Saunderesses, and for miles around these two dwellings there was never a neighbour or a chimney or even a burying ground to bring a sense of cheerful communion of social intercourse. Nothing but fields and spinneys and barns, lanes and wastelands. Such was Toad Water, and even so, Toad Water had its history. Thrust away in the benighted hinterland of a scattered market district, it might have been supposed that these two detached items of the great human family would have leaned towards one another in a fellowship begotten of kindred circumstances and a common isolation from the outer world. And perhaps it had been so once, 
But the way of things had brought it otherwise. Indeed otherwise. Fate, which had linked the two families in such unavoidable association of habitat, had ordained that the Crick household should nourish and maintain among its earthly possessions sundry head of domestic fowls, while to the Saunderesses was given a disposition towards the cultivation of garden crops. Herein lay the material ready to hand for the coming of feud and ill blood. For the grudge between the man of herbs and the man of livestock is no new thing. You will find traces of it in the fourth chapter of Genesis. And one sunny afternoon, in late springtime, the feud came, came, as such things mostly do come, with seeming aimlessness and triviality. One of the crick hens, in obedience to the nomadic instincts of her kind, wearied of her legitimate scratching ground, and flew over the low wall that divided the holdings of the neighbours. And there, on the yonder side, with a hurried consciousness that her time and opportunities might be limited, the misguided bird scratched and scraped and beaked and delved in the soft-yielding bed that had been prepared for the solace and well-being of a colony of seedling onions. Little showers of earth mould and root fibres went spraying before the hen and behind her, and every minute the area of her operations widened. The onions suffered considerably. Mrs Saunders, sauntering at this luckless moment down the garden path, in order to fill her soul with reproaches at the iniquity of the weeds, which grew faster than she or her good man cared to remove them, stopped in mute discomfiture before the presence of a more magnificent grievance. And then, in the hour of her calamity, she turned instinctively to the great mother and gathered in her capacious hands large clods of the hard brown soil that lay at her feet. With a terrible sincerity of purpose, though with a contemptible inadequacy of aim, she rained her earth bolts at the marauder, and the bursting pellets called forth a flood of cackling protest and panic from the hastily departing fowl. Calmness under misfortune is not an attribute of either henfolk or womankind, and while Mrs. Saunders declaimed over her onion bed such portions of the slang dictionary as are permitted by the nonconformist conscience to be said or sung, the Vasco da Gama fowl was waking the echoes of toad water with crescendo bursts of throat music which compelled attention to her griefs. Mrs. Crick had a long family, and was therefore licensed in the eyes of her world to have a short temper, and when some of her ubiquitous offspring had informed her, with the authority of eyewitnesses, that her neighbour had so far forgotten herself as to heave stones at her hen, her best hen, the best layer in the countryside, her thoughts closed themselves in language unbecoming to a Christian woman. And so at least said Mrs. Saunders, to whom most of the language was applied. Nor was she, on her part, surprised at Mrs. Crick's conduct in letting her hens stray into other bodies' gardens, and then abusing of them, seeing as how she remembered things against Mrs. Crick, and the latter simultaneously had recollections of lurking episodes in the past of Susan Saunders that were nothing to her credit. Fond memory, when all things fade, we fly to thee. And in the paling light of an April afternoon, the two women confronted each other from their respective sides of the party wall, recalling with shuddering breath the blots and blemishes of their neighbour's family record. There was that aunt of Mrs. Crick's, who had died a pauper in Exeter workhouse. Everyone knew that Mrs. Saunders' uncle, on her mother's side, had drunk himself to death. And then there was that Bristol cousin on Mrs. Crick's. From the shrill triumph with which his name was dragged in, his crime must have been pilfering from a cathedral at least. But as both remembrances were speaking at once, it was difficult to distinguish his infamy from the scandal which 
beclouded the memory of Mrs. Saunders' brother's wife's mother, who may have been a regicide, and was certainly not a nice person as Mrs. Crick painted her. And then, with an air of accumulating an irresistible conviction, each belligerent informed the other that she was no lady, after which they withdrew in a great silence, feeling that nothing further remained to be said. The chaffinches clinked in the apple trees, and the bees droned round the berberis bushes, and the warning sunlight slanted pleasantly across the garden plots, but between the neighbourhood households had sprung up a barrier of hate, permeating and permanent. The male heads of the families were necessarily drawn into the quarrel, and the children on either side were forbidden to have anything to do with the unhallowed offspring of the other party. As they had to travel a good three miles along the same road to school every day, this was awkward, but such things have to be. Thus all communication between the households was sundered, except the cats. Much as Mrs. Saunders might deplore it, rumour persistently pointed to the crick he-cat as the presumable father of sundry kittens of which the Saunders she-cat was indisputably the mother. Mrs. Saunders drowned the kittens, but the disgrace remained. Summer succeeded spring, and winter summer, but the feud outlasted the waning seasons. Once, indeed, it seemed as though the healing influences of religion might restore to Toadwater its erstwhile peace. The hostile families found themselves side by side in the soul-kindling atmosphere of a revival tea, where hymns were blended with a beverage that came of tea leaves and hot water and took after the latter parent, and where ghostly counsel was tempered by garnishings of solidly fashioned buns, and here, wrought up by the environment of festive piety, Mrs. Saunders so far unbent as to remark guardedly to Mrs. Crick that the evening had been a fine one. Mrs. Crick, under the influence of her ninth cup of tea and a fourth hymn, ventured on the hope that it might continue fine, but a maldroit allusion on the part of the Saunders good man to the backwardness of garden crops brought the feud stalking forth from its corner with all its old bitterness. Mrs. Saunders joined heartily in the singing of the final hymn, which told of peace and joy and archangels and golden glories, but her thoughts were dwelling on the pauper aunt of Exeter. Years have rolled away, and some of the actors in this wayside drama have passed into the unknown. Other onions have arisen, have flourished, have gone their way, and the offending hen has long since expiated her misdeeds and lain with trussed feet and a look of ineffable peace under the arched roof of Barnstable Market. But the blood feud of toad water survives to this day. End of the Blood Feud of Toad Water, a West Country epic by Saki. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. The Conversion of Aunt Sarah by Archibald Marshall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Conversion of Aunt Sarah. 1. When young Lord Otterburn vowed before the altar of Grace Church, 114th Avenue, Chicago, to endow Miss Sadie M. Cutts with all his worldly goods, that fortunate young lady obtained a husband of attractive appearance, agreeable manners, and a sweet temper, a coronet, a beautiful but dilapidated castle in Northumberland, surrounded by an unproductive estate, and a share in the family attentions of Aunt Sarah. In exchange for these blessings, she brought, as her contribution to the happiness of the married state, a warm appreciation of her husband's good qualities, a dowry which, when reckoned in dollars, touched seven figures, a frank and fearless character, and a total ignorance of the importance of Aunt Sarah in the domestic well-being of the noble house of Otterburn. She was not left long in ignorance on this point. She had only had time to refurnish the whole of Castle Gide, to install electric light, to rebuild the stables, adopting part of them to the requirements of a stud of motor cars, to take the gardens in hand, and to relet most of the farms, 
when Aunt Sarah was upon the newly married couple with a proposal for a visit. And who is Aunt Sarah anyway? inquired Lady Otterburn, when her husband handed her that lady's letter over the breakfast table. Aunt Sarah, replied Otterburn, is the bane of the existence of all the members of my family who can afford to keep their heads above water. Sounds kind of cheering, observed her ladyship. How does she get her clutch in? She proposes herself for short visits and has never been known to leave any house where the cooking is decent and the beds comfortable under a month. She is my uncle Otterburn's widow, and having been left exceedingly poor, exercises the right of demanding bed and board from members of my family in rotation, as often as it is convenient to her. If she's poor, said Lady Otterburn, it won't harm us to give her a shakedown and a sandwich or two as often as she wants them. I apprehend she'll make herself agreeable in return. And that's where you make a mistake, replied Otterburn. Aunt Sarah has never been known to make herself agreeable in all her life. In fact, she prides herself upon doing the reverse. She'll tell you before you have known her two minutes that she always says what she thinks, and she won't be telling you a lie. Hmm, two can play at that game said Lady Otterburn. Most times I say what I think myself. But you only think pleasant things, replied her husband, my flower of the prairie. Now, Chicago is not exactly a prairie, but the young Countess of Otterburn was pretty and graceful enough to deserve the most high-flown compliments and appreciated them when they came from her husband. She therefore graciously accepted his latest flight of imagination and told him to write to Aunt Sarah and invite her to come to Castle Gide and stay as long as she found it convenient. Aunt Sarah came a week later with a considerable amount of luggage, but no maid. The motor omnibus was sent to the station to meet her, in spite of her nephew's warnings. She'll arrive as cross as can be, he said. She hates motors of every description, and I don't suppose has ever been in one in her life. And then it's time she tried it, said Lady Otterburn. There isn't a horse in the place that could draw a buggy 14 miles to the depot and back and bring her here in time for dinner. Well, you'll see, said Otterburn. She'll tell us what she thinks of us when she gets here. She did. The powerful motor omnibus drew up before the door of Castle Gide, at which Lord and Lady Otterburn were standing to receive their guest, having completed the seven-mile journey from the station in about five and twenty minutes. The driver and the footman beside him wore expressions of apprehensive discomfort and the latter jumped down off his seat to open the door at the back of the vehicle with some alacrity. There emerged a tall and formidable-looking old lady, with an aquiline nose and abundant, well-arranged gray hair. She wore an imposing bonnet and a dress not of the latest fashion, which rustled richly. There was a cloud on her magnificent brow. Her mouth was firmly closed, and she showed no signs of agreeable feeling at arriving thus at her journey's end. How do you do, Aunt Sarah, said Otterburn, hastening down the steps to greet her. Very pleased to see you again. Hope the old bus brought you along comfortably. No, Edward, replied Aunt Sarah rigidly. The old bus, as you term it, did not bring me along comfortably. I had vowed never to trust myself to one of these detestable new inventions, and I am surprised at your sending such a contrivance to meet me. This, I suppose, is your wife. How do you do, my lady? I shall probably be able to tell better how I like your appearance when I've recovered from the perilous journey to which I have been subjected. I should like to be shown at once to my room. I am much too upset by my late experience to think of joining you downstairs tonight. Why, certainly, said Lady Otterburn. I'll take you upstairs, and you shall have your supper just when and how you please, right here and now if you prefer it. I want that you should make yourself at home in this house. Aunt Sarah transfixed her with a haughty glare. Considering that this house was my home for five and thirty years, she said, I think I can promise to do that. Thank you, Lady Otterburn. I will not detain you any longer. This is the third best bachelor's room in my day. I know my way about it well. No doubt you have other more important guests for whom the better rooms are reserved. I will wish you good night. My, said the Countess of Otterburn, on the other side of a firmly closed door, she's a peach. Two. The most consistently disagreeable people are not without their moments of relenting, and Aunt Sarah came downstairs about noon of the following day in a far better humor than she had carried to her room on her arrival at Castle Gide. In the first place, she had discovered that the erstwhile bachelor rooms had been converted into a perfect little suite, with the appointments of which even a luxury-loving old lady determined to find fault with everything could hardly quarrel. During her voluntary seclusion, she had been made as comfortable and waited on as well as if she were a rich woman in her own house, 
and the little dinner which had been served to her in the privacy of her own bijou salon was far superior to any meal that had ever been served to her before in Castle Gide, even when she had been the mistress of it. Morning tea, therefore, found out Sarah mollified, a dainty breakfast served to put her almost into an attitude of peace and goodwill toward mankind, and a glass of pale sherry and a dry biscuit after her toilet had been made and the morning papers read sent her downstairs with the definite intention of being civil to her nephew's wife, whom she had come to Castle Gide prepared cordially to hate. This frame of mind lasted for several hours. Lady Otterburn devoted herself to the old lady's entertainment, and to her husband's unconcealed astonishment, roused more than once a grim chuckle of amusement as she rattled her clever transatlantic tongue across the luncheon table. Aunt Sarah pleased, Aunt Sarah laughing, Aunt Sarah allowing someone else to monopolize the conversation. He had known her all his life, but such a spectacle had hitherto been denied him. My dear, you're a marvel, he said to his American countess when luncheon was over and Aunt Sarah had retired to her own apartments, still in high good humor. You bowled me over the first time we met. That was nothing. But Aunt Sarah, I couldn't have believed it possible. I wish I'd asked all my uncles and aunts and cousins to see it. You don't know enough to run when you're in a hurry, replied Lady Otterburn. You'll find her a real beautiful woman if you all took her the right way. Well, we shall see, said Otterburn. You've had a grand success so far, but the experience of years teaches me that seasons of calm in Aunt Sarah's life are not lasting. Much depends on the afternoon nap. Alas, Aunt Sarah's afternoon nap was a troubled one. It may have been the lobster salad, of which she had eaten too largely. It may have been the iced hock cup, of which she had drunk too freely, that disturbed her slumbers. Whatever it was, she came down again what time the tea table was spread in the hall with her usual inclination to make herself disagreeable strongly in the ascendant, and if possible, augmented by the reaction from her previous state of amiability. The first audacious sally made by her hostess, which would have been received with tolerant amusement at the luncheon table, only drew a scandalized glare from Aunt Sarah, and the ominous words, I must ask you to remember in whose presence you find yourself, if you please. Lady Otterburn may have been surprised by this sudden change of atmosphere, but she seemed entirely unconcerned, and took no notice of her husband's surreptitious kick underneath the tea table, which said as plain as speech, I told you so. She talked with gay wit, but gave no opportunity for a further rebuke. But Aunt Sarah's twisted temper was not to be softened by the most searching tact, and her next contribution to the sociability of the occasion was the remark, This tea is positively not fit to drink. In my day, Withers would not have dared to keep such stuff in his shop. He don't keep it now, answered her hostess. I have it bought in China and shipped over land. It costs four dollars the pound. I have no doubt it is expensive, retorted Aunt Sarah, although there's no occasion to poke your money down my throat. It is the way it is made. No servant can be trusted to make tea. I always have two teapots and make it myself. I find it is never fit to drink unless I do so. I'd just love to have you make some for yourself, said Lady Otterburn. I'll ring the bell for two more teapots. It's too bad you shouldn't have it as you like it. Aunt Sarah, who was secretly rather ashamed of having mistaken caravan-born tea for that sold by the village grocer, suffered herself to be softened again, and became almost amiable when her hostess insisted upon drinking from the fresh brew which was presently made, and declared that it was a great improvement on the old. I think it is better, admitted Aunt Sarah. I may say that I have never yet met anyone who could make tea as I can. You will excuse me for having commented on yours, but, as Edward knows, I always say what I think. Edward did know it, to his cost. But again, he was astonished at the sight of Aunt Sarah charmed back to good humor, when apparently in one of her most relentless moods. And, with further astonishment, he reminded himself that his experience did not afford a precedent for her apologizing for any word of blame that might have fallen from her lips. But he had no time to ponder on these things. Developments were proceeding. "'You find it a good plan always to say what you think?' asked Lady Otterburn sweetly. It is the only honest plan, replied Aunt Sarah. If everybody would do it instead of telling lies on all occasions, great or small, there would be a good deal less hypocrisy in the world than there is now. Well, I guess you are right, said Lady Otterburn. I guess I'll commence right away and follow your example, and so will Edward. Now mind, Edward, don't you dare say a single word that you don't mean, and just you tell your Aunt Sarah exactly what you think as long as she's with us, and so will I. And all the people who are coming this evening shall be told to do the same. Hey, what? exclaimed Aunt Sarah. 3. 
When Aunt Sarah came down into the great hall at 20 minutes to nine that evening, she found it full of young men and women who had arrived about an hour before, and whom she had kept waiting 10 minutes for their dinner. She did not apologize for her late appearance. That was not her custom. She singled out a young man of the company and said, How do you do, Henry? I am pleased to see you at Castle Gide again. You used to come here frequently in happier times. They were not happier times for me, Aunt Sarah, replied the young man rather nervously. My chief recollection of them is that I was generally sent to bed before dinner for getting into mischief. Ah, said Aunt Sarah, that is the way to treat mischievous boys, and you don't bear malice. I am afraid I do, said the young man. I was treated most unjustly. By whom, pray? inquired Aunt Sarah, beginning to bridle. Very occasionally by Uncle Otterburn, said the young man, invariably by you. Upon my word, exclaimed Aunt Sarah, that is a pretty way to talk. He must say what he thinks, you know, said Lady Otterburn. We are all going to play at that as long as we're together. Anybody who's convicted of an insincere speech is to pay half a crown to the hospital fund. Here's the box. It contains a contribution from Edward, who told Lady Griselda that she was not at all late when she came down five minutes ago. Edward, take Aunt Sarah into dinner. She has kept us waiting for nearly a quarter of an hour. Have I got into a company of lunatics? inquired Aunt Sarah as she took her nephew's arm. No member of the party, with the exception of Aunt Sarah, had reached middle age. Most of the men were contemporaries of Otterburn's, the years of whose pilgrimage were thirty. Some of them were married and had their wives with them, but the majority were unattached, and there were several girls, some English and some American. Otterburn's grouse moors were the ostensible excuse for their finding themselves collected at Castle Gide, but they were so well mixed that they would probably have succeeded in enjoying themselves even if there had been no shooting to occupy the days. There was a regular hubbub of conversation round the dinner table on this first evening, and loud peals of laughter rising above the din and clatter of twenty tongues all moving at once seemed to indicate that Lady Otterburn's game was adding to the gaiety of the occasion. No, said a demure young lady, in answer to a request from her neighbor, I will not play accompaniments for you after dinner. It is quite true, as you say, that I read music extraordinarily well. I've always politely denied it before, but I know I do. Your singing, however, is so distasteful to me that I am sorry I cannot oblige you. I have got a good voice, said her neighbor, and I have studied under the best masters. You have not profited by your studies, replied the lady, and your voice, so far from being good, is very thin and of no quality whatsoever. I guess, said a fair American, surveying the company, that we're a good-looking crowd around this table, and among all the women I have a conviction that I go up for the beauty prize. I have had to hug that conviction in secret for a very long time, and now it's out. Thus and thus was the house of truth built up, stone by stone, and Aunt Sarah's position was pitiable. Hitherto, she had made her mark in whatever society she found herself by sheer insistence on her right to be frankly and critically disagreeable. On any ordinary occasion, she would have had the whole table full of young people prostrate under the terror of her biting tongue, and not a whit would she have cared for consequent unpopularity, so long as she had made herself acknowledged as the dominating spirit of the assembly. Now she was met and foiled by the dexterous use of the very weapons which she had wielded so long and so unmercifully and no arrogant speech could she make, but its sting was removed by an equally outspoken reply. Thus, to her right-hand neighbor, a young man with smooth black hair and a preternaturally solemn face, I don't know who you are, but by your long upper lip I should judge you to be a Mortimer. My name and appearance are both undoubtedly Mortimer, he replied gravely. My character, I'm happy to say, is not. And perhaps you do not know, said Aunt Sarah, that I am a Mortimer. I'm perfectly aware of it, was the answer. It would cost me half a crown to congratulate you on the fact. And may I ask what faults you have to find with the family whose name you have the honor of bearing? They are insufferably cantankerous and domineering. Not all of them, interrupted Otterburn, anxious above all desire for unsullied truth to avert the impending storm which was gathering around him. You must not take his criticisms as personal, Aunt Sarah. Pass the box this way, said the solemn young man. Otterburn will contribute another half crown. Before dinner was halfway through, Aunt Sarah was in as black a rage as had ever darkened even her Olympian brow. By the time the ladies left the room, she had delivered herself of as many insulting speeches as it usually took her a day to achieve, and her average output was no small one. But it was all to no purpose. 
her most ambitious efforts, instead of striking a chill of terror to the hearts of her listeners, were warmly applauded, with an air of utmost politeness, and from every quarter she received as good as she gave. It took her some time to realize that she was affording considerable amusement to her nephew's guests, but when she did arrive at that state of knowledge, she could hardly command herself sufficiently to leave the room without doing bodily hurt to someone. I will not stand this insolent behavior any longer, she said to Lady Otterburn when the door of the dining room had been closed behind them. How dare you treat me in this way? Why, bless me, Aunt Sarah, exclaimed Lady Otterburn in well-feigned surprise. You said yourself that if everyone spoke the truth always, as you pride yourself on doing, it would be a real lovely thing. We are all speaking the truth under a penalty, and you are speaking it so well that you haven't been fined once. Pitch is the nearest possible orthographic rendering of the exclamation of contempt and disgust that forced itself from Aunt Sarah's lips. I have had enough of this insensate folly, she continued. I shall go straight to my room, and if I do not receive more respectful treatment in this house, where I so long reigned as his undisputed mistress, I shall leave it tomorrow. Do you understand me? I understand you very well, said Lady Otterburn, and I will ask you to try to understand me. The respect which you demand as mistress of this house is now due to me, and I look to receive it from my guests. If you discover that it is not within your power to grant it, I shall not press you to prolong your visit. Aunt Sarah again gave vent to the exclamation indicated above, and sailed up the broad staircase to her own apartments, with anger and disgust marked on every lining curve of her figure. 4. Aunt Sarah had never been so angry before in her life, she was an extraordinarily disagreeable old woman, disagreeable in a masterly, cold-blooded, incisive way, partly because disagreeable speech was a genuine expression of her nature, partly because she had discovered in the course of years that she gained more by being disagreeable, which came easy to her, than by being pleasant, which did not. One of the weapons of her armory was the feigning of anger, and few could stand upright before her wrath. But for this very reason, she had seldom been opposed in such a way as to make her really angry, and now that this had happened to her, she was almost beside herself with rage. When she reached the cozy little sitting room which had been devoted to her special use, having closed the door with a bang which re-echoed along the corridors, she found herself surrounded by just that atmosphere of personal comfort in which her sybaritic old soul delighted. A cheerful fire burned in the grate. Before it was drawn up the easiest of easy chairs. At the side of the chair stood a table upon which there was a tray containing those refreshments, solid and liquid, with which Aunt Sarah loved best to fortify herself for the hours of darkness, a collection of papers and magazines, and half a dozen new books. The gay chintz curtains were close drawn, and the electric lights behind their rosy shades threw just the right amount of light upon this pleasant interior. Aunt Sarah had often before left a company of people in displeasure and retired to her own apartment with a bang of the door behind her. But once shut in by herself, the expression of her face had usually changed, and with a grim chuckle at her own astuteness and the remembrance of her effective departure, she had settled herself down with a mind wiped clean of emotion to the enjoyment of her own society. But tonight Aunt Sarah took no delight in her own society nor did her angry old face change as she closed the door on the cozy warmth of her room. It is true that she sat down in the easy chair in front of the fire. Women do not pace the room in their rage, as is the custom with men. All the same, a consuming rage held her. It had in it a tinge of helplessness, and it shook her wiry old frame like an eggwee. Aunt Sarah was beaten, and she had the sense to recognize it. By and by, she began to feel rather alarmed at her state of mind. Helpless anger is not a soothing emotion, and Aunt Sarah, in spite of her well-nourished vigor, was an old woman. It was very uncomfortable to be so angry, and it was still more uncomfortable to realize that her power of keeping her own personality in the ascendant had been wrested from her by a chit of a low-born foreigner, as she expressed it to herself. When her anger had tired her sufficiently, the feeling of helplessness increased, and sorely, against her will, Aunt Sarah began to pity herself. She fought against this feeling of self-pity for some time. She was made of sterner stuff than those who cherish it as a mild luxury, but it overpowered her at last. She suddenly saw herself, old and, for all her many relations and acquaintances, friendless, worse than friendless, feared and disliked. She was also, for the time being, homeless. She had let her little box of a house in London for the winter, 
Anne had intended to stay at Castle Gide for at least a month. If she carried out her threat of leaving the next morning, she had nowhere to go to, and she was accustomed to run things so close that she actually had not the money to take her to some place suitable to her exalted station and to keep herself there for four weeks. Then she suddenly realized that in the depths of her queer, twisted heart, she was fond of her nephew. Also, that her nephew's American bride had brought her both deference and entertainment, as long as she had treated her with ordinary courtesy. She also discovered that she had a sentiment for Castle Gide, which had been her own home for 35 years, that was not wholly dependent upon its capabilities of affording her the degree of luxurious living which she most appreciated. At this point, something happened which had not happened for fully half a century. Two large tears trickled down Aunt Sarah's face. She knew herself for a lonely, disagreeable old woman, very, very poor. When Otterburn came out of the dining room with the rest of the men, he drew his wife a little aside and said to her, Look here, old lady, I don't think we can carry this on. I am afraid Aunt Sarah will have a fit if we bait her much more. Her eyes rolled most unpleasantly at dinner. Where is she, by the by? She's gone upstairs looking mighty ugly, replied her ladyship. She's going to express her baggage home tomorrow. Oh, she mustn't do that, said Otterburn. She's always gone on like that, and her bark is much worse than her bite. You go and calm her down, and we'll stop this game. We've won, said Lady Otterburn, but I don't feel very spry over the victory. She is an old lady, and I guess we'll just have to let her play by herself as long as she camps here. I'll go up to her right now. So Lady Otterburn entered Aunt Sarah's room just in time to catch her drying the two tears aforesaid, and a few more that had followed them. A wave of compunction passed over her, and she felt that she and her husband and their guests had all behaved with the most unmannerly brutality. Dear Aunt Sarah, she said, I hate that you should be all alone up here while we are enjoying ourselves downstairs. Won't you come down and hear Mrs. Van Hooten sing? They call her the Nightingale of Cincinnati in the States. Now, if Lady Otterburn had followed the impulse that came to her to kneel by the side of the old woman in mixed tears, she would almost certainly have been repulsed and would have found Aunt Sarah once more encased in a full suit of prickles. For, however much in a moment of weakness that redoubtable old lady may have pitied herself, she certainly would have permitted no one else to pity her. But Lady Otterburn was a young woman of considerable tact as well as generosity of feeling, and her method of approach proved to be the best she could have chosen. Not tonight, replied Aunt Sarah. I confess to being slightly upset at what has occurred, and I do not feel equal to mixing with your guests at present. I guess we must have offended you with our little game, said Lady Otterburn, but we didn't mean any harm, and we've left off playing it now. It has served its purpose, said Aunt Sarah slowly. I've been thinking matters over since I came upstairs. It is not easy for a woman of my age and character to confess herself in the wrong. But as far as you are concerned, my dear, I, I really think that by showing mutual respect and consideration, we may perhaps get on very well together. The speech had not ended quite in the manner Aunt Sarah had intended when she began it, but the habits of a lifetime are not changed in a moment, and its underlying meaning was, at any rate, clear. Aunt Sarah had come as near as she'd ever done in her life to an unreserved apology for her behavior. Lady Otterburn was prepared to meet her a good deal more than halfway. Of course you feel seeing me here in your place, she said. I don't wonder. But both Edward and I want you to look upon Castle Gide as your home, just the same as before. This was not strictly true so far as Edward was concerned, but it must be admitted to have been generous. And... I'm new to this country and to a position to which you were born. There are so many ways in which you could help, Aunt Sarah. My dear, said the old woman, any help I can give you shall have. But I think you are quite capable of holding your own anywhere and, and of adorning any position. So the Treaty of Peace was concluded, and the Countess and the Dowager Countess of Otterburn spent a pleasant hour together talking amicably of many things. When Aunt Sarah came downstairs the next morning, she found everybody very anxious to please her. The general attitude of the party was that of people who had committed a breach of courtesy and were ashamed of themselves. Probably this attitude drove compunction into Aunt Sarah's soul more completely than any other could have done. She met advances with amiability and exercised her fearless tongue and her undoubtedly sharp intellect to the general amusement rather than to the general terrifying of the company. By the time that the house party broke up, she had discovered, possibly to her amazement, 
that ascendancy could be maintained as completely and far more pleasantly by force of character combined with wit and good humor than by force of character supported by aggressive arrogance alone. And thus, fortified by experience of its efficacy, Aunt Sarah's conversion was permanent. This is not to say that from a most objectionable old woman she changed at a bound into an exceedingly attractive one. The simile of the leopard and the Ethiopian still holds good. But there was an all-around improvement in her attitude towards the world at large, which, whenever she found herself at Castle Gide, was an improvement which seemed to approach the miraculous. A year after the events of this story, when the two ladies Otterburn had been worshipping together for an hour at a cradle shrine plentifully bedecked with lace, the younger of them said to her husband, Dear Aunt Sarah, she has a real loving heart. I guess it was warped by her never having a baby of her own. End of The Conversion of Aunt Sarah by Archibald Marshall Recording by Colleen McMahon The Devil in the Churchyard by A. E. Coppard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Devil in the Churchyard. Henry Turley was one of those awkward old chaps, as he had more money than he knowed what to do with. Shadrach, we called him, the silly man. He had worked for it, worked hard for it, but when he was old he stuck to his fortune and wouldn't spend a sixpence of it on his comforts. What a silly man! The Thatcher, who was thus talking of Henry Turley, long since dead and gone, in the black cat of Starncombe, was himself perhaps fifty years old. Already there was a crank of age or of dampness or of mere custom in most of his limbs, but he was bluff and gruff and hale enough, with a bluffness of manner that could only offend a fool, and fools never listened to him. Shadrach, that's what we called him, was a good man with cattle, a masterpiece. He would strip a cow as clean as a tooth, and you never knowed a cow have a bad quarter as Henry Turley ever milked. And when he was buried, he was buried with all that money in his coffin, holding it in his hand, I reckon, he had plenty of relations. You wouldn't know him. It is thirty years ago I'd be speaking of. But it was all down in black and white, so as no one could touch it. A lot of people in these parts had a right to some of it. Jim Scarrett, for one, and Issy Hawker a bit. Mrs. Keelson, poor woman, ought to have had a bit. And his own brother, Mark Turley. But he left it in the will, as all his fortune was to be buried in the coffin along of him. It was cruel. But so it is, and so it will be, for whenever such people has a shilling to give away, they goes and claps it on some fat pig's haunches. The foolishness! Sixty pounds it was, in a canister, and he held it in his hand. "'I don't believe a word of it,' said a mild-faced man sitting in the corner. "'Henry Turley never did a deed like that.' "'What?' growled the Thatcher with unusual ferocity. Of course, I'm not disputing what you're saying, but he never did such a thing in his life. Then you calls me a liar? Certainly not. Oh, no, don't misunderstand me. But Henry Turley never did any such thing. I can't believe it of him. Ha! Huh, I be telling you facts, and facts be true one way or another. Now you wants to call over me. You wants to know the rights of everything and the wrongs of nothing. "'Well,' said the mild-faced man, pushing his pot towards the teller of tales, "'I might believe it to-morrow, but it's a bit of a twister now, this minute.' "'Ah, that's all right, then.' The Thatcher was completely mollified. "'Well, the worst part of the case was his brother Mark. Shadrach served him shameful, treated him like a dog. "'Good health! Ah, like a dog! Mark was older than him, about seventy and he lived by himself in a little house out by the hanging post. Not much of a cottage it was, just wattle and door, we a thetch of straw. But the lease was running out, it was a lifehold affair, and unless he bought this little house for fifty pounds, he'd got to go out of it. Well, old Mark hadn't got no fifty pounds, he was ate up with rheumatics, and only did just a little light labour in the woods. They might as well have asked him for the king's crown, so he said to his master, 
would he lend him the fifty pounds? No, I can't do that, his master says. You could reduct it from my wages, Mark says. No, I can't do that neither, says his master. But there's your brother Henry, he's worth a power of money, ask him. So Mark asked Shadrach to lend him the fifty pounds, so as he could buy this little house. No, says Henry, I can't. No, he wouldn't. Well, old Mark says to him, I don't wish you no harm, Henry, he says, but I hope as how you'll die in a ditch. Good health. And sure enough, he did. That was his own brother. He was stricken with the sun and died in a ditch. Henry did. And when he was buried, his fortune was buried with him in a little canister holding it in his hand, I reckons. And a lot of good that was to him. He hadn't been buried a month when two bad parties put their heads together. Levi Carter, one was. He was the sexton, a man that was half a loony, as I always thought. Oh, yes, he had got all his wits about him somewheres, only they didn't often get much of a quorum. Still, he got them somewheres. T'other was a chap by the name of Impey, lived in Slack the shoemaker's house down by the old traveller's garden. He wasn't much of a matcher. Helped in the field work and did shepherding at odd times, and these two chaps made up their mind to goo and collar Henry Turley's fortune out of his coffin one night and share it between themselves. It was crime, you know. Might have been prison for life, but this impy was a bad lot. He'd the manners of a pith. Pooh, filthy! And I expect he persuaded old Levi on to do it. Bad as body snatchin', course twas. So they goes together, one dark night, long in November it was, and well you knows, all of you, as well as I, that nobody can't ever see over our churchyard wall by day, let alone on a dark night. You all knows that, don't you? asserted the Thatcher, who appeared to lay some stress upon this point in his narrative. There were murmurs of acquiescence by all except the mild-faced man, and the Thatcher continued. To about nine o'clock when they dug out the earth, to want a very hard job, for Henry was only just a little way down. He was buried on top of his old woman, and she was on top of her two daughters. But when they got down to the coffin, Impey didn't much care for that part of the job. He felt a little bit sick, so he gives the hammer and the screwdriver to Levi, and he says, Levi, he says, are you game to make a good job of this? Yes, I be, says old Levi. Well then, Impey says, You'll have my smock on now while I just creep off to old Wanaka's sheep and collars one of their fat lambs over by the lotments. You're not going to leave me here, says Carter. What be I going to do? You go on and finish this here job, Levi, he says. You get the money and put back all the earth and don't stir out of the yard afore I come or I'll have your blood. No, says Carter, you won't do that. I'll do that. Impey says. You've got some smartish lambs, I can tell ye, fat as snails. No, says Carter. I won't have no truck with that. Tain't right. You will, says Impey, and I'll get the sheep. Here's my smock. I'll meet ye here again in ten minutes. I'll have that lamb if I has to cut his blasted head off. And he rushed away before Levi could stop him. So Carter puts on the smock and finishes the job. He got the money and put the earth back on poor Henry and tidied it up, and then he went and sat in the church porch, waiting for this impy to come back. Just as he did that, an oldish man passed by the gate. He was coming to this very place for a drop of drink, and he sees old Levi's white figure sitting in the church porch, and it frightened him so much. He took to his heels and tore along to this very room we be sitting in now, only twas thirty years ago. "'What in the name of God's the matter with you?' they says to him, for he's a face like chalk in his lips, was blue as a whetstone. "'Have you seen a ghost?' "'Yes,' he says, "'I've seen a ghost just now, then.' "'A ghost?' they said. "'A ghost? You ain't seen no ghost?' "'I seen a ghost. "'Where you seen a ghost?' "'So he told them he had seen a ghost, "'sitting up in the church porch.' "'I shan't have that,' says old Mark Turley, for he was sitting here. "'I tell you, twas then,' says the man. "'Can't be nothing worse than I be myself,' Mark says. "'I say it is,' the man said, and he was vexed, too. "'Go and see for yourself.' 
I would go too and all, said old Mark, if only I could walk it, but my rheumatics be that scrumatious I can't walk. Goose, said ne'er a mortal man has ever seen a goose. I'd go, my lad, if my lads, if my legs had stand it. And there was a lot of talk like that until a young sailor spoke up. Irish he was, his name was Pat Crow. He was on furlough. I don't know what he was a doing in this part of the world, but there he was, and he says to Mark, If you be game enough, I be, and I carry you up to the churchyard on me back. A great stropping fellow he was. You will, says Mark. That I will, he says. Well, I be game for he, says Mark, and so they ups him onto the sailor's shoulders like a sack of corn, and away they goes. But not another one there was man enough to go with them. They went slogging up to the churchyard gate all right, but when they got to staggering along tween the gravestones, Mark thought he could see a something white sitting on the porch, but the sailor couldn't see anything at all with that lump on his shoulders. What's that there? Mark whispers in Pat's ear, and Pat Crow whispers back, just for joking, old Nick in his nightshirt. Steady now, Mark whispers. Go steady, Pat. He's getting up and coming. Pat only gives a bit of a chuckle and says, Ah, that's him. That's just like him. Then Levi calls out from the porch, soft like. You got him then? Is he a fat un? Holy God, cried the sailor. It is the devil. And he chucks poor Mark over his back at Levi's feet and runs for his mortal life. He was the most frightened of the lot because he hadn't believed in anything at all. But there it was. And just as he gets to the gate, he sees someone else coming along in the dark, carrying a something on its shoulder. It was Impy with the sheep. Powers above, cried Pat Crow. It's the day of judgment come for certain. And he went roaring the news up street like a madman, and Impy went off somewheres too. But I don't know where Impy went. Well, poor old Mark laid on the ground. He were a game old cock, but he could hardly speak. He was struck dazzled and Levi was frittened out of his life in the darkness and couldn't make anything out of nothing. He just creeps along to Mark and whispers, Who be that? And old Mark looks up very timid, for he thought his last hour was on him, and he says, Be that you, Satan? Dragly Levi heard that, all in one unexpected voice. He jumped quicker on my neighbour's flea. He gave a yell bigger than Pat Crow, and he bolted too but as he went he dropped the little tin canister, and old Mark picked it up, and he shook the canister, and he had money in it, and then something began to dawn on him, for he knowed how his brother's fortune had been buried. "'I read it, I read it,' he says. "'That was Levi Carter, the dirty thief. "'I read it, I read it,' he says. And he put the tin can in his pocket and hopped off home as if he never knowed what rheumatics was at all and when he opened that canister there was the sixty golden sovereigns in that canister sixty golden sovereigns bad things'll be worse afore they're better says mark but they never won't be any better than this and so he stuck to the money in the canister and that's how he bought his cottage after all twa'n't much of a house just wattle and daub with a fetch of straw but twas what he fancied and there he ended his days like an old christian man Good health. End of The Devil in the Churchyard by A. E. Coppard. Gabriel Ernest by H. H. Munro, Saki, 1870 to 1916. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson There is a wild beast in your woods, said the artist Cunningham, as he was being driven to the station. It was the only remark he had made during the drive, but as Van Scheel had talked incessantly, his companion's silence had not been noticeable. A stray fox or two and some resident weasels "'Nothing more formidable,' said Van Cheel. "'The artist said nothing. "'What did you mean about a wild beast?' said Van Cheel later, "'when they were on the platform. 
Nothing, my imagination. Here is the train, said Cunningham. That afternoon Van Chill went for one of his frequent rambles through his woodland property. He had a stuffed bittern in his study, and he knew the names of quite a number of wild flowers, so his aunt had possibly some justification in describing him as a great naturalist. At any rate, he was a great walker. It was his custom to take a mental note of everything he saw during his walks, not so much for the purpose of assisting contemporary science as to provide topics for conversation afterwards. When the bluebells began to show themselves in flower, he made a point of informing every one of the fact. The season of the year might have warned his hearers of the likelihood of such an occurrence, but at least they felt that he was being absolutely frank with them. What Van Cheel saw on this particular afternoon was, however, something far removed from his ordinary range of experience. On a shelf of smooth stone, overhanging a deep pool in the hollow of an oak coppice, a boy of about sixteen lay a sprawl, drying his wet brown limbs luxuriously in the sun. His wet hair, parted by a recent dive, lay close to his head, and his light brown eyes, so light that there was an almost tigerish gleam in them, were turned towards Van Chill with a certain lazy watchfulness. It was an unexpected apparition, and Van Chill found himself engaged in the novel process of thinking before he spoke. Where on earth could this wild-looking boy hail from? The miller's wife had lost a child some two months ago, supposed to have been swept away by the mill race, but that had been a mere baby, not a half-grown lad. "'What are you doing there?' he demanded. "'Obviously sunning myself,' replied the boy. "'Where do you live?' "'Here, in these woods.' "'You can't live in the woods,' said Van Cheel. "'They are very nice woods,' said the boy, "'with a touch of patronage in his voice. "'But where do you sleep at night?' "'I don't sleep at night.' That's my busiest time. Van Chill began to have an irritated feeling that he was grappling with a problem that was eluding him. What do you feed on? he asked. Flesh, said the boy, and he pronounced the word with slow relish, as though he were tasting it. Flesh? What flesh? Since it interests you, Rabbits, wild fowl, hares, poultry, lambs in their season, children when I can get any, they are usually too well locked in at night when I do most of my hunting. It's quite two months since I tasted child flesh. Ignoring the chafing nature of the last remark, Van Chill tried to draw the boy on the subject of possible poaching operations. You're talking rather through your hat when you speak of feeding on hares. Considering the nature of the boy's toilet, the simile was hardly an apt one. Our hillside hares aren't easily caught. At night I hunt on four feet, was the somewhat cryptic response. I suppose you mean that you hunt with a dog, hazarded Van Cheel. The boy rolled slowly over on to his back, and laughed a weird low laugh that was pleasantly like a chuckle and disagreeably like a snarl. I don't fancy any dog would be very anxious for my company, especially at night. Van Cheel began to feel that there was something positively uncanny about the strange-eyed, strange-tongued youngster. I can't have you staying in these woods, he declared authoritatively. I fancy you'd rather have me here than in your house, said the boy. The prospect of this wild, nude animal in Van Chill's primly ordered house was certainly an alarming one. If you don't go, I shall have to make you, said Van Chill. The boy turned like a flash, 
plunged into the pool, and in a moment had flung his wet and glistening body halfway up the bank where Van Chill was standing. In an otter, the movement would have not been remarkable. In a boy, Van Chiel found it sufficiently startling. His foot slipped as he made an involuntary backward movement, and he found himself almost prostrate on the slippery, weed-grown bank, with those tigerish yellow eyes not very far from his own. Almost instinctively, he half raised his hand to his throat. The boy laughed again, a laugh in which the snarl had nearly driven out the chuckle, and then, with another of his astonishing lightning movements, plunged out of view into a yielding tangle of weed and fern. "'What an extraordinary wild animal!' said Van Cheel as he picked himself up. And then he recalled Cunningham's remark. "'There is a wild beast in your woods.' Walking slowly homeward, Van Gil began to turn over in his mind various local occurrences which might be traceable to the existence of this astonishing young savage. Something had been thinning the game in the woods lately. Poultry had been missing from the farms. Hares were growing unaccountably scarcer, and complaints had reached him of lambs being carried off bodily from the hills. Was it possible that this wild boy was really hunting the countryside in company with some clever poacher dogs? He had spoken of hunting four-footed by night, but then, again, he had hinted strangely at no dog caring to come near him, especially at night. It was certainly puzzling, and then, as Van Chill ran his mind over the various depredations that had been committed during the last month or two, he came suddenly to a dead stop, alike in his walk and his speculations. The child missing from the mill two months ago, the accepted theory was that it had tumbled into the mill race and been swept away, but the mother had always declared she had heard a shriek on the hillside of the house in the opposite direction from the water. It was unthinkable, of course, but he wished that the boy had not made that uncanny remark about child flesh eaten two months ago. Such dreadful things should not be said even in fun. Van Cheel, contrary to his usual wont, did not feel disposed to be communicative about his discovery in the wood. His position as a parish councillor and justice of the peace seemed somehow compromised by the fact that he was harbouring a personality of such doubtful repute on his property. There was even a possibility that a heavy bill of damages for raided lambs and poultry might be laid at his door. At dinner that night he was quite unusually silent. "'Where's your voice gone to?' said his aunt. One would think you had seen a wolf. Van Chill, who was not familiar with the old saying, thought the remark rather foolish. If he had seen a wolf on his property, his tongue would have been extraordinarily busy with the subject. At breakfast next morning, Van Chill was conscious that his feeling of uneasiness regarding yesterday's episode had not wholly disappeared and he resolved to go by train to the neighbouring cathedral town, hunt up Cunningham, and learn from him what he had really seen that had prompted the remark about a wild beast in the woods. With this resolution taken, his usual cheerfulness partially returned, and he hummed a bright little melody as he sauntered to the morning room for his customary cigarette. As he entered the room, the melody made way abruptly for a pious invocation. Gracefully asprawl on the ottoman, in an attitude of almost exaggerated repose, was the boy of the woods. He was drier than when Van Chill had last seen him, but no other alteration was noticeable in his toilet. "'How dare you come here?' asked Van Chill furiously. "'You told me I was not to stay in the woods,' said the boy calmly. "'But not to come here?' Supposing my aunt should see you? And with a view to minimising the catastrophe, Van Cheel hastily obscured as much of his unwelcome guest as possible under the folds of a morning post, 
At that moment his aunt entered the room. This is a poor boy who has lost his way and lost his memory. He doesn't know who he is or where he comes from, explained Van Chill desperately, glancing apprehensively at the waist's face to see whether he was going to add inconvenient candour to his other savage propensities. Miss Van Cheel was enormously interested. Perhaps his underlinen is marked, she suggested. He seems to have lost most of that too, said Van Cheel, making frantic little grabs at the morning post to keep it in its place. A naked homeless child appealed to Miss Van Cheel as warmly as a stray kitten or derelict puppy would have done. We must do all we can for him, she decided, and in a very short time a messenger, dispatched to the rectory, where a page-boy was kept, had returned with a suit of pantry clothes and the necessary accessories of shirt, shoes, collar, etc. Clothed, clean and groomed, the boy lost none of his uncanniness in Van Cheel's eyes, but his aunt found him sweet. We must call him something till we know who he really is, she said. Gabriel Ernest, I think. Those are nice, suitable names. Van Cheel agreed, but he privately doubted whether they were being grafted on to a nice, suitable child. His misgivings were not diminished by the fact that his staid and elderly spaniel had bolted out of the house at the first incoming of the boy, and now obstinately remained shivering and yapping at the farther end of the orchard, while the canary, usually as vocally industrious as Van Cheel himself, had put itself on an allowance of frightened cheeps. More than ever he was resolved to consult Cunningham without loss of time. As he drove off to the station, his aunt was arranging that Gabriel Ernest should help her to entertain the infant members of her Sunday school class at tea that afternoon. Cunningham was not at first disposed to be communicative. My mother died of some brain trouble, he explained, so you will understand why I am averse to dwelling on anything of an impossibly fantastic nature that I may see or think that I have seen. But what did you see? persisted Van Cheel. What I thought I saw was something so extraordinary that no really sane man could dignify it with the credit of having actually happened. I was standing the last evening I was with you, half hidden in the hedge growth by the orchard gate, watching the dying glow of the sunset. Suddenly I became aware of a naked boy, a bather from some neighbouring pool, I took him to be, who was standing out on the bare hillside also watching the sunset. His pose was so suggestive of some wild fawn of pagan myth that I instantly wanted to engage him as a model, and in another moment I think I should have hailed him. But just then the sun dipped out of view, and all the orange and pink slid out of the landscape, leaving it cold and grey, and at the same moment an outstanding thing happened. The boy vanished too. What? Vanished away into nothing? asked Van Cheel excitedly. No, that is the dreadful part of it, answered the artist. On the open hillside where the boy had been standing a second ago stood a large wolf, blackish in colour, with gleaming fangs and cruel yellow eyes. You may think but Van Chill did not stop for anything as futile as thought. Already he was tearing at top speed towards the station. He dismissed the idea of a telegram. Gabriel Ernest is a werewolf, was a hopelessly inadequate effort at conveying the situation, and his aunt would think it was a code message to which he had admitted to give her the key. His one hope was that he might reach home before sundown. The cab which he chartered at the other end of the railway journey bore him with what seemed exasperatingly slowness along the country roads, which were pink and mauve with the flush of the sinking sun. His aunt was putting away some unfinished jams and cake when he arrived. "'Where is Gabriel Ernest?' he almost screamed. "'He is taking the little toop child home,' said his aunt. "'It was getting so late,' 
I thought it wasn't safe to let it go back alone. What a lovely sunset, isn't it? But Van Cheel, although not oblivious to the glow of the western sky, did not stay to discuss its beauties. At a speed for which he was scarcely geared, he raced along the narrow lane that led to the home of the Toops. On one side ran the swift current of the mill stream, on the other rose the stretch of bare hillside. A dwindling rim of red sun showed still in the skyline, and the next turning must bring him in view of the ill-assorted couple he was pursuing. Then the colour went suddenly out of things, and a grey light settled itself with a quick shiver over the landscape. Van Cheel heard a shrill wail of fear, and stopped running. Nothing was ever seen again of the toot child or Gabriel Ernest, but the latter's discarded garments were found lying in the road, so it was assumed that the child had fallen into the water, and that the boy had stripped and jumped in, in a vain endeavour to save it. Van Cheel and some workmen who were nearby at the time testified to having heard a child scream loudly just near the spot where the clothes were found. Mrs. Toop, who had eleven other children, was decently resigned to her bereavement, but Miss Van Cheel sincerely mourned her lost foundling. It was on her initiative that a memorial brass was put up in the parish church to Gabriel Ernest, an unknown boy who bravely sacrificed his life for another. Van Chill gave way to his aunt in most things, but he flatly refused to subscribe to the Gabriel Ernest Memorial. End of Gabriel Ernest by Saki Recording by Peter Tomlinson The Generous Gambler by Charles Pierce Baudelaire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman The Generous Gambler by Charles Pierce Baudelaire Yesterday, across the crowd of the boulevard, I found myself touched by a mysterious being I had always desired to know, and who I recognized immediately, in spite of the fact that I had never seen him. He had, I imagined, in himself, relatively as to me, a similar desire, for he gave me, in passing, so significant a sign in his eyes that I hastened to obey him. I followed him alternately. I followed him attentively, and soon I descended behind him into a subterranean dwelling, astonishing to me as a vision, where shone a luxury of which none of the actual houses in Paris could give me an approximate example. It seemed to me singular that I had passed so often that prodigious retreat without having discovered the entrance. There reigned an exquisite and almost stifling atmosphere which made one forget almost instantaneously all of the fastidious horrors of life. There I breathed a somber sensuality, like that of opium smokers when, set on the shores of an enchanted island, over which shone an eternal afternoon, they felt born in them to the soothing sounds of melodious cascades, the desire of never again seeing their households, their women, their children, and of never again being tossed on the decks of ships by storms. There were there strange faces of men and women, gifted with so fatal a beauty that I seemed to have seen them years ago, and in countries which I had failed to remember, and which inspired in me that curious sympathy, and that equally curious sense of fear, that I usually discover in unknown aspects. If I wanted to define in some fashion or other the singular expression of their eyes, I would say that never had I seen such magic radiance more energetically expressing the horror of ennui and of desire, of the immortal desire of feeling themselves alive. As for my host and myself, we were already, as we sat down, 
as perfect friends as if we had always known each other we drank immeasurably of all sorts of extraordinary wines and the thing not less bizarre it seemed to me after several hours that i was no more intoxicated than he was however gambling this superhuman pleasure had cut at various intervals our copious libations and i ought to say that i gained and lost my soul as we were playing with an heroical carelessness and light-heartedness the soul is so invisible a thing often useless and sometimes so troublesome that i did not experience as to this loss more than the kind of emotion i might have had i lost my visiting card in the street we spent hours in smoking cigars whose incomparable savor and perfume gave to the soul the nostalgia of unknown delights and sights and intoxicated by all these spiced sauces i dared in an access of familiarity which did not seem to displease him to cry as i lifted a glass filled to the brim with wine to your immortal health old he-goat we talked of the universe of its creation and of its future destruction of the leading ideas of the century that is to say of progress and perfectibility and in general of all kinds of human infatuations on this subject his highness was inexhaustible in his unrefutable jests and he expressed himself with a splendor of diction and with a magnificence in drollery such as i have never found in any of the most famous conversationalists of our age he explained to me the absurdity of different philosophies that had so far taken possession of men's brains and deigned even to take me in confidence in regard to certain fundamental principles which i am not inclined to share with any one he complained in no way of the evil reputation under which he lived indeed all over the world and he assured me that he himself was of all living beings the most interested in the destruction of superstition and he avowed to me that he had been afraid relatively as to his proper power once only and that was on the day when he had heard a preacher more subtle than the rest of the human herd cry in his pulpit my dear brethren do not ever forget when you hear the progress of lights praised that the loveliest trick of the devil is to persuade you that he does not exist the memory of this famous orator brought us naturally on to the subject of academies and my strange host declared to me that he didn't disdain in many cases to inspire the pens the words and the consciences of pedagogues and that he almost always assisted in person in spite of being invisible at all the scientific meetings encouraged by so much kindness i asked him if he had any news of god who has not his hours of impiety especially as the old friend of the devil he said to me with a shade of unconcerned unity with a deeper shade of sadness we salute each other when we meet but for the rest he spoke in hebrew it is uncertain if his highness has ever given so long an audience to a simple mortal and i feared to abuse it finally as dark approached shivering this famous personage sung by so many poets and served by so many philosophers who work for his glory's sake without being aware of it said to me i want you to remember me always and to prove to you that i of whom one says so much evil am often enough bon diable to make use of one of your vulgar locutions so as to make up for the irremediable loss that you have made of your soul i shall give you back the stake you ought to have gained if your fate had been fortunate that is to say the possibility of solacing 
and of conquering during your whole life this bizarre affliction of ennui which is the source of all your maladies and all your miseries never a desire shall be formed by you that i will not aid you to realize you will reign over your vulgar equals money and gold and diamonds fairy palaces shall come to seek you and shall ask you to accept them without your having made the least effort to obtain them you can change your abode as often as you like you shall have in your power all sensualities without lassitude in lands where the climate is always hot and where women are as scented as the flowers with this he rose up and said good-bye to me with a charming smile if it had not been for the shame of humiliating myself before so immense an assembly i might have voluntarily fallen at the feet of this generous gambler to thank him for his unheard-of munificence but little by little after i had left him an incurable defiance entered into me i dared no longer believe in so prodigious a happiness and as i went to bed making over again my nightly prayers by means of all that remained in me in the matter of faith i repeated in my slumber my god my lord my god do not let the devil keep his word with me end of the generous gambler by charles pierre baudelaire A Harbinger by Kate Chopin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. A Harbinger by Kate Chopin. Bruno did very nice work in black and white, sometimes in green and yellow and red but he never did anything quite so clever as during the summer he spent in the hill. The springtime freshness had stayed some way, and then there was the gentle Diantha, with hair the color of ripe wheat, who posed for him when he wanted. She was as beautiful as a flower, crisp with morning dew. Her violet eyes were baby eyes when he first came. When he went away, he kissed her, and she turned red and white and trembled. As quick as thought the baby look went out of her eyes, and another flashed into them. Bruno sighed a good deal over his work that winter. The women he painted were all like mountain flowers. The big city seemed too desolate for endurance often. He tried not to think of sweet-eyed Diantha, but there was nothing to keep him from remembering the hills the whir of the summer breeze through the delicate-leafed maples, the bird notes that used to break clear and sharp into the stillness when he and Diantha were together on the wooded hillside. So when summer came again, Bruno gathered his bags, his brushes and colors and things. He whistled soft, low tunes as he did so. He sang even when he was not lost in wondering if the sunlight would fall just as it did last June, a slant the green slope. And if Diantha would quiver red and white again when he called her his sweet own Diantha, as he meant to. Bruno had made his way through the tangle of underbrush, but before he came quite to the wood's edge he halted. For thereabout the little church that gleamed white in the sun, people were gathered, old and young. He thought Diantha might be among them, and strained his eyes to see if she were, but she was not. He did see her, though, when the doors of the rustic temple swung open, like a white-robed lily now. There was a man beside her. It mattered not who, enough that it was one who had gathered this wild flower for his own, while Bruno was dreaming. Foolish Bruno! to have been only love's harbinger after all. He turned away, 
With hurried strides he descended the hill again, to wait by the big water tank for the train to come along. The End of A Harbinger by Kate Chopin The Horse Dealer's Daughter by D. H. Lawrence, eighteen eighty five to nineteen thirty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Well, Mabel, and what are you going to do with yourself? asked Joe, with foolish flippancy. He felt quite safe himself. Without listening for an answer, he turned aside, worked a grain of tobacco to the tip of his tongue and spat it out. He did not care about anything, since he felt safe himself. The three brothers and the sister sat round the desolate breakfast table, attempting some sort of desultory consultation. The morning's post had given the final tap to the family fortunes, and all was over. The dreary dining-room itself, with its heavy mahogany furniture, looked as if it were waiting to be done away with. But the consultation amounted to nothing. There was a strange air of ineffectuality about the three men, as they sprawled at table, smoking and reflecting vaguely on their own condition. The girl was alone, a rather short, sullen-looking young woman of twenty-seven. She did not share the same life as her brothers. She would have been good-looking, save for the impassive fixity of her face, bulldog, as her brothers called it. There was a confused tramping of horses' feet outside. The three men all sprawled round in their chairs to watch. Beyond the dark holly bushes that separated the strip of lawn from the high road, they could see a cavalcade of shire horses swinging out of their own yard, being taken for exercise. This was the last time. These were the last horses that would go through their hands. The young men watched with critical, callous look. They were all frightened at the collapse of their lives and the sense of disaster in which they were involved left them no inner freedom. Yet they were three fine, well-set fellows enough. Joe, the eldest, was a man of thirty-three, broad and handsome in a hot, flushed way. His face was red. He twisted his black moustache over a thick finger. His eyes were shallow and restless. He had a sensual way of uncovering his teeth when he laughed, and his bearing was stupid. Now he watched the horses with a glazed look of helplessness in his eyes, a certain stupor of downfall. The great draught horses swung past. They were tied head to tail, four of them, and they heaved along to where a lane branched off from the high road, planting their great hoofs floutingly in the fine black mud, swinging their great rounded haunches sumptuously, and trotting a few sudden steps as they were led into the lane round the corner. Every movement showed a massive, slumberous strength, and a stupidity which held them in subjection. The groom at the head looked back, jerking the leading rope, and the cavalcade moved out of sight up the lane, the tail of the last horse bobbed up tight and stiff, held out taut from the swinging great haunches as they rocked behind the hedges in a motion-like sleep. Joe watched with glazed, hopeless eyes. The horses were almost like his own body to him. He felt he was done for now. Luckily he was engaged to a woman as old as himself, and therefore her father, who was steward of a neighbouring estate, would provide him with a job. He would marry and go into harness. His life was over. He would be a subject animal now. He turned uneasily aside, the retreating steps of the horses echoing in his ears. Then with foolish restlessness he reached for the scraps of bacon rind from the plates and making a faint whistling sound flung them to the terrier that lay against the fender. He watched the dog swallow them. 
and waited till the creature looked into his eyes. Then a faint grin came on his face, and in a high, foolish voice he said, "'You won't get much more bacon, shall you, you little bee?' The dog faintly and dismally wagged its tail, then lowered its haunches, circled round, and lay down again. There was another helpless silence at the table. Joe sprawled uneasily in his seat, not willing to go till the family conclave was dissolved. Fred Henry, the second brother, was erect, clean-limbed, alert. He had watched the passing of the horses with more sang Freud. If he was an animal like Joe, he was an animal which controls, not one which is controlled. He was master of any horse, and he carried himself with a well-tempered air of mastery. But he was not master of the situations of life. He pushed his coarse brown moustache upwards off his lip and glanced irritably at his sister, who sat impassive and inscrutable. "'You'll go and stop with Lucy for a bit, shan't you?' he asked. The girl did not answer. "'I don't see what else you can do,' persisted Fred Henry. "'Go as a skivvy,' Joe interpolated laconically. The girl did not move a muscle. "'If I was her, I should go in for training for a nurse,' said Malcolm, the youngest of them all. He was the baby of the family, a young man of twenty-two, with a fresh, jaunty museau. But Mabel did not take any notice of him. They had talked at her and round her for so many years that she hardly heard them at all. The marble clock on the mantelpiece softly chimed the half-hour, the dog rose uneasily from the hearth-rug and looked at the party at the breakfast-table, but still they sat on in ineffectual conclave. "'Oh, all right,' said Joe suddenly. "'A propos of nothing. I'll get a move on.' He pushed back his chair, straddled his knees with a downward jerk to get them free, in horsey fashion, and went to the fire. Still he did not go out of the room. He was curious to know what the others would do or say. He began to charge his pipe, looking down at the dog and saying in a high affected voice, Going with me, going with me, Arthur. Thart going farther than thou counts on just now. Dost hear? The dog faintly wagged its tail. The man stuck out his jaw and covered his pipe with his hands and puffed intently, losing himself in the tobacco, looking down all the while at the dog with an absent brown eye. The dog looked up at him in mournful distrust. Joe stood with his knees stuck out, in real horsey fashion. "'Have you had a letter from Lucy?' Fred Henry asked of his sister. "'Last week,' came the neutral reply. "'And what does she say?' There was no answer. "'Does she ask you to go and stop there?' persisted Fred Henry. "'She says I can if I like.' "'Well, then, you'd better. Tell her you'll come on Monday.' This was received in silence. "'That's what you'll do, then, is it?' said Fred Henry, in some exasperation. But she made no answer. There was a silence of futility and irritation in the room. Malcolm grinned fatuously. "'You'll have to make up your mind between now and next Wednesday,' said Joe loudly, "'or else find yourself lodgings on the curbstone. The face of the young woman darkened, but she sat on immutable. "'Here's Jack Ferguson!' exclaimed Malcolm, who was looking aimlessly out of the window. "'Where?' exclaimed Joe loudly. "'Just gone past. Coming in?' Malcolm craned his neck to see the gate. Yes, he said. There was a silence. Mabel sat on like one condemned at the head of the table. Then a whistle was heard from the kitchen. The dog got up and barked sharply. Joe opened the door and shouted, Come on! After a moment a young man entered. He was muffled up in overcoat and a purple woolen scarf and his tweed cap, which he did not remove, was pulled down on his head. 
He was of a medium height. His face was rather long and pale. His eyes looked tired. "'Hello, Jack! Well, Jack!' exclaimed Malcolm and Joe. Fred Henry merely said, "'Jack?' "'What's doing?' asked the newcomer, evidently addressing Fred Henry. "'Same. We've got to be out by Wednesday.' "'Got a cold?' "'I have. Got it bad, too.' "'Why don't you stop in?' "'Me? Stop in? When I can't stand on my legs, perhaps I shall have a chance.' The young man spoke huskily. He had a slight Scotch accent. "'It's a knockout, isn't it?' said Joe, boisterously. "'If a doctor goes round croaking with a cold, looks bad for the patients, doesn't it?' The young doctor looked at him slowly. "'Anything the matter with you, then?' he asked sarcastically. "'Not as I know of. Damn your eyes, I hope not. Why?' I thought you were very concerned about the patients, wondered if you might be one yourself. Damn it, no. I've never been patient to no flaming doctor, and hope I never shall be, returned Joe. At this point Mabel rose from the table, and they all seemed to become aware of her existence. She began putting the dishes together. The young doctor looked at her, but did not address her. He had not greeted her. She went out of the room with the tray, her face impassive and unchanged. "'When are you off, then, all of you?' asked the doctor. "'I'm catching the 11.40,' replied Markham. "'Are you going down with that trap, Joe?' "'Yes, I've told you I'm going down with the trap, haven't I? "'We'd better be getting her in, then. "'So long, Jack. "'If I don't see you before I go,' said Markham, shaking hands. He went out, followed by Joe, who seemed to have his tail between his legs. "'Well, this is the devil's own,' exclaimed the doctor, when he was left alone with Fred Henry. "'Going before Wednesday, are you?' "'That's the orders,' replied the other. "'Where? To Northampton?' "'That's it.' "'The devil!' exclaimed Ferguson, with quiet chagrin. And there was a silence between the two. "'All settled up, are you?' asked Ferguson. About. There was another pause. Well, I shall miss you, Freddy boy, said the young doctor. And I shall miss thee, Jack, returned the other. Miss you like hell, mused the doctor. Fred Henry turned aside. There was nothing to say. Mabel came in again to finish clearing the table. What are you going to do then, Miss Purvin? asked Ferguson. "'Going to your sister's, are you?' Mabel looked at him with her steady, dangerous eyes that always made him uncomfortable, unsettling his superficial ease. "'No,' she said. "'Well, what in the name of fortune are you going to do? "'Say what you mean to do,' cried Fred Henry with futile intensity." but she only averted her head and continued her work. She folded the white tablecloth and put on the chenille cloth. The sulkiest bitch that ever trod, muttered her brother. But she finished her task with perfectly impassive face, the young doctor watching her interestedly all the while. Then she went out. Fred Henry stared after her, clenching his lips, his blue eyes fixing in sharp antagonism, as he made a grimace of sour exasperation. "'You could bray her into bits, and that's all you'd get out of her,' he said in a small, narrowed tone. The doctor smiled faintly. "'What is she going to do, then?' he asked. "'Strike me if I know,' returned the other. There was a pause, then the doctor stirred. "'I'll be seeing you tonight, shall I?' he said to his friend. "'Aye, where's it to be?' I'll be going over to Jessdale. I don't know. I've got such a cold on me. I'll come round to the moon and stars anyway. Let Lizzie and May miss their night for once, eh? That's it, if I feel as I do now. All's one. The two young men went through the passage and down to the back door together. The house was large, but it was servantless now and desolate. At the back was a small bricked house yard, 
and beyond that a big square, gravelled fine and red, and having stables on two sides. Sloping dank winter-dark fields stretched away on the open sides. But the stables were empty. Joseph Purvin, the father of the family, had been a man of no education, had become a fairly large horse-dealer. The stables had been full of horses. There was a great turmoil and come and go of horses and of dealers and grooms. Then the kitchen was full of servants, but of late things had declined. The old man had married a second time to retrieve his fortunes. Now he was dead and everything was gone to the dogs. There was nothing but debt and threatening. For months Mabel had been servantless in the big house, keeping the home together in penury for her ineffectual brothers. She had kept house for ten years, but previously it was with unstinted means. Then, however brutal and coarse everything was, the sense of money had kept her proud, confident. The men might be foul-mouthed, the women in the kitchen might have bad reputations, her brothers might have illegitimate children, but so long as there was money, the girl felt herself established, and brutally proud, reserved. No company came to the house save dealers and coarse men. Mabel had no associates of her own sex after her sister went away. But she did not mind. She went regularly to church, she attended to her father, and she lived in the memory of her mother, who had died when she was fourteen, and whom she had loved. She had loved her father too in a different way, depending upon him and feeling secure in him until at the age of fifty-four he married again. And then she had set hard against him. Now he had died and left them all hopelessly in debt. She had suffered badly during the period of poverty. Nothing, however, could shake the curious, sullen, animal pride that dominated each member of the family. Now, for Mabel, the end had come. Still she would not cast about her. She would follow her own way just the same. She would always hold the keys of her own situation. Mindless and persistent, she endured from day to day. Why should she think? Why should she answer anybody? It was enough that this was the end, and there was no way out. She need not pass any more darkly along the main street of the small town, avoiding every eye. She need not demean herself any more, going into the shops and buying the cheapest food. This was at an end. She thought of nobody, not even of herself. Mindless and persistent, she seemed in a sort of ecstasy to be coming nearer to her fulfilment, her own glorification, approaching her dead mother, who was glorified. In the afternoon she took a little bag with shears and sponge and a small scrubbing brush and went out. It was a grey wintry day with saddened dark green fields and an atmosphere blackened by the smoke of foundries not far off. She went quickly, darkly along the causeway, heeding nobody, through the town to the churchyard. There she always felt secure, as if no one could see her, although as a matter of fact she was exposed to the stare of everyone who passed along under the churchyard wall. Nevertheless, once under the shadow of the great looming church, among the graves, she felt immune from the world, reserved within the thick churchyard wall, as in another country. Carefully she clipped the grass from the grave, and arranged the pinky-white small chrysanthemums in the tin cross. When this was done, she took an empty jar from a neighbouring grave, brought water, and carefully, most scrupulously, sponged the marble headstone and the coping stone. It gave her sincere satisfaction to do this. She felt in immediate contact with the world of her mother. She took minute pains, went through the park in a state bordering on pure happiness. As if in performing this task, she came into a subtle, intimate connection with her mother, for the life she followed here in the world was far less real than the world of death she inherited from her mother. The doctor's house was just by the church. Ferguson, being a mere hired assistant, was slave to the countryside. As he hurried now to attend to the outpatients in the surgery, glancing across the graveyard with a quick eye, 
He saw the girl at her task at the grave. She seemed so intent and remote, it was like looking into another world. Some mystical element was touched in him. He slowed down as he walked, watching her as if spellbound. She lifted her eyes, feeling him looking. Their eyes met, and each looked again at once, each feeling in some way found out by the other. He lifted his cap and passed on down the road. There remained distinct in his consciousness, like a vision, the memory of her face lifted from the tombstone in the churchyard and looking at him with slow, large, portentous eyes. It was portentous, her face. It seemed to mesmerize him. There was a heavy power in her eyes which laid hold of his whole being, as if he had drunk some powerful drug. He had been feeling weak and done before. Now the life came back into him. He felt delivered from his own fretted daily self. He finished his duties at the surgery as quickly as might be, hastily filling up the bottles of the waiting people with cheap drugs. Then, in perpetual haste, he set off again to visit several cases in another part of his round before tea-time. At all times he preferred to walk, if he could, but particularly when he was not well. He fancied the motion restored him. The afternoon was falling. It was grey, deadened and wintry, with a slow, moist, heavy coldness sinking in and deadening all the faculties. But why should he think or notice? He hastily climbed the hill and turned across the dark green fields, following the black cinder track. In the distance, across a shallow dip in the country, the small town was clustered like smouldering ash, a tower, a spire, a heap of low, raw, extinct houses, and on the nearest fringe of the town, sloping into the dip, was Old Meadow, the Purvin's house. He could see the stables and the outbuildings distinctly as they lay towards him on the slope, while he would not go there many more times. Another resource would be lost to him, another place gone. The only company he cared for in the alien, ugly little town he was losing. Nothing but work, drudgery, constant hastening from dwelling to dwelling among the colliers and the iron workers. It wore him out, but at the same time he had a craving for it. It was a stimulant to him to be in the homes of working people, moving as it were through the innermost body of their life. His nerves were excited and gratified. He could come so near into the very lives of the rough, inarticulate, powerfully emotional men and women. He grumbled, he said he hated the hellish whole, but as a matter of fact it excited him. The contact with the rough, strongly feeling people was a stimulant applied directly to his nerves. Below Old Meadow, in the green, shallow, sodden hollow of fields, lay a square, deep pond. Roving across the landscape, the doctor's quick eye detected a figure in black passing through the gate of the field, down towards the pond. He looked again. It would be Mabel Purvin. His mind suddenly became alive and attentive. Why was she going down there? He pulled up on the path on the slope above and stood staring. He could just make sure of the small black figure moving in the hollow of the failing day. He seemed to see her in the midst of such obscurity that he was like a clairvoyant, seeing rather with the mind's eye than with ordinary sight. Yet he could see her positively enough whilst he kept his eye attentive. He felt, if he looked away from her, in the thick, ugly falling dusk, he would lose her altogether. He followed her minutely as she moved, direct and intent, like something transmitted rather than stirring in voluntary activity, straight down the field towards the pond. There she stood on the bank for a moment. She never raised her head. Then she waded slowly into the water. He stood motionless as the small black figure walked slowly and deliberately towards the centre of the pond, very slowly gradually moving deeper into the motionless water and still moving forward as the water got up to her breast. 
Then he could see her no more in the dusk of the dead afternoon. There, he exclaimed, would you believe it? And he hastened straight down, running over the wet, sodden fields, pushing through the hedges, down into the depression of callous, wintry obscurity. It took him several minutes to come to the pond. He stood on the bank, breathing heavily. He could see nothing. His eyes seemed to penetrate the dead water. Yes, perhaps that was the dark shadow of her black clothing beneath the surface of the water. He slowly ventured into the pond. The bottom was deep, soft clay. He sank in, and the water clasped dead cold round his legs. As he stirred, he could smell the cold, rotten clay that fouled up into the water. It was objectionable in his lungs. Still, repelled and yet not heeding, he moved deeper into the pond. The cold water rose over his thighs, over his loins, upon his abdomen. The lower part of his body was all sunk in the hideous cold element, and the bottom was so deeply soft and uncertain he was afraid of pitching with his mouth underneath. He could not swim and was afraid. He crouched a little, spreading his hands under the water and moving them round, trying to feel for her. The dead cold pond swayed upon his chest. He moved again, a little deeper, and again with his hands underneath, he felt all around under the water, and he touched her clothing, but it evaded his fingers. He made a desperate effort to grasp it, and so doing he lost his balance and went under, horribly, suffocating in the foul earthy water, struggling madly for a few moments. At last, after what seemed an eternity, he got his footing, rose again into the air and looked round. He gasped and knew he was in the world. Then he looked at the water. She had risen near him. He grasped her clothing and, drawing her nearer, turned to take his way to land again. He went very slowly, carefully, absorbed in the slow progress. He rose higher, climbing out of the pond. The water was now only about his legs. He was thankful, full of relief to be out of the clutches of the pond. He lifted her and staggered on to the bank, out of the horror of wet grey clay. He laid her down on the bank. She was quite unconscious and running with water. He made the water come from her mouth. He worked to restore her. He did not have to work very long before he could feel the breathing begin again in her, and she was breathing naturally. He worked a little longer. He could feel her live beneath his hands. She was coming back. He wiped her face, wrapped her in his overcoat, looked round into the dim, dark grey world, and lifted her and staggered down the bank and across the fields. It seemed an unthinkably long way, and his burden so heavy he felt he would never get to the house. But at last he was in the stable yard and then in the house yard. He opened the door and went into the house. In the kitchen he laid her down on the hearth rug and called. The house was empty. But the fire was burning in the grate. Then again he kneeled to attend to her. She was breathing regularly. Her eyes were wide open as if conscious. But there seemed something missing in her look. She was conscious in herself but unconscious of her surroundings. He ran upstairs, took blankets from her bed and put them before the fire to warm. Then he removed her saturated, earthy-smelling clothing, rubbed her dry with a towel and wrapped her naked in the blankets. Then he went into the dining room to look for spirits. There was a little whiskey. He drank a gulp himself and put some into her mouth. The effect was instantaneous. She looked full into his face as if she had been seeing him for some time, and yet had only just become conscious of him. Dr. Ferguson, she said. What? he answered. He was divesting himself of his coat, intending to find some dry clothing upstairs. He could not bear the smell of the dead, clayey water, and was mortally afraid for his own health. What did I do? she asked. Walked into the pond, he replied. He had begun to shudder like one sick, and could hardly attend to her. Her eyes remained full on him. He seemed to be going dark in his mind, looking back at her helplessly. The shuddering became quieter in him. His life came back in him, dark and unknowing, but strong again. Was I out of my mind, she asked, while her eyes were fixed on him all the time. Maybe for the moment, he replied. He felt quiet because his strength had come back. The strange, fretful strain had left him. 
"'Am I out of my mind now?' she asked. "'Are you?' he reflected a moment. "'No,' he answered truthfully. "'I don't see that you are.' He turned his face aside. He was afraid now because he felt dazed and felt dimly that her power was stronger than his in this issue. And she continued to look at him fixedly all the time. "'Can you tell me where I shall find some dry things to put on?' he asked. "'Did you dive into the pond for me?' she asked. "'No,' he answered. "'I walked in, but I went in overhead as well.' There was silence for a moment. He hesitated. He very much wanted to go upstairs to get into dry clothing, but there was another desire in him, and she seemed to hold him. His will seemed to have gone to sleep and left him standing there slack before her. But he felt warm inside himself. He did not shudder at all, though his clothes were sodden on him. "'Why did you?' she asked. "'Because I didn't want you to do such a foolish thing,' he said. "'It wasn't foolish,' she said, still gazing at him as she lay on the floor with a sofa cushion under her head. "'It was the right thing to do. I knew best, then.' "'I'll go and shift these wet things,' he said but still he had not the power to move out of her presence until she sent him. It was as if she had the life of his body in her hands, and he could not extricate himself. Or perhaps she did not want to. Suddenly she sat up. Then she became aware of her own immediate condition. She felt the blankets about her. She knew her limbs. For a moment it seemed as if her reason were going. She looked round with wild eye, as if seeking something. He stood still with fear. She saw her clothing lying scattered. "'Who undressed me?' she asked, her eyes resting full and inevitable on his face. "'I did,' he replied, to bring you round. For some moments she sat and gazed at him awfully, her lips parted. "'Do you love me, then?' she asked. He only stood and stared at her, fascinated. His soul seemed to melt. She shuffled forward on her knees and put her arms around him, round his legs, as he stood there, pressing her breast against his knees and thighs, clutching him with strange convulsive certainty, pressing his thighs against her, drawing him to her face, her throat, as she looked up at him with flaring, humble eyes of transfiguration, triumphant in first possession. "'You love me,' she murmured, in strange transport, yearning and triumphant and confident. "'You love me. I know you love me. I know.' And she was passionately kissing his knees, through the wet clothing, passionately and indiscriminately kissing his knees, his legs, as if unaware of everything. He looked down at the tangled wet hair, the wild bare animal shoulders. He was amazed, bewildered, and afraid. He had never thought of loving her. He had never wanted to love her. When he rescued her and restored her, he was a doctor, and she was a patient. He had no single personal thought of her. Nay, this introduction of the personal element was very distasteful to him, a violation of his professional honour. It was horrible to have her there embracing his knees. It was horrible. He revolted from it violently. And yet, and yet, he had not the power to break away. She looked at him again with the same supplication of powerful love and that same transcendent, frightening light of triumph. In view of the delicate flame which seemed to come from her face like a light, he was powerless and yet he had never intended to love her. He had never intended, and something stubborn in him could not give way. "'You love me,' she repeated, in a murmur of deep, rhapsodic assurance. "'You love me.' Her hands were drawing him, drawing him down to her. He was afraid, even a little horrified, for he had, really, no intention of loving her. Yet her hands were drawing him towards her, he put out his hand quickly to steady himself and grasped her bare shoulder. A flame seemed to burn the hand that grasped her soft shoulder. He had no intention of loving her. His whole will was against his yielding. It was horrible, 
and yet wonderful was the touch of her shoulders, beautiful the shining of her face. Was she perhaps mad? He had a horror of yielding to her, yet something in him ached also. He had been staring away at the door, away from her, but his hand remained on her shoulder. She had gone suddenly very still. He looked down at her. Her eyes were now wide with fear, with doubt. The light was dying from her face. A shadow of terrible greyness was returning. He could not bear the touch of her eyes question upon him and the look of death behind the question. With an inward groan he gave way and let his heart yield towards her. A sudden gentle smile came on his face and her eyes, which never left his face, slowly, slowly filled with tears. He watched the strange water rise in her eyes, like some slow fountain coming up, and his heart seemed to burn and melt away in his breast. He could not bear to look at her any more. He dropped to his knees and caught her head with his arms and pressed her face against his throat. She was very still. His heart, which seemed to have broken, was burning with a kind of agony in his breast, and he felt her slow hot tears wetting his throat, but he could not move. He felt the hot tears wet his neck and the hollows of his neck, and he remained motionless, suspended through one of man's eternities. Only now it had become indispensable to him to have her face pressed close to him. He could never let her go again. He could never let her head go away from the close clutch of his arm. He wanted to remain like that forever, with his heart hurting him in a pain that was also life to him. Without knowing, he was looking down on her damp, soft brown hair. Then, as it were, suddenly, he smelt the horrid stagnant smell of that water, and at that same moment she drew away from him and looked at him. Her eyes were wistful and unfathomable, he was afraid of them, and he fell to kissing her, not knowing what he was doing. He wanted her eyes not to have that terrible, wistful, unfathomable look. When she turned her face to him again, a faint, delicate flush was glowing, and there was again dawning that terrible shining of joy in her eyes, which really terrified him, and yet which he now wanted to see, because he feared the look of doubt still more. "'You love me?' she said, rather faltering. "'Yes, the word cost him a painful effort, "'not because it wasn't true, "'but because it was too newly true. "'The saying seemed to tear open again his newly torn heart, "'and he hardly wanted it to be true even now. "'She lifted her face to him, "'and he bent forward and kissed her on the mouth, "'gently, with the one kiss that is an eternal pledge.' and as he kissed her his heart strained again in his breast. He never intended to love her, but now it was over. He had crossed over the gulf to her, and all that he had left behind had shriveled and become void. After the kiss her eyes again slowly filled with tears. She sat still, away from him, with her face drooped aside and her hands folded in her lap. The tears fell very slowly. There was complete silence. He too sat there motionless and silent on the hearthrug. The strange pain of his heart that was broken seemed to consume him. That he should love her, that this was love, that he should be ripped open in this way, him, a doctor. How they would all jeer if they knew. It was agony to him to think they might know. In the curious naked pain of the thought he looked again to her. She was sitting there drooped into a muse. He saw a tear fall and his heart flared hot. He saw for the first time that one of her shoulders was quite uncovered, one arm bare. He could see one of her small breasts dimly because it had become almost dark in the room. Why are you crying? he asked in an altered voice. She looked up at him, and behind her tears the consciousness of her situation for the first time brought a dark look of shame to her eyes. "'I'm not crying, really,' she said, watching him half-frightened. He reached his hand and softly closed it on her bare arm. "'I love you, I love you,' he said in a soft, low-vibrating voice, unlike himself. She shrank and dropped her head, 
The soft, penetrating grip of his hand on her arm distressed her. She looked up at him. I want to go, she said. I want to go and get you some dry things. Why, he said, I'm all right. But I want to go, she said, and I want you to change your things. He released her arm and she wrapped herself in the blanket, looking at him rather frightened, and still she did not rise. Kiss me, she said wistfully. He kissed her, but briefly, half in anger. Then after a second she rose nervously, all mixed up in the blanket. He watched her in her confusion as she tried to extricate herself and wrap herself up so that she could walk. He watched her relentlessly as she knew, and as she went, the blanket trailing, and as he saw a glimpse of her feet and a white leg, he tried to remember her as she was when he wrapped her in the blanket. But then he didn't want to remember, because she had been nothing to him then, and his nature revolted from remembering her as she was when she was nothing to him. A tumbling, muffled noise from within the dark house startled him. Then he heard her voice. There are clothes. He rose and went to the foot of the stairs and gathered up the garments she had thrown down. Then he came back to the fire to rub himself down and dress. He grunted his own appearance when he had finished. The fire was sinking, so he put on coal. The house was now quite dark, save for the light of the street lamp that shone in faintly from beyond the holly trees. He lit the gas with matches he found on the mantelpiece. Then he emptied the pockets of his own clothes and threw all his wet things in a heap into the scullery, after which he gathered up her sodden clothes gently and put them in a separate heap on the copper top in the scullery. It was six o'clock on the clock. His own watch had stopped. He ought to go back to the surgery. He waited, and still she did not come down. So he went to the foot of the stairs and called. I shall have to go. Almost immediately he heard her coming down. She had on her best dress of black voile, and her hair was tidy but still damp. She looked at him, and in spite of herself, smiled. I don't like you in those clothes, she said. Do I look a sight? he answered. They were shy of one another. I'll make you some tea, she said. No, I must go. Must you? And she looked at him again with the wide, strained, doubtful eyes. And again from the pain of his breast, he knew how he loved her. He went and bent to kiss her, gently, passionately, with his heart's painful kiss. "'And my hair smells so horrible,' she murmured in distraction. "'And I'm so awful, I'm so awful. "'Oh, no, I'm too awful.' "'And she broke into bitter, heartbroken sobbing. "'You can't want to love me. I'm horrible.' "'Don't be silly, don't be silly,' he said, "'trying to comfort her, kissing her, holding her in his arms. "'I want you. I want to marry you. "'We're going to be married. Quickly, quickly.' Tomorrow, if I can. But she only sobbed terribly and cried, I feel awful, I feel awful, I feel I'm horrible to you. No, I want you, I want you, was all he answered, blindly, with that terrible intonation which frightened her almost more than her horror lest he should not want her. End of The Horse Dealer's Daughter by D. H. Lawrence Recording by Peter Tomlinson Innocence from Droll Stories Collected from the Abbeys of Turin by Henri de Balzac This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Dale Grothman Innocence by Henri de Balzac By the double crest of my fowl and by the rose lining my sweetheart's slipper, by all the horns of well-beloved cuckolds, and by the virtue of their blessed wives, the finest work of man is neither poetry, nor painted pictures, nor music, nor castles, nor statues, be they carved never so well, nor rowing, nor sailing galleys, but children. Understand me, children up to the age of ten years, 
for after that they become men or women and cutting their wisdom teeth are not worth what they cost the worst are the best watch them play prettily and innocently with slippers above all cancellated ones with the household utensils leaving that which displeases them crying after that which pleases them munching the sweets and confectionaries in the house nibbling at the stores and always laughing as soon as their teeth are cut and you will agree with me that they are in every way lovable besides which they are flower and fruit the fruit of love and the flower of life before their minds have been unsettled by the disturbances of life there is nothing in this world more blessed or more pleasant than their sayings which are naive beyond description this is as true as the double chewing machine of a cow do not expect a man to be innocent after the manner of children because there is an i know not what ingredient of reason in the naivete of man while the naivete of children is candid immaculate and has all the finesse of the mother which is plainly proven in this tale queen catherine was at the time dauphine and to make herself welcome to the king her father-in-law who at the time was very ill indeed presented him from time to time with italian pictures knowing that he liked them much being a friend of signor raphael de urban of the signors primitas and of leonardo da vinci to whom he sent large sums of money she obtained from her family who had the pick of these works because at the time the duke of the medicis governed tuscany a precious picture painted by a venetian named titian artist to the emperor charles and in very high favor in which were the portraits of adam and eve at the moment when god left them to wander about the terrestrial paradise and were painted their full height in the costume of the period in which it is difficult to make a mistake because they were attired in their ignorance and caparisoned with a divine grace which enveloped them a difficult thing to execute on account of the color but one in which the said seratitian excelled the picture was put into the room of the poor king who was then ill with a disease of which he eventually died it had a great success at the court of france where everyone wished to see it but no one was able to until after the king's death since at his desire it was allowed to remain in his room as long as he lived one day madame catherine took with her to the king's room her son francis and little margot and they began to talk at random as children will now here now there these children had heard this picture of adam and eve spoken about and had tormented their mother to take them there since the two little ones at times amused the old king madame the dauphine consented to their request you wish to see adam and eve who were our first parents there they are she said then she left them in great astonishment before titian's picture and seated herself by the bedside of the king who was delighted to watch the children which of the two is adam said francis nudging his sister margot's elbow you silly replied she to know that they would have to be dressed this reply which delighted the poor king and the mother was mentioned in a letter written in florence to queen catherine no writer having brought it to light it will remain like a sweet flower in a corner of these tales although it is no way droll and there is no other moral to be drawn from it except that to hear these pretty speeches of infancy one must beget the children the end of innocence by henri de balzac in the graveyard by anton chekhov translated by constance garnett this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman In the Graveyard by Anton Chekhov The wind has got up, friends, and it is beginning to get dark. 
Hadn't we better take ourselves off before it gets worse? The wind was frolicking among the yellow leaves of the old birch trees, and a shower of thick drops fell upon us from the leaves. One of our party slipped on the clayey soil, and clutched at a big gray cross to save himself from falling. Igor Grenegov, titular counselor and cavalier, he read. I knew that gentleman. He was fond of his wife. He wore a Stanislav ribbon and read nothing. His digestion worked well. Life was all right, wasn't it? One would have thought he had no reason to die. But alas, fate had its eye on him. The poor fellow fell a victim of his habits of observation. On one occasion, when he was listening at a keyhole, he got such a bang on the head from the door that he sustained concussion of the brain. He had a brain and died and here under this tombstone lies a man who from his cradle detested verses and epigrams as if to mock him his whole tombstone is adorned with verses there is someone coming a man in a shabby coat with a shaven bluish crimson countenance overtook us he had a bottle under his arm and a parcel of sausage was sticking out of his pocket where is the grave of mushkin the actor he asked us in a husky voice. We conducted him towards the grave of Mushkin, the actor, who had died two years before. You are a government clerk, I suppose, we asked him. No, an actor. Nowadays it is difficult to distinguish actors from clerks of the consistory. No doubt you have noticed that. That's typical, but it's not very flattering to the government clerk. It was with difficulty that we found the actor's grave. It had sunken, was overgrown with weeds, and had lost all appearance of a grave. A cheap little cross that had begun to rot, and was covered with green moss blackened by the frost, had an air of aged dejection, and looked as if it were ailing. Forgotten friend Mishkin, we read. Time had erased the never, and corrected the falsehood of man. A subscription to the monument to him was gotten up by actors and journalists, but they drank up the money, the dear fellows, sighed the actor, bowing down to the ground and touching the wet earth with his knees and his cap. How do you mean, drank it? That's very simple. They collected the money, published a paragraph about it in the newspaper, and spent it on drink. I don't say it to blame them. I hope it did them good, dear things. Good health to them and eternal memory to him drinking means bad health and eternal memory nothing but sadness god give us remembrance for a time but eternal memory what next you are right there mishkin was a well-known man you see there were a dozen wreaths on the coffin and he is already forgotten those to whom he was dear have forgotten him but those to whom he did harm remember him i for instance shall never forget him for i got nothing but harm from him i have no love for the deceased what harm did he do you great harm sighed the actor and an expression of bitter resentment overspread his face to me he was a villain and a scoundrel the kingdom of heaven be his it was through looking at him and listening to him that i became an actor by his art he lured me from the parental home he enticed me with the excitements of an actor's life promised me all sorts of things and brought tears and sorrow an actor's life is a bitter one i have lost youth sobriety and divine semblance i haven't a halfpenny to bless myself with my shoes are down at the heel my breeches are frayed and patched and my face looks as if it has been gnawed by dogs my head is full of free-thinking and nonsense he robbed me of my faith my evil genius it would have been something if i had had talent but as it is i am ruined for nothing it's cold honored friends won't you have some there's enough for all Brr. let us drink to the rest of his soul though i don't like him and though he's dead he is the only one i had in the world the only one it is the last time i shall visit him the doctors say I shall soon die of drink. So here I have come to say goodbye. 
one must forgive one's enemies we left the actor to converse with the dead mishkin and went on it began drizzling a fine cold rain at the turning into the principal avenue strewn with gravel we met a funeral procession four bearers wearing white calico sashes and muddy high boots with leaves stuck on them carrying a brown coffin it was getting dark and they hastened stumbling and shaking their burden we've only been walking here a couple of hours and that is the third brought in already shall we go home friends the end of in the graveyard by anton chekhov the king or the cats from more english fairy tales collected and edited by joseph jacobs this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by dale grothman the king of the cats edited by joseph jacobs one winter's evening the sexton's wife was sitting by the fireside with her big black cat old tom on the other side both half asleep and waiting for the master to come home they waited and they waited but still he didn't come until at last he came rushing in calling out who's tommy tildrum in such a wild way that both his wife and his cat stared at him to know what was the matter why what's the matter said his wife and why do you want to know who tommy tildrum is oh i had such an adventure i was digging away at old mr fordyce's grave when i suppose i must have dropped asleep and only woke up by hearing a cat's meow meow said old tom in answer yes just like that so i looked over the edge of the grave and what do you think i saw now how can i tell said the sexton's wife why nine black cats all like our friend tom here all with a white spot on their chestises and what do you think they were carrying why a small coffin covered with a black velvet pall and on the pall was a small coronet all of gold and at every third step they took they cried all together meow meow said old tom again yes just like that said the sexton and as they came nearer and nearer to me i could see them more distinctly because their eyes shone out with a sort of green light well they all came towards me eight of them carrying the coffin and the biggest cat of all walking in front for all the world like but look at our tom how he's looking at me you'd think he knew all that i was saying go on go on said the wife never mind old tom well as i was a saying they came towards me slowly and solemnly and every third step crying all together meow meow said old tom again yes just like that till they came and stood right opposite mr fordyce's grave where i was when they all stood still and looked straight at me i did feel queer that i did but look at old tom he's looking at me just like they did go on go on said his wife never mind old tom where was i oh they all stood still looking at me then the one that wasn't carrying the coffin came forward and staring straight at me said to me yes i tell you said to me with a squeaky voice tell tom tildrum that tim toldrum's dead and that's why i had to ask you if you knew who tom tildrum was for how can i tell tom tildrum tim toldrum's dead if i don't know who tom tildrum is look at old tom screamed his wife and well he might look for tom was swelling and tom was staring and at last tom shrieked out what old tim dead then i'm king of the cats and rushed up the chimney and was never more seen the end of the king of cats
The Last Lesson by Alphonse Daudet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The Last Lesson by Alphonse Daudet. I started for school very late that morning and was in great dread of a scolding especially because m hamel had said that he would question us on participles and i did not know the first word about them for a moment i thought of running away and spending the day out of doors it was so warm so bright the birds were chirping at the edge of the woods and in the open field back of the sawmill the prussian soldiers were drilling it was all much more tempting than the rule of participles but i had the strength to resist and hurried off to school when i passed the town hall there was a crowd in front of the bulletin board for the last two years all our bad news had come from there the lost battles the draft the orders of the commanding officer and i thought to myself without stopping what can be the matter now then as i hurried by as fast as i could go the blacksmith Wachner, who was there with his apprentice reading the bulletin called after me don't go so fast bub you'll get to your school in plenty of time i thought he was making fun of me and reached mr hamel's little garden all out of breath usually when school began there was a great bustle which could be heard out in the street the opening and closing of desks lessons repeated in unison very loud with our hands over our ears to understand better and the teacher's great ruler rapping on the table but now it was all so still i had counted on the commotion to get to my desk without being seen but of course that day everything had to be as quiet as sunday morning through the window i saw my classmates already in their places and mr hamel walking up and down with his terrible iron ruler over his arm i had to open the door and go in before everybody you can imagine how I blushed and how frightened I was. But nothing happened. Mr. Hamel saw me and said very kindly, Go to your place quickly, little Franz. We were beginning without you. I jumped over the bench and sat down at my desk. Not until then, when I had got a little over my fright, did I see that our teacher had on his beautiful green coat, his frilled shirt, and the little black silk cap all embroidered that he never wore except on inspection and prize days besides the whole school seemed so strange and solemn but the thing that surprised me most was to see on the back benches that were always empty the village people sitting quietly like ourselves old hauser with his three-quartered hat the former mayor the former postmaster and several others besides Everybody looked sad, and Hauser had brought an old primer, thumbed at the edges, and he held it open on his knees, with his great spectacles lying across the pages. While I was wondering about it all, M. Hamel mounted his chair and, in the same grave and gentle tone which he had used with me, said, My children, this is the last lesson I shall give you. The order has come from Berlin to teach only German in the schools of alsace and lorraine the new master comes tomorrow this is your last french lesson i want you to be very attentive what a thunderclap these words were to me oh the wretches that is what they had put up at the town hall my last french lesson why i hardly knew how to write i should never learn any more i must stop there then Oh, how sorry I was for not learning my lessons, for seeking birds' eggs or going sliding on the sar. My books, which had seemed such a nuisance a while ago, so heavy to carry, my grammar and my history of the saints, were all old friends now, and I couldn't give them up. And Monsieur Hamel, too, the idea that he was going away, that I should never see him again, made me forget all about his ruler and how cranky he was poor man it was in honor of this last lesson that he had put on his fine sunday clothes 
and now I understood why the old men of the village were sitting there in the back of the room. It was because they were sorry, too, that they had not gone to school more. It was their way of thanking our master for his forty years of faithful service, and of showing their respect for the country that was theirs no more. While I was thinking of all this, I heard my name called. It was my turn to recite. What would I not have given to be able to say that dreadful rule for the participle all through, very loud and clear, and without one mistake? But I got mixed up on the first words, and stood there, holding on to my desk, my heart beating, and not daring to look up. I heard Monsieur Hamel say to me, I won't scold you, little Franz. You must feel bad enough. See how it is? Every day we have to say to ourselves, Bah, I've plenty of time. I'll learn it tomorrow. And now you see where we've come out. Ah, that's the great trouble with Alsace. She puts off learning until tomorrow. Now those fellows out there will have the right to say to you, How is it you pretend to be Frenchmen? and yet you can neither speak nor write your own language. But you are not the worst, poor little Franz. We've all a great deal to reproach ourselves with. Your parents were not anxious enough to have you learn. They preferred to put you to work on a farm or at the mills, so as to have a little more money. And I? I have been to blame also. Have I not often sent you to water my flowers instead of learning your lessons? And when I wanted to go fishing, did I not just give you a holiday? Then, from one thing to another, Monsieur Hamel went on to talk of the French language, saying that it was the most beautiful language in the world, the clearest, the most logical, that we must guard it amongst us, and never forget it, because when a people are enslaved, as long as they hold fast to their language, it is as if they had the key to their prison. Then he opened a grammar and read us our lesson. I was amazed to see how well I understood it. All he said seemed so easy, so easy. I think, too, that I had never listened so carefully, and that he had never explained everything with so much patience. It seemed almost as if the poor man wanted to give us all he knew before going away, and to put it all into our heads in one stroke. After the grammar, we had a lesson in writing. That day M. Hamel had two new copies for us, written in a beautiful round hand. France, Alsace, France, Alsace. They looked like little flags floating everywhere in the schoolroom, hung from a rod at the top of our desks. You ought to have seen how everyone set to work, and how quiet it was. The only sound was the scratching of the pens over the paper. Once some beetles flew in, but nobody paid any attention to them, not even the littlest one, who worked right on tracing their fish hooks, as if that was French too. On the roof the pigeons cooed very low, and I thought to myself, Will they make them sing in German, even the pigeons? Whenever I looked up from my writing, I saw Monsieur Hamel sitting motionless in his chair, and gazing, first at one thing, then at another, as if he wanted to fix in his mind just how everything looked in that little schoolroom. Fancy! For forty years he had been there, in the same place, with his garden outside the window, and his class in front of him. Just like that. Only the desks and benches had been worn smooth. The walnut trees in the garden were taller, and the hop vine, which he had planted himself, twined about the window to the roof. How it must have broken his heart to leave it all, poor man, to hear his sister moving about in the room above, packing their trunks, for they must leave the country next day. But he had the courage to hear every lesson to the last. After the writing we had a lesson in history and then the babies chanted their ba be bi bo boo down there at the back of the room old hauser had put on his spectacles and holding his primer in both hands spelled the letters with them you could see that he too was crying his voice trembled with emotion and it was so funny to hear him that we all wanted to laugh 
and cry. Ah, how well I remember it, that last lesson. All at once the church clock struck twelve, then the Angelus. At the same moment the trumpets of the Prussians, returning from drill, sounded under our windows. Monsieur Hamel stood up, very pale, in his chair. I never saw him look so tall. My friends, he said, I, I, but something choked him. He could not go on. Then he turned to the blackboard, took a piece of chalk, and bearing on it with all his might, he wrote as large as he could, Viva la France! Then he stopped, leaned his head against the wall, and, without a word, he made a gesture to us with his hand. School is dismissed. You may go. The End of The Last Lesson by Alphonse Dudet The Lost Stanjak by Saki, H. H. Monroe, eighteen seventy to nineteen sixteen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. The prison chaplain entered the condemned cell for the last time, to give such consolation as he might. The only consolation I crave for, said the condemned, is to tell my story in its entirety to someone who will at least give it a respectful hearing. We must not be too long over it, said the chaplain, looking at his watch. The condemned man repressed a shiver and commenced. Most people will be of the opinion that I am paying the penalty of my own violent deeds. In reality, I am a victim to a lack of specialization in my education and character. Lack of specialization, said the chaplain. Yes, if I had been known as one of the few men in England familiar with the fauna of the Outer Hebrides, or able to repeat stanzas of Camoen's poetry in the original, I should have had no difficulty in proving my identity in the crisis when my identity became a matter of life and death for me. But my education was merely a moderately good one, and my temperament was one of the general order that avoids specialization. I know a little, in a general way, about gardening and history and old masters, but I could never tell you offhand whether Stella van der Lupen was a chrysanthemum or a heroine of the American War of Independence, or something by Romney in the Louvre. The chaplain shifted uneasily in his seat. Now that the alternatives had been suggested, they all seemed dreadfully possible. I fell in love, or thought I did, with the local doctor's wife, continued the condemned. Why I should have done so, I cannot say, for I do not remember that she possessed any particular attractions of mind or body. On looking back at past events, it seems to me that she must have been distinctly ordinary, but I suppose the doctor had fallen in love with her once, and what man had done, man can do. She appeared to be pleased with the attentions which I paid her, and to that extent I suppose I might say she encouraged me, but I think she was honestly unaware that I meant anything more than a little neighbourly interest. When one is face to face with death, one wishes to be just. The chaplain murmured approval. At any rate, she was genuinely horrified when I took advantage of the doctor's absence one evening to declare what I believed to be my passion. She begged me to pass out of her life, and I could scarcely do otherwise than agree, though I hadn't the dimmest idea of how it was to be done. In novels and plays I knew it was a regular occurrence, and if you mistook a lady's sentiments or intentions, you went off to India and did things on the frontier as a matter of course. As I stumbled along the doctor's carriage drive, I had no very clear idea as to what my line of action was to be, but I had a vague feeling that I must look at the Times Atlas before going to bed. Then, on the dark and lonely highway, I came suddenly on a dead body. 
The chaplain's interest in the story visibly quickened. Some shocking accident seemed to have struck him down, and the head was crushed and battered out of all human semblance. Probably, I thought, a motor-car fatality. And then, with a sudden overmastering insistence, came another thought, that there was a remarkable opportunity for losing my identity and passing out of the life of the doctor's wife for ever. No tiresome and risky voyage to distant lands, but a mere exchange of clothes and identity with the unknown victim of an unwitnessed accident. With considerable difficulty I undressed the corpse and clothed it anew in my own garments. Anyone who has valeted a dead Salvation Army captain in an uncertain light will appreciate the difficulty. With the idea, presumably, of inducing the doctor's wife to leave her husband's roof tree for some habitation which would be run at my expense, I crammed my pockets with a store of banknotes, which represented a good deal of my immediate worldly wealth. When, therefore, I stole away into the world in the guise of a nameless salvationist, I was not without resources which would easily support so humble a role for a considerable period. I tramped to a neighbouring market town, and, late as the hour was, the production of a few shillings procured me supper and a night's lodging in a cheap coffee-house. The next day I started forth on an aimless course of wandering from one small town to another. I was already somewhat disgusted with the upshot of my sudden freak. In a few hours' time I was considerably more so. In the contents bill of a local news sheet, I read the announcement of my own murder at the hands of some person unknown. On buying a copy of the paper for a detailed account of the tragedy, which at first had aroused in me a certain grim amusement, I found the deed ascribed to a wandering salvationist of doubtful antecedents, who had been seen lurking in the roadway near the scene of the crime. I was no longer amused. The matter promised to be embarrassing. What I had mistaken for a motor-car accident was evidently a case of savage assault and murder, and, until the real culprit was found, I should have much difficulty in explaining my intrusion into the affair. Of course, I could establish my own identity, but how, without disagreeably involving the doctor's wife, could I give any adequate reason for changing clothes with the murdered man? While my brain worked feverishly at this problem, I subconsciously obeyed a secondary instinct to get as far away as possible from the scene of the crime and get rid at all costs of my incriminating uniform. There I found a difficulty. I tried two or three obscure clothes shops, but my entrance invariably aroused an attitude of hostile suspicion in the proprietors, and on one excuse or another they avoided serving me with the now ardently desired change of clothing. The uniform that I had so thoughtlessly donned seemed as difficult to get out of as the fatal shirt of, you know, I forget the creature's name. Yes, yes, said the chaplain hurriedly, go on with your story. Somehow, until I could get out of those compromising garments, I felt it would not be safe to surrender myself to the police. The thing that puzzled me was why no attempt was made to arrest me, since there was no question as to the suspicion which followed me, like an inseparable shadow, wherever I went. Stares, nudgings, whisperings, and even loud-spoken remarks of, "'That's him!' greeted my every appearance, and the meanest and most deserted eating-house that I patronised soon became filled with a crowd of furtively watching customers." I began to sympathise with the feeling of royal personages trying to do a little private shopping under the unsparing scrutiny of an irrepressible public, and still with all this inarticulate shadowing which weighed on my nerves almost worse than open hostility would have done, no attempt was made to interfere with my liberty. Later on I discovered the reason. At the time of the murder on the lonely highway, a series of important bloodhound trials had been taking place in the near neighbourhood, and some dozen and a half couples of trained animals had been put on the track of the supposed murderer, on my track. One of the most public-spirited London dailies had offered a princely prize to the owner of the pair that should first track me down and betting on the chances of the respective competitors became rife throughout the land. 
The dogs ranged far and wide over about thirteen counties, and though my own movements had become by this time perfectly well known to police and public alike, the sporting instincts of the nation stepped in to prevent my premature arrest. Give the dogs a chance, was the prevailing sentiment. Whenever some ambitious local constable wished to put an end to my drawn-out evasion of justice, my final capture by the winning pair was not a very dramatic episode. In fact, I'm not sure that they would have taken any notice of me if I hadn't spoken to them and patted them, but the event gave rise to an extraordinary amount of partisan excitement. The owner of the pair who were next nearest up at the finish was an American, and he lodged a protest on the ground that an otter hound had married into the family of the winning pair six generations ago, and that the prize had been offered to the first pair of bloodhounds to capture the murderer, and that a dog that had one sixty-fourth part of otterhound blood in it couldn't technically be considered a bloodhound. I forget how the matter was ultimately settled, but it aroused a tremendous amount of acrimonious discussion on both sides of the Atlantic. My own contribution to the controversy consisted in pointing out that the whole dispute was beside the mark, as the actual murderer had not yet been captured, but I soon discovered that on this point there was not the least divergence of public or expert opinion. I had looked forward apprehensively to the proving of my identity and the establishment of my motives as a disagreeable necessity. I speedily found out that the most disagreeable part of the business was that it couldn't be done. When I saw in the glass the haggard and hunted expression which the experiences of the past few weeks had stamped on my erstwhile placid countenance, I could scarcely feel surprised that the few friends and relations I possessed refused to recognise me in my altered guise, but persisted in their obstinate but widely shared belief that it was I who had been done to death on the highway. To make matters worse, infinitely worse, an aunt of the really murdered man, an appalling female of an obviously low order of intelligence, identified me as her nephew and gave the authorities a lurid account of my depraved youth and of her laudable but unavailing efforts to spank me into a better way. I believe it was even proposed to search me for fingerprints. But, said the chaplain, surely your educational attainments... That was just the crucial point, said the condemned. That was where my lack of specialization told so fatally against me. The dead salvationist, whose identity I had so lightly and so disastrously adopted, had possessed a veneer of cheap modern education. It should have been easy to demonstrate that my learning was on altogether another plane to his, but in my nervousness I bungled miserably over test after test that was put to me. The little French I'd ever known deserted me. I could not render a simple phrase about the gooseberry of the gardener into that language, because I'd forgotten the French for gooseberry. The chaplain again wriggled uneasily in his seat, and then, resumed the condemned, came the final discomfiture. In our village we had a modest little debating club, and I remembered having promised, chiefly, I suppose, to please and impress the doctor's wife, to give a sketchy kind of lecture on the Vulcan crisis. I had relied on being able to get up my facts from one or two standard works, and the back numbers of certain periodicals. The prosecution had made a careful note of the circumstance that the man whom I claimed to be, and actually was, had posed locally as some sort of second-hand authority on Balkan affairs, and, in the midst of a string of questions on indifferent topics, the examining counsel asked me with a diabolical suddenness if I could tell the court the whereabouts of Novi Bazar. I felt the question to be a crucial one. Something told me that the answer was St. Petersburg or Baker Street, I hesitated, looked helplessly round at the sea of tensely expectant faces, pulled myself together, and chose Baker Street. And I knew then that everything was lost. The prosecution had no difficulty in demonstrating that an individual, even moderately versed in the affairs of the Near East, 
could never have so unceremoniously dislocated Novi Bazar from its accustomed corner of the map. It was an answer which the Salvation Army captain might conceivably have made, and I made it. The circumstantial evidence connecting the Salvationist with the crime was overwhelmingly convincing, and I had inextricably identified myself with the Salvationist and thus it comes to pass that in ten minutes' time I shall be hanged by the neck until I am dead in expiation of the murder of myself, which murder never took place, and of which, in any case, I am innocent. When the chaplain returned to his quarters some fifteen minutes later, the black flag was floating over the prison tower. Breakfast was waiting for him in the dining-room, but he first passed into his library, and, taking up the Times Atlas, consulted a map of the Balkan Peninsula. A thing like that, he observed, closing the volume with a snap, might happen to anyone. End of the Lost Sanjak by H. H. Munro Recording by Peter Tomlinson The Mouse by H. H. Munro, Saki, 1870-1916 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson Theodoric Vola had been brought up from infancy to the confines of middle age by a fond mother whose chief solicitude had been to keep him screened from what she called the coarser realities of life. When she died she left Theodoric alone in a world that was as real as ever, and a good deal coarser than he considered it any need to be. To a man of his temperament and upbringing, even a simple railway journey was crammed with petty annoyances and minor discords, and as he settled himself down in a second-class compartment one September morning, he was conscious of ruffled feelings and general mental discomposure. He had been staying at a country vicarage, the inmates of which had been certainly neither brutal nor bacchanalian, but their supervision of the domestic establishment had been of that lax order which invites disaster. The pony carriage that was to take him to the station had never been properly ordered, and when the moment for his departure drew near, the handyman, who should have produced the required article, was nowhere to be found. In this emergency Theodoric, to his mute but very intense disgust, found himself obliged to collaborate with the vicar's daughter in the task of harnessing the pony which necessitated groping about in an ill-lighted outhouse called a stable, and smelling very like one, except in patches where it smelt of mice. Without being actually afraid of mice, Theodoric classed them among the coarser incidents of life, and considered that Providence, with a little exercise of moral courage, might long ago have recognised that they were not indispensable, and had withdrawn them from circulation. As the train glided out of the station, Theodoric's nervous imagination accused himself of exhaling a wheat odour of stable-yard, and possibly of displaying a mouldy straw or two in his usually well-brushed garments. Fortunately, the only other occupant of the compartment, a lady of about the same age as himself, seemed inclined for slumber rather than scrutiny. The train was not due to stop till the terminus was reached in about an hour's time, and the carriage was of the old-fashioned sort that held no communication with a corridor, therefore no further travelling companions were likely to intrude on Theodoric's semi-privacy. And yet the train had scarcely attained its normal speed before he became reluctantly but vividly aware that he was not alone with the slumbering lady. He was not even alone in his own clothes. A warm, creeping movement over his flesh betrayed the unwelcome and highly resented presence, unseen but poignant, 
of a strayed mouse that had evidently dashed into its present retreat during the episode of the pony harnessing. Furtive stamps and shakes and wildly directed pinches failed to dislodge the intruder, whose motto, indeed, seemed to be excelsior, and the lawful occupant of the clothes lay back against the cushions and endeavoured rapidly to evolve some means of putting an end to the dual ownership. It was unthinkable that he should continue for the space of a whole hour in the horrible position of a Roughton house for vagrant mice. Already his imagination had at least doubled the numbers of the alien invasion. On the other hand, nothing less drastic than partial disrobing would ease him of his tormentor, and to undress in the presence of a lady, even for so laudable a purpose, was an idea that made his ear-tips tingle in a blush of abject shame. He had never been able to bring himself even to the mild exposure of open-work socks in the presence of the fair sex, and yet the lady in this case was to all appearances soundly and securely asleep. The mouse, on the other hand, seemed to be trying to crowd a vendageur into a few strenuous minutes. If there is any truth in the theory of transmigration, this particular mouse must certainly have been in a former state a member of the Alpine Club. Sometimes, in its eagerness, it lost its footing and slipped for half an inch or so, and then, in fright, or more probably temper, it bit. Theodoric was goaded into the most audacious undertaking of his life. Crimsoning to the hue of a beetroot and keeping an agonised watch on his slumbering fellow-traveller, he swiftly and noiselessly secured the ends of his railway rug to the racks on either side of the carriage, so that a substantial curtain hung athwart the compartment. In the narrow dressing-room that he had thus improvised, he proceeded with violent haste, to extricate himself partially and the mouse entirely from the surrounding casings of tweed and half-wool. As the unravelled mouse gave a wild leap to the floor, the rug, slipping its fastening at either end, also came down with a heart-curdling flop, and almost simultaneously the awakened sleeper opened her eyes. With a movement almost quicker than the mouse's, Theodoric pounced on the rug, and hauled its ample folds chin-high over his dismantled person as he collapsed into the further corner of the carriage. The blood raced and beat in the veins of his neck and forehead while he waited dumbly for the communication cord to be pulled. The lady, however, contented herself with a silent stare at her strangely muffled companion. How much had she seen? Theodore queried to himself, and in any case, what on earth must she think of his present posture? I think I have caught a chill, he ventured desperately. Really, I'm sorry, she replied. I'm just going to ask you if you would open this window. I fancy it's malaria, he added, his teeth chattering slightly, as much from fright as from a desire to support his theory. I've got some brandy in my holdall, if you'll kindly reach it down for me, said his companion. Not for worlds. I mean, I never take anything for it, he assured her earnestly. I suppose you caught it in the tropics? Theodoric, whose acquaintance with the tropics was limited to an annual present of a chest of tea from an uncle in Ceylon, felt that even the malaria was slipping from him. Would it be possible, he wondered, to disclose the real state of affairs to her in small instalments? "'Are you afraid of mice?' he ventured, growing, if possible, more scarlet in the face. "'Not unless they came in quantities, like those that et up Bishop Hatto. "'Why do you ask?' "'I had one crawling inside my clothes just now,' said Theodoric, in a voice that hardly seemed his own. "'It was a most awkward situation.' "'It must have been if you wear your clothes at all tight,' she observed. "'But mice have strange ideas of comfort.' "'I had to get rid of it while you were asleep,' he continued. "'Then, with a gulp, he added, "'It was getting rid of it that brought me to, to this.' 
"'Surely leaving off one small mouse wouldn't bring in on a chill,' she exclaimed, with a levity that Theodoric accounted abominable. Evidently she had detected something of his predicament and was enjoying his confusion. All the blood in his body seemed to have mobilised in one concentrated blush, and an agony of abasement, worse than a myriad mice, crept up and down over his soul. And then, as reflection began to assert itself, sheer terror took the place of humiliation. With every minute that passed, the train was rushing nearer to the crowded and bustling terminus, where dozens of prying eyes would be exchanged for the one paralysing pair that watched him from the further corner of the carriage. There was one slender, despairing chance, which the next few minutes must decide. His fellow traveller might relapse into a blessed slumber. But as the minutes throbbed by, that chance ebbed away. The furtive glance which Theodoric stole at her from time to time disclosed only an unwinking wakefulness. "'I think we must be getting near now,' she presently observed. Theodoric had already noted with growing terror the recurring stacks of small, ugly dwellings that heralded the journey's end. The words acted as a signal, like a hunted beast breaking cover and dashing madly towards some other haven of momentary safety, he threw aside his rug and struggled frantically into his dishevelled garments. He was conscious of dull suburban stations racing past the window, of a choking, hammering sensation in his throat and heart, and of an icy silence in that corner towards which he dared not look. Then as he sank back in his seat, clothed and almost delirious, the train slowed down to a final crawl, and the woman spoke. "'Would you be so kind,' she asked, "'as to get me a porter to put me into a cab? "'It's a shame to trouble you when you're feeling unwell, "'but being blind makes one so helpless at a railway station.'" End of the Mouse by H. H. Munro Recording by Peter Tomlinson The Packet by Tracy A. Monnier, 1877-1928 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson Mr. Baltishaw stood leaning heavily against the bar in the Duchess of Teck, talking to his friend, Mr. Ticknett. Their friendship had endured for nearly twenty-seven years, and they still called each other Mr. Baltishaw and Mr. Ticknett. They were on the surface a curiously ill-matched couple, and the other salesmen and buyers from Cotterways could never see what they had in common. Baltishaw was a big puffy man, shabbily florid. He had a fat babyish face, with large bright eyes, which always seemed to be on the verge of tears. But whether this condition of liquefaction was due to his excessive emotionalism, or to the generally liquid state of his whole body, it would be difficult to decide. He was of an excitable nature, and though his voice seemed to come wheezing through various local derangements of his system and was always pitched in a low key, it suggested a degree of excitement, usually of a querulous kind, quite remarkable in a person of his appearance. He was a man of moods too. He was not always querulous. In fact, his querulousness might generally be traced to an occasional revolt of his organic system, against the treatment to which it was normally subjected. There were times when he was genial, playful, kind, sentimental, and maudlin. His clothes had a certain pretentiousness of style and wealth, not sustained by the dilapidated condition of their linings and edges, and the many stains of alcohol, and the burns from matches and tobacco carelessly dropped. He was the manager of the linoleum department at Cotterways. Ticknett had a similar position with regard to soft goods in the same firm, 
but in appearance and character he was entirely dissimilar to Baltishaw. One of the junior salesmen one day called him the Chinese God, and there was indeed something of a little Eastern in his reserved manner, his suavity, and his great capacity for apparently minding his own business, and yet at the same time, well, nobody liked Ticknett, but they all admired his ability, and most of them feared him. He was admired because he had risen from the position of being a packer in the yard to that of great influence, and he even shared the confidence of Mr. Joseph Cottaway himself. His skin was rather yellow, and he had very heavy black eyebrows and moustache and deep-set eyes, with a slight cast. His clothes were so well cut that in the bar of the Duchess of Teck they seemed almost assertively unobtrusive. Baltishaw was a prolific talker, and Ticknett was a patient listener. This was, perhaps, one of their principal bonds of mutual understanding. They had, of course, one common interest of an absorbing nature. It bubbled and sparkled in the innumerable glasses which, at all hours of the day, Mrs. Clark and Daphne and Gladys handed to them across the bar of the Duchess of Teck, which, in those days, was always crowded with the salesmen and the staff of Cottaways. On this particular morning, Baltishaw was holding a glass in his fat fingers and breathing heavily between each sentence. He was saying, "'Experience is the thing that counts in the furnishing trade, like anywhere else. Ugh! Take any line you like. Ugh! Buying cork carpets, eating oysters, or extending the empire. Ugh! It's the man with the experience that counts. These young fellas. Ugh! Baltishaw shrugged his shoulders expressively and glanced round the bar. Immediately a change came over his expression. His eyes sparkled angrily, and he shook the dregs of whisky in his glass and drank them off with a spluttering gulp. Ticknett followed the glance of his friend and was quickly observant of the reason of Baltishaw's sudden trepidation. Percy had entered the bar. Percy was Baltishaw's assistant and also his bete noire. He was a slim young man dressed in a most extravagant manner. He had a pale face and a slightly receding chin. He wore a small bowler hat with a very narrow brim, pointed patent leather boots, a very shapely overcoat which almost suggested that he wore corsets, a pale lemon tie held together by a gold pin, and a spotted green waistcoat. Percy was a very high-spirited young person, an irrepressible, with a genius for taking stage centre. He was invariably accompanied by several friends of his own age, and he had a habit of greeting a whole bar full of men, whether he knew them or not, with a cheering cry of, Hello, 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 so here we are. He would deliver his greeting with such a gay abandon that everyone would look up and laugh. Men would nod and call out, Hello, here's Percy. How do, Percy? And even those who did not know him would be conscious of some contagious fever of geniality. The conversation would grow louder and livelier, and Percy would invariably become the centre of a laughing group. In spite of his extravagance of manner, his irresponsibility, his passion for misquoting poetry, he had been marked down by several discriminating heads of the firm as a smart boy. He was indeed a very smart boy, from his gay clothes to his sparkling repartee with Daphne and Gladys. To Daphne it was known that he was an especial favourite. He would hold her hand across the bar and smile at her engagingly and say, And how is the moon of my delight? And other enigmatic and brilliant things. And Daphne would look at him with her sleepy, passionate eyes and say, Oh, go on, you are a one. She was a silent little thing, incredibly ignorant. She was not pretty, but she had masses of gold-brown hair and a figure rather overdeveloped. 
There was about her something extremely attractive to the men who frequented the Duchess of Teck, a kind of brooding motherliness. She had an appealing way of sighing, and her eyes were always watchful, as though in the face of every stranger she might discover the solution of her troubles. Baltishaw hated Percy for several reasons. One was essentially a question of personality. He hated his aggressive exuberance, his youthfulness, his ridiculous clothes, his way of brushing back his hair, and incidentally of scoring off Baltishaw. He hated him because he had the habit of upsetting the placid calm of the Duchess of Teck. He created a restlessness. People did not listen so well when Percy was in the room. Moreover, he hated the way he took possession of Daphne. It is difficult to know what Baltishaw's ideas were with regard to Daphne. He was himself a widower, aged fifty-six, and he lived in a small flat in Bloomsbury with his two daughters, who were both about Daphne's age. He never made love to her, but he treated her with a sort of proprietary sense of confidence. He told her all about himself. In the morning, when the bar was empty, he would expatiate on the various ailments which had assailed him overnight his sleeplessness, his indigestion, his loss of appetite, and he found her very sympathetic. They would discuss Ponk's pills exhaustively, and their effect on the system, but eventually Mr. Baltishaw would say that he thought he would try just a wee drop of scotch, and so he would start his day. It must, alas, be acknowledged that the accumulated years of his convivial mode of life were beginning to tell on Baltishaw. Oh, really, Mr. Baltishaw, it's too bad. Have you ever tried Ponk's pills? I am sorry. He was not the man he was. At his best, he was a good salesman. He knew the cork lino industry inside out. He had had endless experience, but there were days of fuddlement days when he would make grievous mistakes, forget appointments, go wrong in his calculations, and the directors were not unobservant of the deterioration of his work and of his personal appearance. There was a very big rumour that Baltishaw was to be superseded by a younger man. This rumour had reached Baltishaw himself, and he accepted it with ironic incredulity. How can anyone manage Lino without experience? he said. Nevertheless, the rumour had worried him of late, and had increased his sleeplessness. He was conscious of himself, the vast moral bulk of himself rolling down the hill. He knew he'd never be able to give up drinking. He had no intention of trying. He had been at it too long. He had managed in his time to save nearly a thousand pounds. If he were sacked, it would bring in a little bit, but not enough to live on about fifty pounds a year, but he spent quite this amount in the bar of the Duchess of Teck alone. He would have to hunt round for another job. It would be ignominious, and it might be difficult to secure at his age. This was, then, another reason for disliking Percy, for the smart boy's name had been mentioned in this very connection. And what did this soapy-headed young fool know about court carpets? What experience had he had? A paltry two years. He was, too, so insufferably familiar and insolent. He had even once had the audacity to address Baltishaw as Mr. Bulky Chops, a pseudonym that was not only greeted with roars of laughter, but had been adopted by others. On this morning, then, when Percy made his accustomed entrance with its bravura accompaniment, Hello, hello, hello! So here we all are. Mr. Baltishaw's hand trembled, and he turned his back and muttered, The young... The yellow face of Ticknet turned in the direction of Percy, but it was quite expressionless, and he made no comment. He lighted another cigarette and looked across the bar at Daphne. The girl's cheeks were dimpled with smiles. Percy was talking to her. Suddenly, Tricknet said to her in his chilling voice, I want two more scotch whiskies and a split soda. The girl looked up, and the dimples left her cheeks. She seemed almost imperceptibly to shrink within herself. She poured out the drinks and handed them to Tricknet. 
Boltishaw continued his querulous complaints about the insolence of young and ignorant men, trying to oust older and more experienced men from their hardy fought for positions. And Ticknett listened, and his dark moustache moved in a peculiar way as he said, Yes, yes, I quite agree with you, Mr. Boltishaw. It's too bad. A week later there was a sudden and dramatic turn of events in the firm of Cottaways. Much to everybody's surprise, Percy was suddenly sacked, without any reason being given, and Boltishaw was retained. In fact, Boltishaw was given another two years' contract on the same terms as before. To what extent Ticknett was responsible for this development, or what was really at the back of it all, nobody was ever quite clear. It is certain that on the day of Percy's dismissal, these two friends dined together and spent an evening of a somewhat bacchanalian character. It is known that at that time Ticknett had been conspicuously successful over some deal in tapestries with a French firm, and that he had lunched one day alone with Mr. Joseph Cottaway. It is doubtful even whether he ever gave the precise details of his machinations to Boltershaw himself. The result certainly had the appearance of quickening their friendship. They called each other dear old fellow, and there were many whispered implications about insolent young swine. The career of Percy was watched with interest. Of course, he took his dismissal with a laugh and entertained a party of his friends to a hilarious farewell supper. But it happened that that summer was a peculiar stagnant one in the furnishing world. The brilliant youth did not find it so easy to secure another situation. He was observed at first swinging about the West End in his splendidly nonchalant manner, and he still frequented the bar of the Duchess of Teck, but gradually these appearances became more rare. As the months went by, he began to lose a little of his self-assurance and swagger, and it is even to be regretted that his gay clothes began to show evidences of wear. He once secured a situation at a small firm in Bayswater, but at the end of three weeks he was again dismissed, the proprietor going bankrupt, owing to some unfortunate speculation. It would be idle to imagine what Percy's career would have been had not the war broken out in August, when he was still out of employment. He volunteered for service the morning after the war was declared, and then indeed there was a great scene of bilbilous enthusiasm in the Duchess of Teck. He was toasted and treated, and everyone was crying out, Well, good luck, Percy, old man and Percy was in the highest spirits and borrowed money from everyone to stand treat to everyone else. And Daphne cried quite openly, and in the corner of the bar, Boltishaw was whispering to Ticknett, This'll knock the starch out of the young swine. And Ticknett replied, He'll get killed. There was at times a certain curious finality about Ticknett's statements that had a way of making people shudder. Boltishaw laughed uncomfortably and repeated, It'll knock the starch out of him. The departure of Percy was soon almost forgotten in the bewilderment of drama that began to convulse Europe. Others went also. There was upheaval and something of a panic in the furnishing world. Every man had his own interest to consider, and there was the big story unfolding day by day to absorb all spare attention. Perhaps the only man among all the devotees of the Duchess of Teck who thought considerably about Percy was Boltishaw. It was very annoying, but he could not dismiss the young man from his thoughts. When the autumn came on and the cold November rains washed the London streets, Boltishaw would suddenly think of Percy and he would shiver. Percy had been sent to some camp in Essex for his training, and often in the night Boltershaw would wake up and visualise Percy sleeping out in the open, getting wet through to the skin, possibly getting rheumatic fever. He was a ridiculously delicate-looking young man, quite unfitted to be a soldier. 
It occurred to Boltishaw more than once that if he and Ticknett hadn't, if Percy had secured his position, which everybody said was his due, he wouldn't have been sent out into all this. And all this was a terrible thing to Boltishaw. During the fifty-six years of his life, he had made a god of comfort. He loved warmth, good cheer, food, drink, security. The alternative seemed to him hell. He could not believe that there could be any sort of compensation in discomfort and hardship, in restraint and discipline and self-abnegation. It was a thing he could not understand. And then at the end was the awful thing itself. He could not bear to dwell on that. He drank more prodigiously than ever. The firm of Cotterways was reorganised, and Boltishaw would have undoubtedly have had the sack if it had not been for his two years' contract. As it was, expenses in every respect were cut down, and Boltishaw's royalties only amounted to a very small sum. He lived above his salary and broke into his capital. He seemed more and more to rely on Ticknet. The manager of soft goods seemed to him the one stable thing in a shifting world. When Percy one day made his sudden meteoric and final appearance in the Duchess of Teck, the whole thing seemed like a dream. The usual crowd was gathered just before lunch, drinking gins and bitters and whiskey and beer, and talking about our navy and our army and our government and what we should do to the Germans. When the level of hum of conversation was broken by a loud and breezy, Hello, 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 so here we all are. And lo, and behold, there was Percy, looking somehow bigger than usual, the general gaiety of his appearance emphasised by a pink complexion, a distinct increase of girth, and a beautiful khaki suit. And Boltishaw found himself clapped on the back, and the same voice was exclaiming, "'Well, how are you, bulky chops? Looking better than ever, pon my word!' And then the bar was immediately in a roar of conviviality. Everybody struggled for the honour of standing Percy drinks, for he explained that he was off the next day to France. It is to be feared that during that afternoon Percy got rather drunk. He certainly indulged in violent moods between boisterous hilarity and a certain sullen pugnacity. At intervals he would continually ask for Ticknet, but to Boltishaw's surprise, Ticknett had disappeared almost immediately Percy entered the bar, and was not seen again that day, while, on the other side, Daphne stood cowering against the mahogany casings, looking deadly pale, with great black rings around her eyes. Percy was quite friendly to Boltishaw, and introduced him to a friend of his in the same regiment, named Prosser, a young man who had previously been in a drapery store. It was not till later in the evening that the dull rumble of some imminent tragedy caused the vast bulk of the linoleum manager's body to tremble. He had been conscious of it all the afternoon. He was frightened. He did not like the way Percy had asked for Ticknet. He did not like Ticknet's disappearance. And above all, he did not like the way Daphne had cowered against the wall. There was something at the back of all this something uncomfortable. He dreaded things of this nature. Why couldn't people go on quietly eating and drinking and being comfortable? He avoided the Duchess of Teck and actually stayed late at his work and caught up some arrears. He decided to go quickly home. When he got outside he commenced to walk when suddenly Percy came out of a doorway and took hold of his arm. Boltishaw started. "'What is it? What do you want?' he said. There was something very curious about Percy. He had never seen him like that before. He had been drinking, but he was not drunk. In fact, Boltishaw had never seen him in some way so sober, so grimly serious. His lips were trembling, and his eyes were unnaturally bright. He gripped Boltishaw's coat and said, "'Where is your friend Ticknett? "'I don't know. I haven't seen him since this morning,' Boltishaw answered. "'Will you swear he isn't in the building, and that you don't know where he is?' 
Yes, gasped the cork lino manager. Percy looked into his eyes for some moments, and then he said queerly, Ticknet knows that I've got to report first thing in the morning. I've just seen Daphne home. There'll be a packet for Ticknet. Do you see? I say there'll be a packet for him. Do you understand, Bulky Chops? Baltishaw was very frightened. He did not know a bit what the young man meant. He only knew that he wanted to get away. He didn't want to be mixed up in this. He mumbled. I, I, I see um, uh, 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 him. Pack it. I'll tell. No, you needn't tell him, answered the soldier. I'm saying this for your benefit. I say there'll be a packet for him. Do you understand? There'll be a packet for him. And he melted into the night. From the day when Percy disappeared with these mysterious words on his lips to the day when the news came that he had been killed, there was an interval of time that varied according to the occupation and the preoccupation of his particular acquaintances. To Baltishaw it appeared a very long time, but this may have been partly due to the fact that in the interval he had spent most of the time in bed with a very serious illness. He had been lying on his back, staring at the ceiling, and he had not been allowed to drink. The time had consequently hung very heavily on his hands, and his thoughts had been feeding on each other. The exact time was in effect eleven weeks. During the latter part of this period his friend Ticknett paid him many visits, and had been very kind and attentive, and it was he indeed who brought the news that Percy had been killed. It was one evening when it was nearly dark, and Baltishaw was sitting up in his dressing gown in front of the fire, and his daughter Elsie was sitting on the other side of the fireplace sewing. Ticknett paid one of his customary visits. Elsie showed him to an easy chair between the two, and after Ticknett's solicitous inquiries regarding Baltishaw's health, the two men reverted to their usual discussion of the staff of Cottaways and their friends. Suddenly Ticknett remarked quite casually, Oh, by the way, young Percy has been killed at the front. And then the room seemed to become violently darker. Baltishaw struggled to frame some suitable comment upon this, but the words failed to come. He sat there with his fat, puffy hands, pressing the sides of his easy chair. At last he said, Elsie, you might go and get my beef tea ready. When his daughter had gone out of the room, he still had nothing to say. He had not dismissed her for the purpose of speaking about the matter to Ticknet, but simply because a strange mood had come to him that he could not trust himself. In the gathering darkness he could see the sallow mask of his friend's face looking at the fire, and his cold eyes peering beneath his heavy brows. Baltishaw at length managed to say, Any particulars? And Ticknet replied, No, it was in the papers yesterday. And then Ticknet smiled and added, So you won't have to bother about your job any longer, Mr. Baltishaw. And Baltishaw thought, There'll be a packet for you, Ticknet. A packet, do you understand? And by God, you'll deserve it. He was still uncertain of what the packet would contain, but he thought a lot about it during his illness, and he was sure the packet would contain something unpleasant, if not terrible. And yet Ticknet was his friend, in fact his only friend, the man who had saved him in a crisis, and who waited on him in his sickness. He tried to pull himself together, and he managed to say in his normally wheezy voice, I hope to be back next week. And indeed on the following Tuesday he did once more report himself to the heads of the firm. He was still very weak and ill, and the doctor had warned him to avoid alcohol in any form. But by half past twelve he felt so exhausted he decided a little whisky and milk might help him get through the day. He crawled round to the Duchess of Teck, and was soon amongst his congenial acquaintances. It was very warm, very pleasant, and ingratiating, the atmosphere of the bar. He ordered his whisky and milk, and then became aware of a striking vacancy. Daphne was not there. Mrs. Clark and Gladys were busy serving drinks, and a tall, thin girl was helping them. A peculiar sense of misgiving came to Baltishaw. 
He did not like to say anything about it to Mrs. Clark, but he turned to an old habitué named Benjamin Strigg, and he whispered, "'Where's Daphne today, Mr. Strigg?' And Mr. Strigg answered, "'Daphne? She ain't been here for nearly three months. There was some story about her and young Percy. I've really forgotten what it was all about. Of course, you've been away, Mr. Boltishaw. You've missed all the spicy news, eh?' They never interest me. Ha, ha, ha. Can I order you another whisky and milk? Voltishaw declined with thanks and stood there sucking his pipe. In a few minutes, Tickner entered the bar. He appeared to be quite cheerful and, for him, garrulous. He was very solicitous about Voltishaw's health and insistent that he should not stand near a draft. He talked optimistically about the war, and Boltishaw replied in monosyllables. And all the time the ridiculous thought kept racing through his mind. You're going to get a packet, my friend. It was a week later that Prosser turned up. He was one of the eleven men, the sole survivors of a regiment, Percy's regiment. Prosser was slightly wounded in the foot and had strangely altered. He stammered and was no longer a gay companion. He had a wild, abstracted look, as though he had lost the power of listening and was entirely occupied with inner visions. They could get little information out of him about Percy. He described certain scenes and experiences very vividly, but the description did not convey much to most of the men, for the reason that they were entirely devoid of imagination. The regiment had, as a matter of fact, been ambushed and practically annihilated. A mine had done some deadly work. He had seen Percy and another man come into the lines in the morning. It was just daybreak. They had been on listening patrol. He had seen them both making their way along a trench to a dugout, to the very spot where five minutes later the mine blew up. Didn't you never see Percy again? someone asked. No, answered the warrior. But I heard him laugh. Laugh? Yes, you know the way he used to laugh, loud and clear. He must have been two hundred yards away. Suddenly he laughed, and I says to Peters, who was on my right, Ark at that blighter, Percy. Seems to think even this is amusing. I hadn't got the words out of my mouth when, just as though the whole bally earth had burst into a gas, not a quarter of a mile away, thought I was gone myself, right over in the quarter where Percy had gone. Thousands of tons of mud flung up into the sky. You could hear the earth being ripped to pieces, and there were men in it. Oh, God! Boltishaw shuddered and felt faint, and the rest of the company seemed to think they were hearing a rather highly coloured account of some quite inconceivable phenomenon. Prosser was further detailing his narrative, when he happened to drop a phrase that was very illuminating to Boltishaw. He was speaking of another man, some of them knew, named Bates. The phrase he used was, Charlie Bates got a packet, too. A packet? Boltishaw paid for his drink and went out into the street. He felt rather hot and cold round the temples. He took a cab home and went straight to bed, explaining to his daughters that he had had a very heavy day. When he rolled between the sheets, the true meaning of that sinister phrase, getting a packet, kept revolving through his mind. It was evidently the military expression, and very terse and grim and sardonic it was. These men who met a violent end got a packet. Percy had got a packet. Bates had got a packet. But why should Ticknett, dividing his days between a furnishing house and a saloon bar, get a packet. It was incredible, preposterous. Men who went out to fight for their country, well, they might expect it, but not men who lead simple, honest commercial lives. If Ticknett got a packet, why should he not himself get a packet? He passed a sleepless night, but there was one problem he determined to try and solve on the morrow. Somehow Boltishaw could not bring himself to ask Mrs. Clark about Daphne, and Gladys, 
whom he always suspected of laughing at him, he would certainly not question. He eventually got her address from a potman who had carried some of her things home for her. When he did get her address, it took him over a week to make up his mind to visit her. He thumbed the envelope and breathed heavily on it, put it back in his pocket and took it out again, and tried to dismiss it from his mind. But the very touch of it seemed to burn his body. At length, on the following Saturday night, he tucked it finally into his waistcoat pocket and set out in the direction of Kilburn. It was very dark when he found the obscure street, and the number of the address was a gaunt house of four stories above a low-class restaurant where sausages and slabs of fish were frying in the window to tempt the hungry passers-by. He stumbled up the dark stairs and was told by two children whom he could not see that Miss Allen lived on the third floor. He rang the wrong bell on the third floor. There were two lots of inhabitants and was told by a lady that she liked his bleeding cheek waking her in her first sleep ringing the wrong bell and the door was slammed in his face. He tried the other bell and the door was opened immediately by a gaunt woman who said, Who's that? Oh, I thought it was the doctor. Boltishaw asked if Miss Daphne Allen lived there, and gave his own name. The woman stared at him and then said, Wait a minute. She shut the door and left him outside. After a time she came back and said, What do you want? Boltishaw said, I just want to speak to her for a few minutes. The woman again retired and left him for nearly five minutes. He stood there shivering with cold on the stone stairs and listening to the strange mixture of noises, children quarrelling in the street below and in the room opposite someone playing a mouth organ. At last the woman came back. She said, come in. He followed her into a pokey room, dimly lit by a tin paraffin lamp with a pink glass. In the corner of the room was a bed on which a woman was lying, feeding a baby. Her face looked white and thin, and her hair was bound up in a shawl. It was Daphne. She looked at him listlessly and said, Well, have you brought any money from him? Boltishaw stood blinking at her, unable to comprehend. Whom did she mean by him? He coughed and tried to formulate some sympathetic inquiry, when suddenly the gaunt woman who had shown him in turned on him and cried, "'Well, what the hell are you standing there like that for? "'You've come from him, I suppose. "'You're his greatest pal, ain't ye? "'We've never seen a farthing of his money yet "'since the dirty blackguard did her in. "'What have you come slobbering up here for "'if it ain't to bring some money? "'The bloody hound! "'If it ain't been for him, "'she might be a wife of a respectable soldier.' and getting her maintenance and pension, and all that. There was a sob from the bed and a pleading voice that cried, Auntie, Auntie, and the baby started to cry. While these little things were happening, the slow-moving mind of Boltishaw, for once worked rapidly, came to a conclusion and formed a resolution. He moved ponderously to the lamp, took out his purse. He looked across the lamp at Daphne and said, he sends you this. He's sorry not to have sent before. He... The elder woman dashed toward the table and looked at the money. How much is it? she said, and then turning to Daphne she laughed. It's two quid. That's better than nothing. Is there any more to come? Boltishaw again looked at Daphne. She was bending over the child. She seemed indifferent. A strand of her hair had broken loose beneath the shawl. Boltishaw stammered, Yes, yeah, 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 uh, 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 of course. There uh, will be uh, uh, the same again. How often, whined the elder woman. Uh, two pounds every fortnight. Uh, I'll bring it myself. The man blew his nose and shuffled from one foot to another. Are you getting better? Is there anything else? He mumbled. Oh, no, whined the elder woman. We're living in the lap of luxury. Everything we could want, ain't we, sissy? The woman on the bed did not answer, and Boltishaw fumbled his way out of the room. That night Boltishaw had a mild return of his illness. He was very feverish. His mind became occupied with visions of Percy. Percy the gay, the debonair. 
There was a long line of populars by a canal and some low buildings of a factory on the left. The earth was seamed with jagged cuts and holes. Men were burrowing their way underground like moles. The thing was like a torn fringe of humanity, wildly insane. It was very dark, but one was conscious that vast numbers of men were scratching their way towards each other, zigzagging in a drunken, frenzied manner. There was a stench of decaying matter and some chemical even more penetrating. There were millions and millions of men, but they were all invisible, silently scratching and listening. Suddenly, amidst the dead silence, there was the loud burst of Percy's laughter, just as he had laughed in the bar of the Duchess of Teck, and his voice rang through the night. Hello, 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 so here we all are. And this challenge seemed to awaken the lurking passions of the night. Boltishaw groaned and started up in bed and cried out, Oh God, a thousand tons of mud, a thousand tons of mud. On the following day, Boltishaw made a grievous mistake in his accounts. He was severely hauled over the coals by the directors. As the weeks proceeded, he made other mistakes. He became morose and abstracted. He drank his whiskey with less and less soda, till he was drinking it almost neat. "'Old bulky chop's brain's going,' said some of the other salesmen. He would lean up against the bar and stare at Ticknet. Their old conversational relationship became reversed. It was Boltishaw who listened and Ticknet who did the talking. The soft goods manager appeared to be an excellent trim at the time. He seemed more light-hearted than he had been for years. He spoke in his quiet voice about the tactics of Russian generals and the need for general compulsion in this country for everybody up to the age of 45. Ticknet was 47. At Christmas time he sent Voltage for a case of old port wine. His position in the firm became more assured. It was said that Ticknet had brought a large block of shares in Cotterways Limited and that he stood a good chance of being put on the board of directorship and Boltishaw watched his upward progress with a curious intentness. He himself was blundering down the hill. He had made a large inroad into his capital, and the day could not be far distant when he would be dismissed. Every fortnight he went out to Kilburn and took two sovereigns, and never spoke of this to Ticknet. Elsie Boltishaw was very mysterious. In her black crepe dress she bustled about the small room, holding the teapot in her hand. They say you should never speak ill of the dead, she whispered to her visitor. She emptied a packet of tea into a caddy and tipped three teaspoons full into the pot. Of course, she continued, it's very hard on me and Dorothy. It's lucky Dorothy's got that job at the war office, or I don't know what we'd do. Your poor father was not a careful man. I know, my dear, said the visitor. Elsie poured the boiling water on to the tea leaves and sighed. It wasn't only that, my dear, she answered. She coughed and then added in a low voice, There was some woman in the case, a barmaid in fact. Of course, poor father's illness cost a lot of money, what with doctors and specialists and loss of time and that. But it seems he'd been keeping this woman too, taking her money every fortnight. When everything's settled up, there won't be more than twenty pounds a year for me and Dorothy. Dear, dear, said the visitor. It's all very tragic, my dear. You can't think, Elsie continued, warming to the excitement of her narrative, what we've been through. We could never have lived through it if it hadn't been for Mr. Ticknet. He's been kindness itself, and such an extraordinary hallucination poor father had about him. I didn't tell you, did I, dear? No, dear. I'll never forget that night father came home. He'd been drinking, of course, but it wasn't only that. I've never seen him like it. He just raved. It was very late, and me and Dorothy were going to bed. He came stumbling into this room, his eyes looking all bright and glassy-like. He started by saying that the dead could speak. He said he'd only obeyed the voice of the dead. And then he said something about a packet and about Mr. Ticknet. I was terrified. He described something he said he'd just done. He walked about the room. 
He pointed to that corner. Look, he says, Ticknet was standing there. There had been a dinner to celebrate Mr. Ticknet's election onto the board of directors of Cottaways. I never take my eyes off him all the evening, father says. It was after the dinner and we went into the saloon. Ticknet was surrounded by his friends. I watched his lying, treacherous yellow face smirking all around. And suddenly a voice spoke to me, a voice from some dim field in France. It says, Ticknet's going to have a packet. And then I drew my revolver and shot him through the face. Dorothy shrieked, and I tried to get father to bed. Of course it was all rubbish. He'd never shot no one. It was just raving. Everybody knows that Mr. Ticknet's been father's best friend. He's helped him crowds of times. A nicer man you couldn't meet. He's coming to tea on Sunday. We managed to get poor father to bed and to get a doctor. But it was no good. He babbled like a child all night. It was so funny like. He really was like a child. He kept on repeating, A thousand tons of mud. And then suddenly about morning he got quite quiet and his face looked like some great baby's lying there. He died quite peaceful. Elsie performed a little mild weep, and the visitor indulged in various exclamations of sympathy and interest. Oh dear, she concluded, it's dreadful the things people imagine when they're like that. Elsie went over all the details again, and the visitor recounted a tragic episode she had heard of in connection with a corporal's widow who was a relation of her own landlady. They discussed the dreadful war and its effect on the price of bacon and margarine. After her departure, Elsie washed out and ironed some handkerchiefs and then prepared her sister's supper. Dorothy arrived home about seven, and the two sisters discussed the events of the day. They sat in front of the fire and listened to a pot stewing. At a sudden pause, Dorothy looked into the fire and said, Do you think Ticknet's really keen on me, Elsie? Elsie giggled and kissed her sister. You'd have to be blind not to see that, she said, and then she whispered, Are you really keen on him? The younger sister continued staring into the fire. I don't know. I think I am. Isn't this stew nearly done? Elsie again giggled and proceeded to dish up the stew. Before this operation was completed, there was a knock at the door. Elsie said, Oh, curse! and went and opened it. In the doorway stood a woman with a small parcel. Her face was deadly white and her lips colourless. She looked like a woman to whom everything that could happen had happened long ago, and the result had left her lifeless and indifferent. She said listlessly, Are you Miss Baltishaw? And Elsie said, Yes. The woman entered and looked round the room. May I speak to you a moment? Is this your sister? she said. Elsie answered, Yes, what do you want? I want to make an explanation and to give you some money. She untied the packet and placed some notes onto the tablecloth. What the hell's this? exclaimed Elsie. This is all I could find, muttered the listless woman. I found them in his breast pocket. They belong to your father. It wasn't your father at all who ought to have paid. He ought to have paid, so I've taken them from him. I hope there's enough. I'm afraid there may not be. It's all I have. It's only right you should have it. The two sisters stared at her and involuntarily drew closer together. It was Dorothy who eventually managed to speak. What are you talking about, she said. Who do you mean by him? Ticknet. The sisters gasped, and Dorothy gave a little cry. Here, what do you mean? she said breathlessly. Have you pinched this money from Ticknet? You'd better be careful, he's coming here. 
we'll have you arrested. The listless woman shook her head. No, no, she said in her toneless voice. Don't you believe that? He won't come here. Why won't he come here? rasped Dorothy with a note of challenge. The strange visitor stood staring vacantly at the fire. She seemed not to have heard. Her lips were trembling. Suddenly she answered in the same dull, lifeless manner. Because he's lying on my bed with a bullet through his heart. End of the Packet by Tracy Amonier Recording by Peter Tomlinson People Soup by Alan Arkin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman When you took pot luck with this kitchen scientist, not even the poor pot was lucky. People Soup by Alan Arkin Bonnie came home from school and found her brother in the kitchen doing something important at the sink. She knew it was important because he was making a mess and talking to himself. The sink drain was loaded down with open soda bottles, a sack of flour, cornmeal, dog biscuits, molasses, bromo seltzer, a tin of sardines, and a box of soap chips. The floor was covered with drippings and every cupboard in the kitchen was open. At the moment, Bonnie's brother was putting all his energy into shaking a plastic juicer that was half filled with an ominous looking frothy mixture. Bonnie waited a moment, keeping well out of range, and then said, Hi, Bob. Lo, he answered without looking up. Where's Mom? Shopping. Bonnie inched a little closer. What are you doing, Bob? she asked. Nothing. Can I watch? No. Bonnie took this as a cue to advance two cautious steps. She knew from experience how close she could approach her brother when he was being creative and still maintain a peaceful neutrality. Bob slopped a cupful of ketchup into the juicer, added a can of powdered mustard, a drop of milk, six aspirin, and a piece of chewing gum, being careful to spill a part of each package used. Bonnie moved a little closer. Are you making another experiment? she asked. Who wants to know? Bob asked in his mad scientist voice as he swaggered over to the refrigerator and took out an egg, some old bacon fat, a capsuled vitamin pill, yesterday's jello, and a bottle of clam juice. Me wants to know, said Bonnie, picking up an apple that had rolled out of the refrigerator and fallen on the floor. Why should I tell you? I have a quarter. Where'd you get it? Mom gave it to me. If you give it to me, I'll tell you what I'm doing. It's not worth it. I'll let you be my assistant, too. Still not worth it. For ten cents? Okay, ten cents. She counted out the money to her brother and put on an apron. What should I do now, Bob? Get the salt, Bob instructed. He poured the sardine oil from the can into the juicer, being very careful not to let the sardines fall in. When he had squeezed the last drop of oil out of the can, he ate all the sardines and tossed the can into the sink. Bonnie went after the salt, and when she lifted out the box, she found a package containing two chocolate graham crackers. Mom has a new hiding place, Bob, she announced. Bob looked up. Where is it? Behind the salt. What did you find? Two chocolate grams. Bobby held out his hand, accepting one of the crackers without thanks, and proceeded to crumble the whole thing into his concoction, not even stopping to lick the chocolate off his hands. Bonnie frowned in disbelief. She had never seen such self-sacrifice. The act made her aware for the first time of the immense significance of the experiment. She dropped her quarrel completely and walked over to the sink to get a good look at what was being done. All she saw in the sink was a wadded, wet cornflakes box, the empty sardine tin, and the spillings from the juicer, which by this time was beginning to take on a distinctive and unpleasant odor. Bob gave Bonnie the job of adding seven pinches of salt 
and some cocoa to the concoction. "'What's it going to be, Bob?' she asked, blending the cocoa on her hands into her yellow corduroy skirt. "'Stuff,' Bob answered, unbending a little. "'Government stuff? Nope. Spaceship stuff? Nope. Medicine? Nope. I give up.' It's animal serum, Bob said, slicing his thumb on the sardine can, glancing unemotionally at the cut, ignoring it. What's animal serum, Bob? It's certain properties without which the universe in eternity regards for human beings. Oh, Bonnie said. She took off her apron and sat down at the other end of the kitchen. The smell of the juicer was beginning to reach her stomach. Bobby combed the kitchen for something else to throw into his concoction and came up with some oregano and liquid garlic. I guess this is about it, he said. He poured the garlic and oregano into his juicer, put the lid on, shook it furiously for a minute, and then emptied the contents into a deep pot. What are you going to do now, Bob? Bonnie asked. You have to cook it for seven minutes. Bobby lit the stove, put a cover on the pot, set the timer for ten minutes and left the room. Bonnie tagged after him, and the two of them got involved in a rough game of basketball in the living room. Bing, said the timer. Bob dropped the basketball on Bonnie's head and ran back into the kitchen. It's all done, he said, and took the cover off the pot. Only his dedication to his work kept him from showing the discomfort he felt with the smell that the pot gave forth. Phew, said Bonnie. What do we do with it now? Throw it out? No, stupid, we have to stir it until it cools, and then drink it. Drink it? Bonnie wrinkled her nose. How come we have to drink it? Bobby said, because that's what you do with experiments, stupid. But, Bob, it smells like garbage. Medicine smells worse, and it makes you healthy. Bob said, while stirring the pot with an old wooden spoon. Bonnie held her nose, stood on tiptoe, and looked in at the cooking solution. Will this make us healthy? Maybe, Bob kept stirring. What will it do? You'll see. Bob took two clean dish towels, draped them around the pot, and carried it over to the Formica kitchen table. In the process, he managed to dip both towels into the mixture and burned his already sliced thumb. One plastic handle of the pot was still smoldering from being too near the fire, but none of these things seemed to have the slightest effect on him. He put the pot down in the middle of the table and stared at it, chin in hand. Bonnie plopped down opposite him, put her chin in her hands and asked, We have to drink that stuff? Yep. Who has to drink it first? Bob made no sign of having heard. I thought so, said Bonnie. Still no comment. What if it kills me? Bobby spoke by raising his whole head and keeping his jaw stationary in his hands. How could it hurt you? There's nothing but pure food in there. Bonnie also sat and stared. How much of that stuff do I have to drink? Just a little bit. Stick one finger in it and lick it off. Bonnie pointed a cautious finger at the tarry-looking brew and slowly immersed it until it barely covered the nail. Is that enough? Plenty, said Bob in a judicious tone. Bonnie took her finger out of the pot and stared at it for a moment. What if I get sick? You can't get sick. There's aspirin and vitamins in it, too. Bonnie sighed and wrinkled her nose. Well, here goes, she said. She licked off a little bit. Bob watched her with his television version of a scientific look. What do you feel? he inquired. Bonnie answered, It's not so bad once it goes down. You can taste the chocolate graham cracker. Bonnie was really enjoying the attention. Hey, she said, I'm starting to get a funny feeling in my... And before she could finish the sentence, there was a loud pop. Bob's face registered extreme disappointment. She sat quite still for a moment, and then said, What happened? You turned into a chicken. The little bird lifted its wings and looked down at itself. How come I'm a chicken, Bob? 
it said cocking its head to one side and staring at him with its left eye ah nuts he explained i expected you to be more of a pigeon thing he mulled over the ingredients of his stew to see what went wrong the chicken hopped around the chair on one leg flapped its wings experimentally and found itself on the kitchen table it walked to the far corner and peered into a small mirror that hung on the side of the sink cabinet i'm a pretty ugly chicken boy it said it inspected itself with its other eye and finding no improvement walked back to bobby i don't like to be a chicken bob it said why not what does it feel like it feels skinny and i can't see so good how else does it feel that's all it feels make me stop being it first tell me better what it's like i told you already make me stop being it what are you afraid of why don't you see what it's like first before you change back this is a valuable experience the chicken turned to put its hands on its hips but could find neither hips nor hands you better change me back boy it said and gave bob a left-eyed glare will you stop being stupid and see just what it's like first bob was finding it difficult to understand her lack of curiosity wait until mom sees what an ugly mess i am boy will you ever get it bonnie was trying very hard to see bob with both eyes at once which was impossible you're a sissy bonnie you ruined the opportunity of a lifetime i'm disgusted with you bob dipped his forefinger into the serum and held it toward the chicken it pecked what it could from the finger and tilted its head back in an instant the chicken was gone and bonnie was back she climbed down from the table wiped her eyes and said it's a good thing you fixed me boy would you ever have got it ah you're nothing but a sissy bob said and licked off the whole fingerful of his formula if i change into a horse i won't let you ride me and if i change into a leopard i'll bite your head off once again a loud pop was heard bonnie stood up wide-eyed oh bob she said you're beautiful what am i bob asked you're a beautiful saint bernard bob let's go show melissa and chuck a saint bernard the animal looked disgusted i don't want to be no dog i want to be a leopard but you're beautiful bob go look in the mirror nah the dog paddled over to the table what are you gonna do bob i'm gonna try it again the dog put its front paws on the table knocked over the serum and lapped up some as it dripped on the floor pop went the serum taking effect bob remained on all fours and kept on lapping pop went the serum again what am i now he asked you're still a saint bernard said bonnie the devil with it then said the dog let's forget all about it the dog took one last lap of serum pop bobby got up from the floor and dejectedly started out the back door bonnie skipped after him what'll we do now bob she asked we'll go down to thrifty's and get some ice cream they walked down the hill silently bob brooding over not having been a leopard and bonnie wishing he'd stayed a saint bernard as they approached the main street of the small town bonnie turned to her brother you want to make some more of that stuff tomorrow not the same stuff said bob what'll we make instead i ain't decided yet you want to make an atomic bomb maybe can we do it with a juicer sure said bob only i'll have to get a couple of onions the end of people soup by alan arkin A Reminiscence of the Back Settlements by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. A Reminiscence of the Back Settlements 
by Mark Twain. Now that corpse, said the undertaker, patting the folded hands of the deceased approvingly, was a brick. Every way you took him, he was a brick. He was so real accommodating, and so modest-like, and simple, in his last moment. Friends wanted metallic burial case. Nothing else would do. I couldn't get it. There weren't going to be time. Anybody could see that. The corpse said, never mind. Shake him up some kind of box he could stretch out in comfortable. He wasn't particular about the general style of it. Said he went more on room than style anyway, in the final container. Friends wanted a silver door plate on the coffin, signifying who he was and where he was from. Now you know a fellow can't roust out such a gaily thing as that in a little country town like this. What did the corpse say? Corpse said, whitewash his old canoe and daub his address and general destination onto it with a blacking brush and a stencil plate, along with the verse of some likely hymn or other, and point him at the tomb and mark him C.O.D. and just let him skip along. He weren't distressed any more than you be. On the contrary, just as calm and collected as a hearse horse, said he judged that where he was going, a body would find it considerable better to attract attention by a picturesque moral character than a natty burial case with a swell door plate on it. Splendid man he was. I'd rather do for a corpse like that than any I've tackled in seven years. There's some satisfaction in burying a man like that. You feel that what you're doing is appreciated. Lord bless you. So he got planted before he spoilt. He was perfectly satisfied, said his relations meant well, perfectly well, but all them preparations was bound to delay the thing more or less, and he didn't wish to keep laying around. You never see such a clear head as what he had, and so calm and so cool. Just a hunk of brains, that is what he was perfectly awful it was a ripping distance from one end of that man's head to t'other often and over again he had brain fever a raging in one place and the rest of the pile didn't know anything about it didn't affect it any more than an engine insurrection in arizona affects the atlantic states well the relations wanted a big funeral but corp said he was down on flummery didn't want any procession fill the hearst full of mourners and get out a stern line and tow him behind he was the most down on style of any remains i ever struck a beautiful simple-minded creature it was what he was you can depend on that he was just set on having things the way he wanted them and he took a solid comfort in laying his little plans he had me measure him and take a whole raft of directions then he had a minister stand up behind a long box with a tablecloth over it and read his funeral sermon, saying, Ancor! Ancor! at the good places, and making him scratch out every bit of brag about him and all the highfalutin. And then he made him trot out the choir so he could help him pick out the tunes for the occasion. And he got him to sing Pop Goes the Weasel, because he'd always liked that tune when he was downhearted and solemn music made him sad and when they sung that with tears in their eyes because they all loved him and his relations grieving around he just laid there as happy as a bug and trying to beat time and showing all over how much he enjoyed it and presently he got worked up and excited and tried to join in for mind you he was pretty proud of his abilities in the singing line but the first time he opened his mouth and was just going to spread himself his breath took a walk i never saw a man snuffed out so sudden ah it was a great loss it was a powerful loss to this poor little one-horse town well 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 i hain't got time to be palaverin along here got to nail on the lid and mosey along with him and if you'll give me a lift we'll skeet him into the hearse and meander along relations bound to have it so don't pay no attention to dying instructions minute a corpse is gone but if i had it my way 
if i didn't respect his last wishes and tow him behind the hearse i'll be cussed i consider that whatever a corpse wants done for his comfort is a little enough matter and a man hain't got no right to deceive him or take advantage of him and whatever the corpse trusts me to do i'm a-gonna do you know even if it's to stuff him and paint him yeller and keep him for a keepsake you hear me he cracked his whip and went lumbering away with his ancient ruin of a hearse and i continued my walk with a valuable lesson learned that a healthy and wholesome cheerfulness is not necessarily impossible to any occupation the lesson is likely to be lasting for it will take many months to obliterate the memory of the remarks and the circumstances that impressed it the end of a reminiscence of the back settlements by mark twain the resident patient by sir arthur conan doyle 1859 to 1930 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson In glancing over the somewhat incoherent series of memoirs with which I have endeavoured to illustrate a few of the mental peculiarities of my friend Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I have been struck by the difficulty which I have experienced in picking out examples where it shall in every way answer my purpose. For in those cases in which Holmes has performed some tour de force of analytical reasoning and has demonstrated the value of his peculiar methods of investigation, the facts themselves have often been so slight or so commonplace that I could not feel justified in laying them before the public. On the other hand, it has frequently happened that he has been concerned in some research where the facts have been of the most remarkable and dramatic character, but where the share which he has himself taken in determining their causes has been less pronounced than I, as his biographer, could wish. The small matter which I have chronicled under the heading of A Study in Scarlet, and that other later one connected with the loss of the Gloria Scott, may serve as examples of this Scylla and Chalabidis which are for ever threatening the historian. It may be that in the business of which I am now about to write, the part which my friend played is not sufficiently accentuated, and yet the whole train of circumstances is so remarkable that I cannot bring myself to omit it entirely from this series. I cannot be sure of the exact date, for some of my memoranda upon the matter have been mislaid, but it must have been towards the end of the first year during which Holmes and I shared chambers in Baker Street. It was boisterous October weather, and we had both remained indoors all day, because I feared with my shaken health to face the keen autumn wind, while he was deep in some of those abstruse chemical investigations which absorbed him utterly as long as he was engaged upon them. Towards evening, however, the breaking of a test-tube brought his research to a premature ending, and he sprang up from his chair with an exclamation of impatience and a clouded brow. "'A day's work ruined, Watson,' said he, striding across to the window. "Ha! <coughs> the stars are out and the wind has fallen. What do you say to a ramble through London?' I was weary of our little sitting-room and gladly acquiesced. For three hours we strolled about together, watching the ever-changing kaleidoscope of life as it ebbs and flows through Fleet Street and the Strand. Holmes had shaken off his temporary ill-humour, and his characteristic talk, with its keen observance of detail and subtle power of inference, held me amused and enthralled. It was ten o'clock before we reached Baker Street again. A brougham was waiting at our door. Hum, a doctor's general practitioner, I perceive, said Holmes, not been long in practice, but has had a good deal to do, come to consult us, I fancy. Lucky we came back. 
I was sufficiently conversant with Holmes's methods to be able to follow his reasoning, and to see that the nature and state of the various medical instruments in the wicker basket which hung in the lamplight inside the brougham had given him the data for his swift deduction. The light in our window above showed that this late visit was indeed intended for us. With some curiosity as to what could have sent a brother medico to us at such an hour, I followed Holmes into our sanctum. A pale, taper-faced man with sandy whiskers rose up from a chair by the fire as we entered. His age may not have been more than three or four and thirty, but his haggard expression and unhealthy hue told of a life which has sapped his strength and robbed him of his youth. His manner was nervous and shy, like that of a sensitive gentleman, and the thin white hand which he laid on the mantelpiece as he rose was that of an artist rather than of a surgeon. His dress was quiet and sombre, a black frock coat, dark trousers, and a touch of colour about his necktie. "'Good evening, doctor,' said Holmes, cheerily. "'I'm glad to see that you have only been waiting a very few minutes.' "'You spoke to my coachman, then?' "'No, it was the candle on the side-table that told me. "'Pray resume your seat and let me know how I can serve you.' "'My name is Dr. Percy Trevelyan,' said our visitor, "'and I live at 403 Brook Street. "'Are you not the author of a monograph upon obscure nervous lesions?' I asked. "'His pale cheeks flushed with pleasure at hearing that his work was known to me.' "'I so seldom hear of the work that I thought it was quite dead,' said he. "'My publishers gave me a most discouraging account of its sale. "'You are yourself, I presume, a medical man, a retired army surgeon. "'My own hobby has always been nervous disease. "'I should wish to make it an absolute speciality, "'but, of course, a man must take what he can get at first. This, however, is beside the question, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and I quite appreciate how valuable your time is. The fact is that a very singular train of events has occurred recently at my house in Brook Street, and tonight they came to such a head that I felt it was quite impossible for me to wait another hour before asking for your advice and assistance. Sherlock Holmes sat down and lit his pipe. "'You are very welcome to both,' said he. "'Pray let me have a detailed account of what the circumstances are which have disturbed you.' "'One or two of them are so trivial,' said Dr. Trevelyan, "'that really I am almost ashamed to mention them. "'But the matter is so inexplicable, "'and the recent turn which it has taken is so elaborate "'that I shall lay it all before you, "'and you shall judge what is essential and what is not. I am compelled, to begin with, to say something of my own college career. I am a London University man, you know, and I am sure that you will not think that I am unduly singing my own praises if I say that my student career was considered by my professors to be a very promising one. After I had graduated, I continued to devote myself to research, occupying a minor position in King's College Hospital, and I was fortunate enough to excite considerable interest by my research into the pathology of catalepsy, and finally to win the Bruce Pinkerton Prize and Medal by the monograph on nervous lesions to which your friend has just alluded. I should not go too far if I were to say that there was a general impression at that time that a distinguished career lay before me. But the one great stumbling block lay in my want of capital. As you will readily understand, a specialist who aims high is compelled to start in one of a dozen streets in the Cavendish Square quarter, all of which entail enormous rents and furnishing expenses. Besides this preliminary outlay, he must be prepared to keep himself for some years and to hire a presentable carriage and horse. To do this was quite beyond my power, and I could only hope that by economy I might in ten years' time save enough to enable me to put up my plate. Suddenly, however, an unexpected incident opened up quite a new prospect to me. 
This was a visit from a gentleman of the name of Blessington, who was a complete stranger to me. He came up to my room one morning and plunged into business in an instant. "'You are the same Percy Trevelyan who has had so distinguished a career and won a great prize lately,' said he. I bowed. "'Answer me frankly,' he continued, "'for you will find it to your interest to do so. "'You have all the cleverness which makes a successful man. "'Have you the tact?' "'I could not help smiling at the abruptness of the question. "'I trust that I have my share,' I said. "'Any bad habits? "'Not drawn towards drink, eh?' "'Really, sir,' I cried. "'Quite right. "'That's all right. "'But I was bound to ask.' With all these qualities, why are you not in practice? I shrugged my shoulders. Come, come, said he, in his bustling way. It's the old story, more in your brains than in your pocket, eh? What would you say if I were to start you in Brook Street? I stared at him in astonishment. Oh, it's for my sake, not yours, he cried. I'll be perfectly frank with you, and if it suits you... It will suit me very well. I have a few thousand to invest, dear C, and I think I'll sink them in you. But why? I gasped. Well, it's just like any other speculation, and safer than most. What am I to do, then? I'll tell you. I'll take the house, furnish it, pay the maids, and run the whole place. All you have to do is just to wear out your chair in the consulting room. I'll let you have pocket money and everything. Then you hand over to me three quarters of what you earn, and you keep the other quarter for yourself. This was the strange proposal, Mr. Holmes, with which the man Blessington approached me. I won't weary you with the account of how we bargained and negotiated. It ended up in my moving into the house next Lady Day, and starting in practice on very much the same conditions as he had suggested. He came himself to live with me in the character of a resident patient. His heart was weak, it appears, and he needed constant medical supervision. He turned the two best rooms of the first floor into a sitting room and a bedroom for himself. He was a man of singular habits, shunning company and very seldom going out. His life was irregular, but in one respect he was regularity itself. Every evening, at the same hour, he walked into the consulting room, examined the books, put down five and three pence for every guinea that I had earned, and carried the rest off to the strong box in his own room. I may say with confidence that he never had occasion to regret his speculation. From the first it was a success. A few good cases and the reputation which I had won in the hospital brought me rapidly to the front, and during the last few years I have made him a rich man. So much, Mr. Holmes, for my past history and my relations with Mr. Blessington. It only remains for me now to tell you what has occurred to bring me here tonight. Some weeks ago Mr. Blessington came down to me in, as it seemed to me, a state of considerable agitation. He spoke of some burglary which, he said, had been committed in the West End, and he appeared, I remember, to be quite unnecessarily excited about it, declaring that a day should not pass before we should add stronger bolts to our windows and doors. For a week he continued to be in a peculiar state of restlessness, peering continually out of the windows and ceasing to take the short walks which had usually been the prelude to his dinner. From his manner it struck me that he was in mortal dread of something or somebody, but when I questioned him upon the point he became so offensive that I was compelled to drop the subject. Gradually, as time passed, his fears appeared to die away, and he had renewed his former habits, when a fresh event reduced him to the pitiful state of prostration in which he now lies. What happened was this. Two days ago I received the letter which I now read to you. Neither address nor date is attached to it. A Russian nobleman, who is now resident in England, it runs, would be glad to avail himself of the professional assistance of Dr. Percy Trevelyan. He has been for some years a victim 
to cataleptic attacks, on which, as is well known, Dr. Trevelyan is an authority. He proposes to call at about quarter past six tomorrow evening, if Dr. Trevelyan will make it convenient to be at home. This letter interested me deeply because the chief difficulty in the study of catalepsy is the rareness of the disease. You may believe, then, that I was in my consulting room when, at the appointed hour, the page showed in the patient. He was an elderly man, thin, demure, and commonplace, by no means the conception one forms of a Russian nobleman. I was much more struck by the appearance of his companion. This was a tall young man, surprisingly handsome, with a dark, fierce face and the limbs and chest of a Hercules. He had his hand under the other's arm as they entered, and helped him to a chair with a tenderness which one would hardly have expected from his appearance. "'You will excuse my coming in, doctor,' said he to me, speaking English, with a slight lisp. "'This is my father, and his health is a matter of the most overwhelming importance to me.' I was touched by this filial anxiety. "'You would, perhaps, care to remain during the consultation?' said I. "'Not for the world,' he cried with a gesture of horror. "'It is more painful to me than I can express. "'If I were to see my father in one of these dreadful seizures, "'I am convinced that I should never survive it. "'My own nervous system is an exceptionally sensitive one. "'With your permission I will remain in the waiting-room "'while you go into my father's case.' To this, of course, I assented, and the young man withdrew. The patient and I then plunged into a discussion of his case, of which I took exhaustive notes. He was not remarkable for intelligence, and his answers were frequently obscure, which I attributed to his limited acquaintance with our language. Suddenly, however, as I sat writing, he ceased to give any answer at all to my inquiries, and on my turning towards him I was shocked to see that he was sitting bolt upright in his chair, staring at me with a perfectly blank and rigid face. He was again in the grip of his mysterious malady. My first feeling, as I have just said, was one of pity and horror. My second, I fear, was rather one of professional satisfaction. I made notes of my patient's pulse and temperature, tested the rigidity of his muscles, and examined his reflexes. There was nothing markedly abnormal in any of these conditions which harmonised with my former experiences. I had obtained good results in such cases by the inhalation of nitrate of amyl, and the present seemed an admirable opportunity of testing its virtues. The bottle was downstairs in my laboratory, so leaving my patient seated in his chair, I ran down to get it. There was some little delay in finding it, five minutes, let us say, and then I returned. Imagine my amazement to find the room empty and the patient gone. Of course, my first act was to run into the waiting room. The sun had gone also. The hall door had been closed, but not shut. My page who admits patience is a new boy, and by no means quick. He waits downstairs and runs up to show patients out when I ring the consulting room bell. He had heard nothing, and the affair remained a complete mystery. Mr. Blessington came in from his walk shortly afterwards, but I did not say anything to him upon the subject, for, to tell the truth, I have got in the way of late of holding as little communication with him as possible. Well, I never thought that I should see anything more of the Russian and his son, so you can imagine my amazement when, at the very same hour this evening, they both came marching into my consulting room just as they had done before. I feel that I owe you a great many apologies for my abrupt departure yesterday, doctor, said my patient. I confess that I was very much surprised at it, said I. Well, the fact is, he remarked, that when I recover from these attacks, my mind is always very clouded as to all that has gone before. I woke up in a strange room, as it seemed to me, and made my way out into the street in a sort of dazed way when you were absent. And I, said the son, seeing my father pass the door of the waiting room, naturally thought that the consultation had come to an end. It was not until we had reached home that I began to realise the true state of affairs. 
Well, said I, laughing, there is no harm done except that you puzzled me terribly. So if you, sir, would kindly step into the waiting room, I shall be happy to continue our consultation, which has brought to so abrupt an ending. For half an hour or so I discussed that old gentleman's symptoms with him, and then, having prescribed for him, I saw him go off upon the arm of his son. I have told you that Mr. Blessington generally chose this hour of the day for his exercise. He came in shortly afterwards and passed upstairs. An instant later I heard him running down, and he burst into my consulting room like a man who is mad with panic. Who has been in my room? he cried. No one, said I. It's a lie, he yelled. Come up and look. I passed over the grossness of his language, as he seemed half out of his mind with fear. When I went upstairs with him, he pointed to several footprints upon the light carpet. Do you mean to say those are mine, he cried. They were certainly very much larger than any which he could have made, and were evidently quite fresh. It rained hard this afternoon, as you know, and my patients were the only people who called. It must have been the case, then, that the man in the waiting room had, for some unknown reason, while I was busy with the other, ascended to the room of my resident patient. Nothing had been touched or taken, but there were the footprints to prove that the intrusion was an undoubted fact. Mr. Blessington seemed more excited over the matter than I should have thought possible, though, of course, it was enough to disturb anybody's peace of mind. He actually sat crying in an armchair, and I could hardly get him to speak coherently. It was his suggestion that I should come round to you, and, of course, I at once saw the propriety of it, for certainly the incident is a very singular one though he appears to completely overrate its importance. If you would only come back with me in my brougham, you would at least be able to soothe him, though I can hardly hope that you will be able to explain this remarkable occurrence. Sherlock Holmes had listened to this long narrative with an intentness which showed me that his interest was keenly aroused. His face was as impassive as ever, but his lids had drooped more heavily over his eyes, and his smoke had curled up more thickly from his pipe to emphasise each curious episode of the doctor's tale. As our visitor concluded, Holmes sprang up without a word, handed me my hat, picked his own from the table, and followed Dr. Trevelyan to the door. Within a quarter of an hour we had been dropped at the door of the physician's residence in Brook Street, one of those sombre, flat-faced houses which one associates with a West End practice. A small page admitted us, and we began at once to ascend the broad, well-carpeted stair. But a singular interruption brought us to a standstill. The light at the top was suddenly whisked out, and from the darkness came a reedy, quivering voice. "'I have a pistol,' it cried. "'I give you my word that I'll fire if you come any nearer.' "'This is really outrageous, Mr. Blessington,' cried Dr. Trevelyan. "'Oh, then, it, it, it is you, doctor,' said the voice with a great heave of relief. "'But those other gentlemen, are they what they pretend to be?' We were conscious of a long scrutiny out of the darkness. "'Yes, yes, it's all right,' said the voice at last. "'You can come up, and I'm sorry if my precautions have annoyed you.' He relit the stair gas as he spoke, and we saw before us a singular-looking man, whose appearance, as well as his voice, testified to his jangled nerves. He was very fat, but apparently at some time had been much fatter, so the skin hung about his face in loose pouches, like the cheeks of a bloodhound. He was of a sickly colour, and his thin sandy hair seemed to bristle up with the intensity of his emotions. In his hands he held a pistol, but he thrust it into his pocket as we advanced. "'Good evening, Mr. Holmes,' said he. "'I am sure I am very much obliged to you for coming round. No one ever needed your advice more than I do. I suppose that Dr. Trevelyan has told you of this most unwarrantable intrusion into my rooms.' "'Quite so,' said Holmes. "'Who are these two men, Mr. Blessington, and why do they wish to molest you?' 
"'Well, well,' said the resident patient in a nervous fashion. Uh, "'Of course it is hard to say that. "'You can hardly expect me to answer that, Mr. Holmes.' "'Do you mean that you don't know?' "'Come in here, if you please. "'Just have the kindness to step in here.' "'He led the way into his bedroom, "'which was large and comfortably furnished. "'You see that,' said he, "'pointing to a big black box at the end of his bed. "'I have never been a very rich man, Mr. Holmes. "'Never made but one investment in my life, "'as Dr. Trevelyan would tell you. "'But I don't believe in bankers. "'I would never trust a banker, Mr. Holmes.' "'Between ourselves, what little I have is in that box, "'so you can understand what it means to me "'when unknown people force themselves into my rooms.' "'Holmes looked at Blessington in his questioning way and shook his head. "'I cannot possibly advise you if you try to deceive me,' said he. "'But I have told you everything.' "'Holmes turned on his heel with a gesture of disgust. "'Good night, Dr. Trevelyan,' said he. Uh, no advice for me cried blessington in a breaking voice my advice to you sir is to speak the truth a minute later we were in the street and walking for home we had crossed oxford street and were halfway down harley street before i could get a word from my companion sorry to bring you out in such a fool's errand watson he said at last it is an interesting case too at the bottom of it i can make little of it i confessed well, it is quite evident that there are two men, more perhaps, but at least two, who are determined for some reason to get at this fellow Blessington. I have no doubt in my mind that both on the first and on the second occasion that young man penetrated to Blessington's room while his confederate, by an ingenious device, kept the doctor from interfering. And the catalepsy? A fraudulent imitation, Watson, though I should hardly dare to hint as much to our specialist, it is a very easy complaint to imitate. I have done it myself. And then? By the purest chance, Blessington was out on each occasion. Their reason for choosing so unusual an hour for a consultation was obviously to ensure that there should be no other patient in the waiting room. It just happened, however, that this hour coincided with Blessington's constitutional, which seemed to show that they were not very well acquainted with his daily routine. Of course, if they had been merely after plunder, they would have at least made some attempt to search for it. Besides, I can read in a man's eye when it is his own skin that he is frightened for. It is inconceivable that this fellow could have made two such vindictive enemies as these appear to be without knowing of it. I hold it, therefore, to be certain that he does know who these men are, and for that reasons of his own he suppresses it. It is just possible that tomorrow may find him in a more communicative mood. Is there not one alternative, I suggested, grotesquely improbable, no doubt, but still just conceivable? Might the whole story of the cataleptic Russian and his son be a concoction of Dr. Trevelyan's, who has, for his own purposes, been in Blessington's rooms? I saw in the gaslight that Holmes wore an amused smile at this brilliant departure of mine. "'My dear fellow,' said he, "'it was one of the first solutions which occurred to me, but I was soon able to corroborate the doctor's tale.' This young man has left prints upon the stair carpet, which made it quite superfluous for me to ask to see those which he had made in the room. When I tell you that his shoes were square-toed, instead of being pointed like Blessington's, and were quite an inch and a third longer than the doctor's, you will acknowledge that there can be no doubt as to his individuality. But we may sleep on it now, for I shall be surprised if we do not hear something further from Brook Street in the morning. Sherlock Holmes' prophecy was soon fulfilled, and in a dramatic fashion. At half-past seven next morning, in the first glimmer of daylight, I found him standing by my bedside in his dressing-gown. "'There is a brougham waiting for us, Watson,' said he. "'What's the matter, then? The Brook Street business. Any fresh news?' tragic but ambiguous said he pulling up the blind look at this a sheet from a notebook with 
For God's sake, come at once, P.T., scrawled upon it in pencil. Our friend the doctor was hard put to it when he wrote this. Come along, my dear fellow, for it's an urgent call. In a quarter of an hour or so we were back at the physician's house. He came running out to meet us with a face of horror. Oh, such a business, he cried with his hands to his temples. What then? Blessington has committed suicide. Holmes whistled. Yes, he hanged himself during the night. We had entered, and the doctor had preceded us into what was evidently his waiting room. I really hardly know what I'm doing, he cried. The police are already upstairs. It has shaken me most dreadfully. When did you find it out? He has a cup of tea taken into him early every morning. When the maid entered, about seven, there the unfortunate fellow was hanging in the middle of the room. He had tied the cord to the hook on which the heavy lamp used to hang, and he had jumped off from the top of the very box that he showed us yesterday. Holmes stood for a moment in deep thought. "'With your permission,' said he at last, "'I should like to go upstairs and look into the matter.' We both ascended, followed by the doctor. It was a dreadful sight which met us as we entered the bedroom door. I have spoken of the impression of flabbiness which this man Blessington conveyed. As he dangled from the hook it was exaggerated and intensified until he was scarce human in his appearance. The neck was drawn out like a plucked chicken's, making the rest of him seem the more obese and unnatural by the contrast. He was clad only in his long nightdress, and his swollen ankles and ungainly feet protruded starkly from beneath it. Beside him stood a smart-looking police inspector, who was taking notes in a pocket-book. "'Ah, Mr. Holmes,' said he, heartily, as my friend entered, "'I am delighted to see you.' "'Good morning, Lanner,' answered Holmes. "'You won't think me an intruder, I am sure. "'Have you heard of the events which led up to this affair?' "'Yes, I have heard something of them.' "'Have you formed any opinion?' "'As far as I can see, the man has been driven out of his senses by fright. "'The bed has been well slept in, you see. "'There's his impression deep enough. "'It's about five in the morning, you know, that suicides are most common.' That would be about his time for hanging himself. It seems to have been a very deliberate affair. I should say that he has been dead about three hours, judging by the rigidity of the muscles, said I. Notice anything peculiar about the room? asked Holmes. Found a screwdriver and some screws on the washhand stand. Seems to have smoked heavily during the night, too. Here are four cigar ends that I picked out of the fireplace. Hmm, said Holmes. Have you got his cigar holder? No, I have seen none. His cigar case, then? Yes, it was in his coat pocket. Holmes opened it and smelled the single cigar which it contained. Oh, this is a Havana, and these others are cigars of the peculiar sort which are imported by the Dutch from their East India colonies. They are unusually wrapped in straw, you know, and are thinner for their length than any other brand. He picked up the four ends and examined them with his pocket lens. Two of these have been smoked from a holder, and two without, said he. Two have been cut by a not very sharp knife, and two have had the ends bitten off by a set of excellent teeth. This is no suicide, Mr. Lanner. It is a very deeply planned and cold-blooded murder. Impossible, cried the inspector. And why? Why should any one murder a man in so clumsy a fashion as by hanging him? That is what we have to find out. How could they get in? Through the front door. It was barred in the morning. Then it was barred after them. How do you know? I saw their traces. Excuse me a moment, and I may be able to give you some further information about it. He went over to the door, and turning the lock, he examined it in his methodical way. Then he took out the key, which was on the inside, and inspected that also. The bed, the carpet, the chairs, the mantelpiece, the dead body, and the rope were each in turn examined, until at last he professed himself satisfied, and with my aid and that of the inspector cut down the wretched object and laid it reverently under a sheet. "'How about this rope?' he asked. 
"'It is cut off this,' said Dr. Trevelyan, drawing a large coil from under the bed. He was morbidly nervous of fire, and always kept this beside him, so that he might escape by the window in case the stairs were burning. "'That must have saved them trouble,' said Holmes thoughtfully. "'Yes, the actual facts are very plain, and I shall be surprised if by the afternoon I cannot give you the reasons for them as well.' I will take this photograph of Blessington, which I see upon the mantelpiece, and it may help me in my inquiries. But you have told us nothing, cried the doctor. Oh, there can be no doubt as to the sequence of events, said Holmes. There were three of them in it, the young man, the old man, and a third, to whose identity I have no clue. The first two, I need hardly remark, are the same who masqueraded as the Russian Count and his son, so we can give a very full description of them. They were admitted by a confederate inside the house. If I might offer you a word of advice, Inspector, it would be to arrest the page, who, as I understand, has only recently come into your service, Doctor. The young imp cannot be found, said Dr. Trevelyan. The maid and the cook have just been searching for him. Holmes shrugged his shoulders. He has played a not unimportant part in this drama, said he. The three men, having ascended the stairs, which they did on tiptoe, the elder man first, the younger man second, and the unknown man in the rear. My dear Holmes, I ejaculated. Oh, there could be no question as to the superimposing of the footmarks. I had the advantage of learning which was which last night. They ascended, then, to Mr. Blessington's room, the door of which they found to be locked. With the help of a wire, however, they forced round the key. Even without the lens, you will perceive, by the scratches on this ward, where the pressure was applied. On entering the room, their first proceeding must have been to gag Mr. Blessington. He may have been asleep, or he may have been so paralysed with terror as to have been unable to cry out. These walls are thick, and it is conceivable that his shriek, if he had time to utter one, was unheard. Having secured him, it is evident to me that a consultation of some sort was held. Probably it was something in the nature of a judicial proceeding. It must have lasted for some time, for it was then that these cigars were smoked. The older man sat in that wicker chair. It was he who used the cigar holder. The younger man sat over yonder. He knocked his ash off against the chest of drawers. The third fellow paced up and down. Blessington, I think, sat upright in the bed, but of that I cannot be absolutely certain. Well, it ended by their taking Blessington and hanging him. The matter was so prearranged that it is my belief that they brought with them some sort of block or pulley which might serve as a gallows. That screwdriver and those screws were, as I conceive, for fixing it up. Seeing the hook, however, they naturally saved themselves the trouble. Having finished their work, they made off, and the door was barred behind them by their confederate. We had all listened with the deepest interest to this sketch of the night's doings, which Holmes had deduced from signs so subtle and minute that, even when he had pointed them out to us, we could scarcely follow him in his reasoning. The inspector hurried away on the instant to make inquiries about the page, while Holmes and I returned to Baker Street for breakfast. "'I'll be back by three, said he, when we had finished our meal. Both the inspector and the doctor will meet me here at that hour, and I hope by that time to have cleared up any little obscurity which the case may still present. Our visitors arrived at the appointed time, but it was a quarter to four before my friend put in an appearance. From his expression as he entered, however, I could see that all had gone well with him. Any news, Inspector? We have got the boy, sir. Excellent! And I have got the men. You have got them, we cried all three. Well, at least I have got their identity. This so-called Blessington is, as I expected, well known at headquarters, and so are his assailants. Their names are Biddle, Haywood, and Moffat. The Worthington Bank Gang, cried the inspector. Precisely, said Holmes. Then Blessington must have been Sutton. Exactly, said Holmes. 
"'Why, that makes it as clear as crystal,' said the inspector. "'But Trevelyan and I looked at each other in bewilderment. "'You must surely remember the great Worthington Bank business,' said Holmes. Five men were in it, these four and a fifth called Cartwright. "'Tobin, the caretaker, was murdered, "'and the thieves got away with seven thousand pounds. "'This was in 1875.' They were all five arrested, but the evidence against them was by no means conclusive. This Blessington, or Sutton, who was the worst of the gang, turned informer. On his evidence, Cartwright was hanged, and the other three got fifteen years apiece. When they got out the other day, which was some years before their full term, they set themselves, as you perceive, to hunt down the traitor and to avenge the death of their comrade upon him. Twice they tried to get at him and failed. A third time, you see, it came off. Is there anything further which I can explain, Dr. Trevelyan? I think you have made it all remarkably clear, said the doctor. No doubt the day on which he was perturbed was the day when he had seen of their release in the newspapers. Quite so. His talk about a burglary was the merest blind. But why could he not tell you this? Well, my dear sir, knowing the vindictive character of his old associates, he was trying to hide his own identity from everybody as long as he could. His secret was a shameful one, and he could not bring himself to divulge it. However, wretch as he was, he was still living under the shield of British law, and I have no doubt, Inspector, that you will see that, though that shield may fail to guard, the sword of justice is still there to avenge. Such were the singular circumstances in connection with the resident patient and the Brook Street doctor. From that night nothing has been seen of the three murderers by the police, and it is surmised at Scotland Yard that they were among the passengers of the ill-fated steamer Nora Carina, which was lost some years ago with all hands, upon the Portuguese coast, some leagues to the north of Oporto. The proceedings against the page broke down for want of evidence, and the Brook Street mystery, as it was called, has never until now been fully dealt with in any public print. End of The Resident Patient by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Recording by Peter Tomlinson The Two Apples by James Edmund Dunning this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The Two Apples by James Edmund Dunning. When the morning of the sixteenth day broke out from the gray battlements of the eastward, only two live men remained on the raft which more than two weeks before had left the splittered sides of the barkentine. Besides, there was one dead man, and his body counted three out of the dozen who had clung to the raft until ten starved to death because they could not live on red apples and brine. Zardak roused as much as a man can when every morning he wakens less and less, until some day he does not waken at all. Jeems lay staring at the sun, as at a stranger's face. "'Turn out, Jeems,' said Zardak, when he had worked some life back into his thickening tongue, "'till we put him over.' They rolled the body into the sea, with no words or ceremonials to mark the end, except that Jeems, when some part of the splash stung his face, struck off the drops with trembling, horrified hands. Two apples left, said Zardok, not in any tentative sounding of possibilities, but with finality forced home by a fact so plain and near as to render evasion needless. One for today, said Jeems, the, the other one for tomorrow. The last one for tomorrow, returned Zardak, bold as ever. Let us wait as long as we can before breakfast. The raft drifted many hours, 
following the sun around the fatal empty bowl james broke that vast silence zardok i must eat something my head is you know my head so does mine said zardok cut the first apple in two it takes so little to satisfy when one is starving and that little goes so very fast when zardok put his furry teeth into half the apple it was as if he had not tasted such since he left cape cod a dozen years before his mind strained with a long unrealized hope forgot the timbers on which his bent muscles clung and went back to an orchard he had known where such apples always grew the cool air from the shadows underneath the tree rose seemed interlaid with waves of heat and the lovely odors of the sunlit seaside farm that long slope from the meadowland up up and up beneath the slant uncertain fence to where the white top sides of the houses were vividly set off in green till zardak came to himself and understood that the smell was only the damp breath of the atlantic and the heat the plunging agony that flowed from his own tense heart the first apple was gone the two men's eyes conversed in brief then zardak said i'm going to sleep again if it is sleep anyway i'm tired can you stay up a while it's my trick consented james neither spoke of the approaching end but when they sat staring at each other a time for madmen's minds move with but a mock agility zardak said put the second apple under the tin cup in the middle of the raft and keep it there when the apple was safe zardak held out his right hand until i wake james he said it is safe there was the answer and zardak laid down on the soggy timbers satisfied with faith in the honor of his starving mate to james who watched the sea looked as never in his life before for years he had enslaved it as a tough mount desert fisher boy he had bound it to his childish will and in many later years afloat had thrown back its innumerable challenges with all contempt until the last time in sailors lives birth and the marriage day bow down to the last time it always comes when fortune or the years have made them blindly bold his courage fled before the onslaught of these terrible seas which high above the level of his blurring eyes swept up in the torturous parade as if death maddened his victims by passing his grand divisions in review besides the pain of hunger so outgrew all reason it cut through the man's thin body like the blade of a great and sudden sorrow in one's heart through and through ever returning never going a greater sea than the others rolled underneath the raft and shook the loose boards so that the tin dipper rolled on its inverted rim and then fell tinkling back again james crawled to where he could lift the dipper and see beneath the second apple lay secure its plump sides a shocking contrast to the terrors of the raft james looked hard a cruel pain shot from his throat to his heels in a tearing red-hot spinal the first apple had so cooled his mouth water began to run off james chin if he could only run his fingers down those rounding sides maybe they would catch some of the orchard smell james clapped the dipper down with a sudden muscular fury and kicked zardok into sense with such vigor 
that he fell exhausted from the effort. I was so lonesome I thought I might go off, he explained, adding, Zardok, what's your family? Five, and the wife, God help him, said Zardok, not dramatically either, but just dully, as if it was what his mind had grown to know very much better than anything else. Have you? No, said Jeems. Years ago I called on a pretty girl over at Sumsville, but nothing came of it. Just as well now, said Zardok coldly, adding half in dream, I recollect them Sumsville girls was pretty. Lisbeth came from there. Who? said Jeems. Lisbeth, the wife. Why, she was your sister, Jeems. So she was. I forgot. Many madmen speak in the past tense at the stage where they seem to look back on their proper selves. The sun neared the west. Lie down again, said Jeems. I'll watch. Any sail that time before? No sail, Zardok. The wind dropped near night, and Jeems lay on the raft with eyes that glowed back the red reflection of the setting sun. As it moved toward the liquid line of sea, its brilliance fell into the smoldering of the cloud through which its sides shone with a softened, satin polish of the second apple as Jeems last saw it. The thought struck him in the middle of his heart, which began leaping as when, at nineteen, a girl's smooth fingers lingered on his own. He hungered for the sight of the second apple, as for nothing else in the whole world before. He wished the raft might roll so violently as to throw off the dipper, and then, before he realized, his own foot had kicked it into the ocean, and the apple smiled before him, securely laid between two great planks at the bottom of the raft. Zardok slept. Jeems was alone with the second apple. He looked at it between caked lids and let his eyes rove over and over its rare beauties. For the first time since he was born, his whole being, the knotted body whose abundant energies had been quite absorbed by the arduous doing of his roving life, and the big heart of him, where the rich red of the blood was pent and packed with never a bit of outlet for relief, thrilled with the keen, delicious mystery of desire. His meager lips cracked like a snakeskin, repeated in monotone, as if to hold his conscience under some mesmeric charm. I must! I must! The mere thought of the cold heart of the fruit made his pulse spring as if whipped. To imagine the exquisite satisfaction which would follow his teeth as they sank slowly, slowly, sank further and further through those moistening walls until, at the very acme of delight, they met. Christ! He was on it in an instant, holding it with both hands, and not lifting it, but just putting his face down and keeping it so, in a passionate embrace. He would eat. If he died for it, he must. Lisbeth! It was Zardok dreaming. Lisbeth! Good old girl! Good girl! Bye, bye! Home at sundown! Good old good! Ah! The voice fell away in an idiotic sigh. Jeems sprang to his feet and stood swaying with the raft, the image of his sister in his eyes. Off east where the gray shades grew, he saw her walking on the sea, her long hair blown before like a cloud of jet-black flame, and her face all lovely. Lisbeth! Jeems spread his arms, 
but she did not see him, for she looked at Zardok, as he lay there at her brother's feet, and her eyes rained love, which calmed the sea like oil. And then Jeems saw himself, as if from far. Lisbeth, he cried, but she did not hear, so he held his two arms up toward the sky, and whispered, God, 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 forgive Jeems Harbit, the wicked sinner, and take him. His voice sank to a low, inhuman key. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever, O God. And with arms still raised in suppliance for his great unselfish soul, he sprang out backward to the darkening sea. The End of The Two Apples by James Edmund Dunning Uncle Bentley and the Roosters by Hayden Carruth This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Uncle Bentley and the Roosters by Hayden Carruth The burden of Uncle Bentley has always rested heavily on our town. Having not a shadow of business to attend to, he has made other people's business his own, and looked after it in season and out, especially out. If there is a thing that nobody wants done, to this Uncle Bentley applies his busy hand. One warm summer Sunday, we were all at church. Our pastor had taken the passage on turning the other cheek, or one akin to it, for his text, and was preaching on peace and quiet and non-resistance. He soon had us in a devout mood, which must have been beautiful to see, and encouraging to the good man. Of course, Uncle Bentley was there, he always was, and forever in the front pew, with his neck craned up looking backward, to see if there was anything that didn't need doing, which he could do. He always tinkered with the fires in the winter, and fussed with the windows in the summer, and did his worst with each. His strongest church point was ushering. Not content to usher the strangers within our gates, he would usher all of us, and always thrust us into pews with just the people we didn't want to sit with. If you failed to follow him when he took you in tow, he would stop and look back reproachfully, describing mighty indrawing curves with his arm, and if you pretended not to see him, he would give a low whistle to attract your attention the arms working right along like a holland windmill on this particular warm summer sunday uncle bentley was in place wearing his long full skirted coat a queer dark bottle green purplish blue he had ushered to his own exceeding joy and got two men in one pew and given them a single hymn book who wouldn't on a weekday speak to each other i ought to mention that we had long before made a verb of Uncle Bentley. To Uncle Bentley was to do the wrong thing. It was a regular verb. Uncle Bentley, Uncle Bentleyed, Uncle Bentleying. These two rampant enemies in the same pew had been Uncle Bentleyed. The minister was floating along smoothly on the subject of peace when Uncle Bentley was observed to throw up his head. He had heard a sound outside. It was really nothing but one of Deacon Plummer's young roosters crowing. The deacon lived near, and the vocal offerings from his poultry were frequent, and had ceased to interest anyone except Uncle Bentley. Then, in the pauses between the preacher's periods, we heard the flapping of wings, with sudden stoppings and startings. Those unregenerated fowl unable to understand the good man's words were fighting even this didn't interest us we were committed to peace but uncle bentley shot up like a jack-in-the-box and cantered down the aisle of course his notion was that the roosters were disturbing the services 
and that it was his duty to go out and stop them. We heard vigorous shoes, and take that, and con Sarnia, and then Uncle Bentley came back looking more important, and as he stalked up the aisle he glanced around and nodded his head, saying as clearly as words, There, where would you be without me? Another defiant crow floated in at the window. The next moment the rushing and beating of wings began again, and down the aisle went Uncle Bentley, the long tails of that coat fairly floating like a cloud behind him. There was further uproar outside, and Uncle Bentley was back in his place, this time turning around and whispering hoarsely, I fixed him. But such was not the case, for twice more the very same thing was repeated. The last time Uncle Bentley came back he wore a calm, snug expression, as who would say, Now I have fixed him. We should have liked it better if the roosters had fixed Uncle Bentley. But nobody paid much attention except Deacon Plummer. The thought occurred to him that perhaps Uncle Bentley had killed the fowls. But he hadn't. However, there was no more disturbance without, and after a time the sermon closed. There was some sort of special collection to be taken up. Of course, Uncle Bentley always insisted on taking up all the collections. He hopped up on this occasion and seized the plate with more than usual vigor. His struggles with the roosters had evidently stimulated him. He soon made the rounds and approached the table in front of the pulpit to deposit his harvest. As he did so, we saw to our horror that the long tails of the ridiculous coat were violently agitated. A sickening suspicion came over us. The next moment one of those belligerent young roosters thrust a head out of either of those coat-tail pockets. One uttered a raucous crow, and the other made a vicious dab. Uncle Bentley dropped the plate with a scattering of coins, seized a coat skirt in each hand, and drew it forward. This dumped both fowls out on the floor, where they went at it hammer and tongs. What happened after this is a blur in most of our memories. All that is certain is that there was an uproar in the congregation, especially the younger portion, that the deacon began making unsuccessful dives for his poultry, that the organist struck up onward Christian soldiers, and that the minister waved us away without a benediction amid loud shouts of, Shoo! I sworn ye! And drat the pesky critters! From your Uncle Bentley. Did it serve to subdue Uncle Bentley? Not in the least. He survived to do worse things. The End of Uncle Bentley and the Roosters by Hayden Carruth <laughs>